Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brothers and sisters. Welcome to another edition of Dawah Wise. Uh, today, we actually have a very interesting program and a very special guest. Um, as you know, one of the, the streams that we've been running for um, quite a while now, I think this is, this is actually the 11th stream, is the Demystifying Hinduism series. And so today we have Demystifying Hinduism number 11 in the series. Um, and actually, we don't know how far it will go, so we'll just take it as far as it goes. But before I start, assalamu alaikum to Brother Hashim. Uh, how are you doing, brothers? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, alhamdulillah, very good, yes. MashaAllah, as you said, another good episode, um, which has been, I think, uh, it's been nearly a year since we had the last one. So time flies quickly, you know. <laughs> it, it does, it does. Brother Sam, how are you? Alhamdulillah, brother. Assalamu alaikum. I'm doing very well. Alhamdulillah. So before we get started and before we introduce bro brother... Am I audible, brother? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yes, you are. There's a bit of a delay. So there's actually, I think, a two, three second delay with you at the moment. That's okay. That's, That's okay. okay. So, Brother Hashim, as always, before we start, um, what is the news of the week? Um, any any you know interesting stories from Speaker's Corner that we've had or any videos that we've released that you'd like to tell the audience about? Yeah, so Speaker's Corner was, um, well, kind of um, drawn out by the weather because uh, we had quite a lot of rain uh, on Sunday uh, here in London and I think elsewhere as well. Uh, we had, um, for the first time at Speaker's Corner, um, you know, Sheikh Othman, Ibn Farouk from San Diego. Uh, he just came for a short time, like probably an hour or two maybe at the most. Uh, so yeah, that was like the highlight of Sunday, but then other than the rain. <laughs> so yeah, it's good, yeah. We posted the videos already on our channel, on the Wise, yeah. So as we will say, go check them out, go subscribe and go click the uh, like buttons on them. Uh, a quick story. Before, so Hashim, you met Brother Antaranga actually almost by accident. How did that come about? Yeah, so I was shopping one day and I just happened to pass by uh, Brother Antaranga's um, table. So he had some... I think he had some Bhagavad Gita's and Srimad Bhagavatam and some other books on Hinduism. And obviously, you know, um, he he had this monk, uh, what do you say, the the outfit, yeah. which, mm -hmm. which you can't, the attire, you can't ignore that, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it was a coincidence. Um, I mean, yeah. and then I just uh, happened to have a brief chat with, uh, uh, with Antaranga and then um, I invited him to join our channel and it was quite... Uh, a general, generously accepted uh, the offer, you know, and here he is. <laughs> alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So, Brother Antaranga, thank you for joining us. Thank um, you for the I think, I think, I think, I mean, there are no coincidences. We, we believe all coincidences are, are arranged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a reason. So, there is a reason you met Brother Hashim on that day, and one of them is to help us understand you further here. For the audience, uh, we will have open QA. Um, shortly during the program but initially we'll have actually a conversation with brother antaranga just to sort of understand his perspective on life uh, the way of life that he follows and help us to understand actually reveal uh, some of the reasons that he does what he does let me with that with that point uh brother antaranga um open the question with who are you and right. and, and 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 you know who is brother antaranga and how did you arrive at where you are? What was your life before you came to um, Bhakti Yoga and uh, Hare Krishna? Thank you for that question. Thank you for having me. First of all, I'm very grateful also to our meeting to Hashim, which is a very respectful gentleman. I still recall that you remember you had this discussion with that uh, with that mother, that Christian lady before. Oh, yes. yes. Before you kind of uh, entered the, the our book table, which we've been presenting the books. That's but yeah, right. thank you for that. Thank you for approaching me. Uh, what was what was I before? Well, I'm originally from Slovakia. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not by nationality British. Um, majority of my youth I spent doing sports. I was playing ice hockey. It's not very popular here in the UK, but majority of my sp youth just sports and education. Then when I reached the age, I went to university. I studied psychology, which was kind of influenced by me receiving Bhagavad Gita when I was about 16 or 17 years of age. And, you know, some 
youth or young people they they're going through the passage of life when they're questioning everything right questioning the authority questioning life and as such i went through a journey and um, somehow or another i was reading these different posts on facebook it's a very powerful tool for preaching social media and um, i was kind of attracted by by different eastern philosophies and basically something which is not very dogmatic but rather question things open up open up the mind to different varieties of things and uh, so i approached bhagavad gita i read it i started associating with uh Hare Krishna devotees in in slovakia after i finished my university degree i moved to to uk but i was i was working i was not very happy because some or another if you don't drink if you don't smoke if you don't intoxicate if you don't do variety of things which are very prominent in the modern day and age then somehow you are on the on the edge of the society and it's difficult to even associate with people because you don't have much things in common if you don't do these these frivolous activities um so at one point i was thinking i'm young i'm 22 23 years old let me try out i always had some inclination to sort of a i can say renunciation or have a much more simple life so I entered monastic life when I was 20, 22, 23. And uh, in the beginning, it was a bit of a shock, especially for my parents, right? Parents, they always want the child to be near them or somehow to, you know, facilitate their life, to bring grandchildren uh, to work and do all these different things, which is completely reasonable and understandable. But my life was kind of a directing in a different, different way. So, yeah. Fantastic. And and so it was just growing up in education. Fantastic. Yeah. So, so let me go, go rewind a little bit. So, growing up in Slovakia, did you have a faith tradition that you were following, or were you of no yes. faith? My parents never really pushed me, or they haven't been really associating with any specific religion. But near the place where I was living was uh, was a church. So I was going every Sunday to a church, and uh, for many years I was going to church. So yeah, I'm baptized. So mm -hmm. I received. So I have the kind of a Christian background. I, I went through the Bible. I went through studies of the Bible. Um, but to a certain degree, there was, um, I may humbly say that I was not fully satisfied. Maybe I haven't put my heart fully to the process, I admit. Um, but um, I was always attracted to some degree to the Eastern traditions. Okay. Because yeah. I think yeah, you, you're right. Before I approached you, I ha happened to meet this Christian lady at the same corner uh, and started to speak to her, I think, probably for much longer than I spoke to you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's interesting. So yeah, your story seems, I think, pretty much similar to many of the people in the West who... I, th I think there are very few people who would actually not go into that lifestyle, which you said, you know, the youth here follow of drinking alcohol, you know, like this, you, you probably won't be part of the gang or the group, you know, there's a lot of peer pressure at, at universities, at schools, even at colleges, so this is quite, I think, uh, common over here to get drawn into that, and this is something that uh, people from a religious background, um, like, including the Muslims who have to kind of fight against this, you know, mm. um, obviously not physically, but morally and ethically. So it's, it's something that um, we all experience, I think, when you're away from, uh, from a community which is kind of steered away from spirituality and more mm. into the worldly, um, materialistic kind of world. You're yeah, absolutely right. So um, the question, I think, which is on everyone's mind is, what was the first thing that drew you into, say, Hinduism or Hare Krishna? Was that a particular trigger, a particular article? I don't know. Was there anything in your life that uh, triggered you towards going, taking that path as your new way of life? It was, thank you for the question. Um, it was very subtle and very slow transition, rather not something drastic and dramatic as a some kind of a, change from one day to another but i start reading these neo-spiritual books right which kind of at the market start being flooding right mm -hmm. if you if you know this book called secret or the books called attraction of the hearts and variety of these new age spiritual literature and uh there have been certain concepts there which have been very appealing like concept of karma 
concept of sort of a meditation or concept of um, kind of a co cognitively sort of a focusing on, on a specific field and sort of a changing your life to trigger a specific direction in your in your day to day life. So I got attracted to it. And in, in one point, as I was mentioning, I started reading this this website on or on Facebook and the the, the, the person was giving a lot of quotes from Bhagavad Gita, from the Puranas, from Srimad Bhagavatam. And um, I start feeling being attracted to these specific statements, which are giving variety of points about the creation, uh, the nature of the soul, the mind, the intelligence, uh, sort of a certain futility of material acquisitions. And uh, something kind of a triggered within me. Obviously, the whole change for me becoming a monk was many many years later so for six seven years i was purely i was associating with krishna consciousness or devotees or hinduism as such but never really made the the full-on step i was still to a certain degree hedonistic in my lifestyle but uh, still considering more and more different different approaches so um, i would say it was a step-by-step -step process of some kind of a subtle transition right interesting um, the term Hare Krishna, what does it mean? Term Hare Krishna, what does it mean? Well, in our tradition, Krishna, name of Krishna is all attractive, or the one, it's name of God, and it means that everyone is one way or another attracted to God. Either you're attracted to God, either you're attracted to wealth, fame, beauty, glory, uh, adoration, renunciation, nature, whatever you may be attracted to, it's a part and parcel or energy of God. And Hare comes from the term Hara, which is one of the name of energies of Lord, which is Radharani, which is a counterpart or the feminine energy part of the Lord. So Hare Krishna as a meditation means may I be engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. Okay, interesting. Um, with regards to the Hare Krishna moment, why did he choose that? as opposed to many other moments within Hinduism? Uh, first of all, because it was very strongly present in the Western world. That's the, the most important thing. Other sort of a traditions coming from the land of India haven't been present in my, or very much presenting the philosophy. So it was very approachable. To be, to be honest, I've been very much attracted rather to the personalities representing the movement, the simplicity of the of the devotees, the sort of the honesty and the, their practices. So um, it was both. It was the philosophy and equally the people presenting the philosophy. Okay. Uh, have you had access to any other Hindu philosophies other than Hare Krishna? To be frank and honest, no. No, right. not not really. There was no not much of a variation of uh, of other literatures or other paths other than the Krishna conscious movement or Hare Krishna movement. Okay, because uh, I think uh, you, you mentioned you you been to India recently. Um, yes. On while while we were be, before we came live, uh, could you tell us a bit about that? Because I I assume that was your first um, first visit to India as well. How yes. was the experience, and what what was it? Was there like a culture shock for you, or did you embrace it? I think it was wonderful, actually, to be honest. One thing above everything which really attracted me about India is that it was a bit chaotic. That was one thing, especially the uh, the roads and the traffic. That was uh, that was a definitely cultural shock. Um, it was like organized chaos, but within that chaos, there was somehow everyone no one got nothing really happened i've seen only one crash and i see one gentleman just falling from a motorbike and in in those six weeks of me staying in india so i would say people have some some kind of a interesting type of consciousness is there that we are really aware of what is happening around us so that was unique but one thing which really love about the people there in india is the simplicity they're living it is said one of the pages of the Bhagavad Gita that one type of renunciation is the renunciation of the mind. And renunciation of the mind means having a sinful life, accepting whatever God allows you, whatever is your quota. So, and with that, you live, you function, and you don't hanker for more. 
you're not mammonistic. You don't ask for more and you don't hanker for more and more. So that's that simplicity really charmed me, if I may say. Okay, interesting. And what about the food? Did you enjoy the food there? Well, because I live here in the temple, in the monastery, and all big portion of our congregation are people coming from India. Therefore, the food was not such a shock because, you know, every day I have dal, rice, sabji, baitas, and pakoras, <laughs> samosas, and uh, different, different, different things. Uh, no non-veg. Sorry? <laughs> no non-veg. No, no meat served there. Only vegetarian. No, no. We are purely, purely no fish, meat, eggs. We are purely practicing vegetarianism. I, I think Sam is probably thinking you don't know what you're missing out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I was surprised you didn't hear of um, biryani when you when we first talked. You know, like earlier today before we joined the live stream. Now this is the most popular dish, like in India. You know, also in Pakistan and Bangladesh, I think, uh, in, in the subcontinent. So. Your monastic life is pretty secluded, I would say, pretty isolated in that sense. Because I think that's what that's what a Hare Krishna monk does, isn't it? Do do you spend most of your time in the temples? Actually, one of my major services is, as you saw me in Edgware, is actually going outside of the temple. Wow. So one of my main duties is travel around the country and presenting uh, our philosophical literature to the general populace and uh, sort of uh, requesting people to take the book take the philosophy sort of a uh, read the books and uh, our main sort of a uh, our main desire as a community is to present philosophy or teachings or, or knowledge because i think both of us all of us we can admit that the only way you can actually make a move forward for the humanity is by education education about who you are who is god and what is your relationship with god and only this way you can actually save the humanity so that's also our desire to present this philosophy in such a way. Okay, interesting. So tell us a bit about your daily life as a monk, like besides besides you going out and, you know, like what we Muslims call giving dawah, giving, uh, like inviting people to know and learn about Hare Krishna. Uh, what are your duties within the monastery itself, within the temples? My main duty is... Um, Basically, first portion of our day is something that we call morning program. It starts, our day starts uh, 4 a.m. latest. We wake up 4 a.m. By 4.30, we have our morning prayers where we, where we offer, where we meditate and when we pray to God and to our previous spiritual predecessors. And uh, then we have different... Then we perform different activities, like for instance, we always have a class every single day. We have a class from books like Srimad Bhagavatam, where we discuss the philosophy and uh, we inquire. It's open for anyone and everyone. And um, then afterwards, we have breakfast. And after breakfast, everyone goes to their respective duties and different services. As I mentioned before, we went live. Recently, we had few days of festivities and festivals. So when it's required, the monks will stay back in the temple and perform and help the congregation to prepare for the festivities so we can sort of uh, honor and invite guests to come. Okay, interesting. Sam, you got any questions? Yeah, I just want to ask brother, did you get any chance to uh, celebrate any festival in India? Yes, yes, there was one very, very dear festival to our go us, to Gaudiya Vaishnavas, and that was called Radhashtami. It's a very unique, special festival where we celebrate the appearance of, of the Shakti or the energy of God named Radharani. So it was a very beautiful, very wonderful festival. And uh, yeah, very special. Okay, and how does that nice. compare to, to festivals here in the UK? You know, I, I know there are quite a few Hindus here as well, and they do celebrate the Diwali, which was recently. Yes. Um, I believe it was also your new year, right? The, the Hindu new year, if I remember correctly? Correctly, yes. We, we've been celebrating yeah. Diwali recently here, yes. Okay. Uh, so, how, I mean, I know over here it might not be probably one night or something, but in India it's much huge, isn't it? Much more bigger. Uh, so, yeah, obviously, I think in terms of the degree of 
the celebrations and the number of people and all it will it it does matter so as someone who comes from a western background uh how do the the other hindus who might be coming from an indian background uh do they treat you the same do they treat you any different have you had any i don't know any experiences which kind of made you feel either uncomfortable or privileged in that sense you know depending on who, who it is i guess thank you for the question yes um it is always always a rarity to see in different communities someone from a different denomination maybe different race and uh, I, I i had experiences of both of the spectrums when i was in india because i wear this cloth which basically is saffron which means renunciation or someone who's uh, something which we call brahmachari which in translation means a uh, celibate monk um it's um it's a concept which is considered for old people or for older generations uh, it is said that when you're young you you should enjoy you have fresh senses you're powerful you have strength you can do things you can make change and when you're becoming older and older then you somehow should more withdraw yourself and that's where this cloth majority people wear in india older people older generation um so i had both respect due to the color of my cloth and at the same time there was a I, it happens now and then when certain certain people from indian background saying that i'm not born in this faith or uh, that i only learned these these books or these verses or this philosophy and they've been living it their whole life so but majority of my interactions are in the middle either not bothered whatsoever or generally quite fine so okay yeah i think uh, you're, you're absolutely right because when we had uh, dr howard resnick on our show you know we had uh, a few uh, i think two streams with him and we saw a lot of comments about people saying that um, oh this guy's not a real hindu he's because he's not born a hindu or not born in india or something like that i mean i'm just trying to understand as an outsider uh, is this something which is a requirement to be a hindu to be born in it oh no 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 i mean first of all the, the terminology hinduism it, or hindu it's such it's a, it's a connected it's a rather geographical terminology right there's this river sindhu and um, everyone beyond the river sindhu is considered to be a hindu so uh, hinduism as such is rather kind of like a sheltering umbrella which gives certain denomination that okay people from india and different denominations or different followers different paths different philosophical approaches are hindus the real vedic terminology because the term hinduism actually doesn't exist in the vedic culture it's um, if if you study the all the vedas or if you go through them and scrutinizingly search for this term hinduism doesn't exist as such so the real terminology which we use is sanatan dharma i'm sure this was revealed before sanatan is eternal and dharma means like a nature so um doesn't matter obviously this body is just a vessel just like you have a different car someone else have a different car but you're the same passenger inside a human being right so it doesn't matter what body you have ultimately you're a soul and as a soul your primary prime duty is to be servant of god so it doesn't matter if you have a body of a if you have a black bodied white bodied indian bodied uh i don't know whichever type of a human is a human yeah. you're right human is human but what is more important is that there's a soul inside and that's what we matters now as you might be aware that in islam we have uh, the concept of monotheism as our first pillar you know yes. it's ex explicitly stated in the quran in the hadith you know all our books uh, that we worship none other than um, god almighty and who we name and call as allah and associating anything with the almighty god is considered to be the greatest sin in our religion now i'm pretty sure the from speaking to uh, dr howard and um, other hari krishnas and yourself as well um, monotheism is also something that is celebrated in hinduism uh, within the sanatan dharma as you said how do you reconcile this monotheism i mean first and foremost is it monotheism that you practice yes um i mean 
for me, it's kind of a straightforward, quite quite simple to grasp in terms of monotheism. Uh, we also follow one God, one person, but there's very simple analogy offered to kind of reconcile the the different varieties of avatars or different varieties of incarnations, which might look deceiving or might look sort of a difficult to digest. Basically, I can ask you a question. Um, so, w- when you go for a swim, what what do you wear? For swimming? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I just wear my swimming shorts, I guess. <laughs> yeah. When you go to, I don't know, fix your car, what do you wear? I go to the garage. I don't wear anything. I wear the sort of normal normal clothes I have. <laughs> Maybe something old which should not be bothered. Yeah, yeah. if I'm fixing it, yeah, you're right. Yes. For instance, let's say if you go to some, some official meeting with some dignitaries, you have to wear something rather presentable. So the, the point of this analogy is that there is one God, but he descends according to time, place, and circumstances, and he interacts with the genuine populace based on the desire and the mood which he wants to reveal. So that's the one sort of a possibly confusing presentation. Just like you wear different things, but it's the still same you. Just to facilitate different activities, you wear different suits, which are rather useful for that specific activity which you're planning to perform. So same thing. It's simple analogy, simple presentation. If I, I'm going to just turn on the lights because I think it's getting slightly darker. Just one second. Apologies. That's okay. Yeah, so Sam or Mohammed, if you guys got any questions, uh, you guys are free to ask. Well, I've just missed actually the yes. last few minutes of the conversation. I wasn't listening. So maybe you yeah, could... Yeah, we're just asking, you know, the, just basic questions on Hinduism so far. Okay. Um, okay. So if you wanted to... Yeah, yeah, Brother Sam, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I think the light was better earlier. You, it, was it, it better? Like you're sitting in the dark now. Yeah. Maybe yeah. If, you, if you switch off the one at the back and then switch on the one in the front, that might be better. Have you got I one in the front? They're both connected. Oh, are they okay? Oh, okay. Let's leave it. It's fine. Let's leave it. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's for that, that, that's like good. It? That's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Yes. Yeah, much better. Yeah, okay. Brother Antranga, uh, I have a one question. Like when you were in India, did anybody uh, categorize you in the caste uh, category or division? Or did they ask you anything about the caste? Which caste do you belong? Not particularly. By by birth, it, it is said in, in, in our scriptures that by birth, in this present day and age, we are all not really qualified to consider even ourselves to be of some higher degree or some higher caste. Uh, But then simultaneously in the Bhagavad Gita, it is said that by guna and by karma, or in other words, by quality and by activity, you are to be known. Where do you belong or who you are? Not by birth, because that's quite nonsense. Actually, our tradition, Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, really fights against caste, casteism as such, by birth. Because it it creates a lot of havoc in the past, a lot of division. And this is actually why, how, Indian Indian community dissolve themselves by this by this caste system. So no, actually no one asked me about my caste, but since I'm from Europe, by caste I'm considered to be the lowest. Why is that? Yeah, lowest means lowest means a shudra category. Exactly. Even lower than that. Malaysia, Yavana, uh Malaysia is a is someone uh, who is non Aryan. Or someone who eat meat. Yes. They, they even say so, dog eater. They translate nature as a dog eater. Really? I never eat wow. dog. I never eaten dog. <laughs> dog eater. <laughs> yeah. Un- unlike some of our Korean brethren who do, by the way. Yes. Uh, but that's that's a whole different story for a different yes. different program. Yeah. <laughs> so by birth, by birth, I am considered to be very low caste. So, but but you're, do... you're learning. But you're learning the consciousness of the God. You're coming closer to God every day. So I can assume that, uh, can you consider yourself as a Brahmin, uh, the one who is learned or learning? I, I received Brahmanical initiation by my, by my spiritual master, which means that I receive uh, something which they call a sacred thread. So mm-hmm. this sacred thread allows me to chant very unique, specific mantras within my mind, not uttering them aloud. So by initiation, I, I receive... Yes, 
Brahmanic initiation. If I'm fully consider myself to be qualified as a Brahmana, I think it's, uh, within that concept of being a Brahmana is, is very, very elevated. And um, I, I say, I would say I'm a work in progress. Right. But still the caste system is present in uh, uh, Sanatan Dharma. It very much it is. Yes, correct. Yeah, because uh, uh, if you read Bhagavad Gita, uh, Arjuna was a Kshatriya. So Krishna Correct. was motivating motivating uh, Arjuna to fight in the war as it's yes. it, it's a uh, duty of a Kshatriya to go for a war. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you yeah. stand at the level of Shudra, according to you. You believe that thing. Even lower than that, according to... So, right. So, I mean, like, uh, I just I just want to ask, like, uh, um, how do you how do you consider yourself uh, as a Kshatriya or a Shudra or a Vaishya or a Brahmin? Uh, I know you. that you're very humble. You're being very humble and uh, very down to earth and you're considering yourself uh, as a Shudra. But uh, as I think that you're learning uh, uh, scriptures, uh, you're coming closer to God. So you can elevate your uh, status from Shudra to Vaishya at least. Yeah, uh, basically the concept of Varnashram, as I mentioned before, is uh, based on guna and karma, activities and qualities within person. So you, we, need, we can actually ask ourselves, what is the predominant activity that we do or offer in our life? Uh, so Vaishya, for instance, is, is a personality, according to uh, the Varnashram system in Sanatana Dharma, that you deal with money. Uh, Vaishya is a person who takes care of land. Vaishya is a person who protects the cows. And Vaisha is a person who is sort of agriculturally orientated, or basically earning, earning. A Kshatriya is a person who's got this mood of protection, who's got this mood of governing, who's got mood of standing up for the poor, for those who cannot protect themselves. Uh, Shudras are those which are kind of a, should be somehow, how do you say, governed or sort of a protected by the other other systems. And Brahmana is a person who's pursuing the education. Actually, one interesting thing is you can actually see this Varnashram system all around the world. It's actually very nature and essence of us as individuals. You always have the level of personalities which are always inclined more towards philosophy, towards studying and being educating and educating the masses and being somehow recluse to the basic materialistic lifestyle. Then you have those people which naturally are those which will take charge, those people which are ready to fight and give their life for protecting what is necessary to protect. Then you have those which are inclined to earning money. And then you have those which are not very gifted with uh, intelligence and discrimination. Rather, they are very gifted with, um, how do you say, they are very handy and crafty, right? They are very different type of personality. So, uh, you can judge individual by again quality and activity. Right. Uh, I just I, I'm just concerned. Like as you said that uh, you're you're lower than the shudra category, but if we read the scriptures, uh, the lower category than the shudras are not allowed to uh, read the scriptures like Vedas or any sacred book. So how That's do you consider to yourself to be on that level, as you're right now as you're learning about God and reading the scriptures? Well. According to something which we call samskara, which means imprints. Samskara means like how you've been brought up and uh, how you've been living. So according to the Vedic system, everyone outside of India who doesn't follow the path of Sanatana Dharma and, uh, and the, the caste system is considered to be lowborn. But the moment you start developing some sort of attachments and and desiring to study and know more, you may elevate your consciousness. Um, but to answer your question that Shudras are not allowed to study, basically in this age, which we call the age of Kali, age of hypocrisy and age of iron, where people are really, really, truly misled, unfortunately, um, everyone is considered to be in the of a lower grade. So, but by the mercy of elevated devotees or elevated spiritual practitioners, they give an, anyone and everyone an opportunity to study sacred scriptures. Otherwise, who are we to discriminate and say, you are not allowed and you are allowed? That will be, that will be offensive, actually. 
But isn't, um, isn't the fact that, uh, you know, you give the example of our society here in the West and some people are learned and they are teachers and they impart knowledge. Some people are more of the working class and so on. Uh, but the thing is over here, the different um, careers that people pursue is not dependent on your birth, like the way in Hinduism. Mm -hmm. Because you mentioned earlier that because you were born in the West, you are considered to automatically a default position of being lower than the Shudras even. Because that doesn't seem uh, to be uh, fair in, in my view, in the sense that it is your birth that defines where you stand in society and you're discriminated based on that. So how do you reconcile that? That's very much true. Whatever you just said is completely correct. It's um, very unfair. It's very unfair. But as I mentioned, this was very much done in the past, in, in, the, in the times when things been... I'm going to use this analogy, which is maybe sounds slightly not very palatable. But um, let's see if I can get it correctly. And please bear with me. When you, when you, when you breed, let's say, dogs, right? You, you want to have a specific breed of dog, right? Let's say a German Shepherd, or in the past, I used to have this great um, dog called Great Dane. Very big, massive, massive thing. 80 kilograms, uh, very tall, strong and powerful. If you want to maintain the, the purity of the breed, you will only breed it with another Great Dane. And then this way, you can, be, you can rest assured that what will come out from that birth will be a pure Great Dane. So this was happening in the past. So the art of sort of a in-cultural sort of a uh, breeding or in-cultural living together as a community, there was a big probability or big chance that the soul that you attract to your marriage life, if you have a spouse of the same caste, will be there will be big chance that there will be, let's say, a Brahmana or a Kshatriya or a Vaisha, but there was a big chance, let's say 60, 70 percent. But that last 30 percent is actually observation of the quality and activity of the of the child. But now in the age of Kali, there, we have something called a Varna Shankara. Varna means the system and Shankara means mixing. So all these castes and are kind of a not maintaining the purity of the lines anymore. You can see it's, it's, it's a rather a rarity when you have a pre pure line of Kshatriyas or Brahmanas or Vaishyas and so on. Especially here in the West, it doesn't function anymore. So with that said, it's, it doesn't exist anymore. The Varna, the system, the caste system doesn't really function as it used to in the past due to mixing, if that makes sense. But it is still pretty much active in India, isn't it? I mean, for example, if you look, if you pick any Indian newspaper and look at the matrimonial sites in there, mm -hmm. they will say a Brahmin boy looking for a Brahmin girl, you know. So it's it's not something that is of the past. Mm -hmm. This is very much active today. I mean, Brother Sam is in India. Uh, I'm sure he might be able to elaborate more on that. But right. I, I doubt very much that this Varna system, which you mentioned, has is relegated to the past. It, it still plays an important role in the Indian society in the Hind amongst the Hindus. Amongst them, but they don't really discriminate and understand what is actually the qualifications of one to call himself truly a devotee or a Brahmana. So they say, yes, I'm coming from a family of Brahmanas, but we, just like if you say, uh, I'm a policeman, right? I would say, you're arrested. You have full right to ask me, well, can I show you, can I see your badge? What is your qualification? Are you truly a policeman? So for us to accept something blindly, there always needs to be, you need to be inquisitive. We don't accept someone says and proclaims, I am a Brahmana. Well, we have full right to observe the person and conclude, right? Actually, as I mentioned, our tradition as Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we've been fighting very strongly against this caste Brahmanism because they think they're highly elevated, but yet their qualities and their activities are very, very low. So yeah. we are against caste Brahmanism as so such. If, if I could sort of rewind a little bit, because yes. I really want to get to, um, if I may, just sort of take a different thread very, very slow. Mm -hmm. So you, you said you studied psychology. Um, what what type of psychology was it, and, and and why did you why were you interested in it? It was cognitive behavioral psychology that was sort of okay. my main interest. Mm -hmm. um, I have I've been educated in a variety of different types of of psychology psychological paths, 
And um, I always wanted to somehow understand the, the psyche, the nature of the mind, the intelligence, why people struggle, why they suffer, and why people have so much difficulties with their own mind, especially mental health this day and age is mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. rampant. Okay, so uh, so so what so what are the core tenets of CBT then? The 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 really sort of that you found sort of foundational. Okay, I've been out of school for past seven years. No, I, I, yeah, I understand. I, I mean, this is this is this is not an exam, uh, and there's a reason I'm asking the question is because the education that we have and and the thoughts and ideas and worldviews that we're presented to do impact decisions later on in life so i want to understand because and this was one of your formative pieces of education that you had so i really want to get to the base of was it something you did because it was accidental or was it something you were genuinely interested in and therefore it shaped maybe some of the decisions you took later on thank you that's a that's a very very deep question um i finished my education maybe again eight eight years ago now to be honest mm -hmm. basically the cognitive behavior of psychology functions on a such a level that we have a certain input with such an in input from our surrounding immediate surrounding by our senses and as um, according to psychology we are considered to be somehow evolved animal right so there is a behavioral reaction but cognitive behavior of psychology means that based on a higher purpose or higher intelligence or controlled mind you can adjust the outcoming of your reaction based on what you have in the head. So cognitive behavioral psychology is very much, very interesting sort of a field, which speaks that by correct thinking, correct meditation or correct contemplation, you can adjust your temperament, your nature. and So from this, is there, is there a, is there like a, a, a presumption within the cbt belief that first of all there is no external supernatural uh, i mean just correct me if i'm if i go wrong with that so for one of the presumptions or, or prepositions is there is no external supernatural everything can be explained materialistically and we are in actually in essence control of our own destiny Is that, is that a fair summary? Yes. I mean, if you observe the field of psychology as such, is somehow evolved from philosophy. But during the time of Renaissance, especially in Europe, there was a big sort of a movement where they tried to separate themselves from Christianity or from faith mm -hmm. and take it down the route of rather scientific observation. And people which have been sort of attracted to this specific field of philosophy and science slash psychology, they being a great portion, I dare to say, atheistic in nature. Mm -hmm. And their desire was to explain the nature of the mind, nature of the psyche, of the intelligence, separating from God. So right. modern psychology as such, or in the past 18th, 19th century, was predominantly occupied by agnostics at best, atheist people, or to a certain degree, you know, believers. Um, so yes, there, there, is, there is that aspect of being reluctant to accept the, sort of the nature of the supernatural, yes. So, uh, so that's interesting because, I mean, that makes me obviously ask the follow-on question, which is, because this was something that interested you, was this maybe the initial seed that created your agnosticism to your own faith background which was christianity i wouldn't say you see i always have since well, I was well really so the question is which came first did you okay. lose belief in christianity first then did psychology or did you do the psychology then lose belief in christianity you see in nature the activities of christ in his preaching fields and in his character was always appealing to me. Right. I wouldn't say there was a part in me or part of my life when I rejected or somehow disbelieved in God or in Christ. Rather, I would say it was a 
some enhancement or add-on to the character and activities of, of Christ. My initial impetus to study psychology was from a big degree to even create a bridge between the Eastern philosophy mm -hmm. and modern Western approach to psychology. So I wouldn't say in my life there was a part when I didn't believe in supernatural or when I went right. agnostic or this disbelief became a disbeliever. That's very powerful because, I mean, that's very useful as well. Because, so you were always a believer in the supernatural. Just, just, I mean, and that's very interesting because you went from, I guess, one theological view to now a different theological view. And so, you know, the obvious sort of, I guess, the follow on from that is as you went on that journey, um, because as you know, in Christianity as well as in Islam, you know, we do have some, you know, the idea of doctrine and the idea of dogma. Um, and while we differ fundamentally with the Christians on doctrine and dogma, one of the things we can agree on is the oneness of God. You know, there is only one ultimate reality that has created all of existence. How does that sit within your theological framework at the moment? I would say it's a very important point. And as far as it may look complex or deceiving or somehow uh, difficult to either comprehend, understand or accept, Hinduism as such, in its root, in its fundamental peak and platform, is a monotheistic tradition. I know it sounds like... Okay. You have no, 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 I understand. I mean, I get the fact that I mean, because we've had so many streams now. I understand yes, that, yes. you know, the 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 ultimate reality of, um, you know, it, you know, various names um, that you come by, but essentially, the ultimate reality is manifested in in this sort of trio that that realizes itself within within the various traditions, and and this is where we differ now. So we can agree on the ultimate reality, that's for sure. But this begs the question of which came first? Is the ultimate reality or the creation? Because if nothing exists, then nothing begets nothing. Mm -hmm. In our tradition, we say the ultimate reality, God, Allah, he was the one that was there, pre-existing, without beginning, without end. He is the creator, and existence and creation is separate to him, right? What is your understanding of? Uh, because I know, I know you have this idea that that you know Krishna actually exists in reality as well, which for us is a blasphemy. Mm -hmm. So how do you square that circle? Because 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 if we say the infinite becomes finite, that's actually a living contradiction. So how mm -hmm. how do we square that? That's a very, very interesting, very good point. The, the actual fact is that Krishna or, you know, God is eternally present in his spiritual realm. And when he descends, he descends with all his paraphernalia, all his associates and all those, all the, the realm which is in the spiritual realm. So because it, it is said in one of the verses in the Bhagavad Gita, saying aham sarvasya prabhava mata sarvam pravatate, which means I am the source of everything, material and spiritual. Both, everything emanates from me. And interesting enough, uh, I mean, my name is Antaranga. Antaranga means, Antar means internal, and Anga means a portion. So Antaranga, it's a, it's a internal energy of God, the spiritual energy. And then there you have the counterpart, which is Bahiranga, which means the material energy, the material creation. And then you have the third type of energy, which are us, the souls, called tatashta, which basically means marginal. You as a soul, in these in this life, you have a choice, either spiritual or material. Right? That's your choice. That's the free will. That's I think all the all the religions kind of they come to conclusion that you have a free will. You can choose between matter and spirit, or spiritual activities and material activities. Um, the material realm is a god's creation. And he, as God as he is, he can do whatever he desires. 
if he descends, he descends with the spiritual realm behind him. And he descends that everything around him is spiritual. So we consider God to be a person which doesn't necessarily contradict with the infinity, with the magnitude, with the uh, with all in reverence. And he has his pastimes and these pastimes are very attractive. So when one meditates on the pastimes, he naturally becomes attracted. His mind becomes attracted to the activities of the Lord. And in this way, he at least you should sort of a, a loose attraction for the mundane activities of this material life. And in this way, one can somehow elevate themselves to be qualified to enter the kingdom of God. Brother Sam, do you want to come in here? Yeah. Yes, brother. Brother, how do you explain uh, us about the pastime of Krishna's and Gopi? Say that again. How do you explain the pastime of Krishna and Gopi? Krishna and Gopis. So yeah. this, this is considered in our tradition very, very sensitive, very elevated, very sort of a internal discussion. And um, I'm sure some of, some of the things in, uh, in the Muslim tradition are also quite esoteric and uh, they're not discussed previously or without any sort of a qualification or without any because certain activities may be perceived without material mundane mind from material mundane senses. And then because we have this material body and because we have these material senses and material mind, we have a tendency to observe spiritual activities from a mundane perspective. So I can only say that these, according to our tradition, these activities between Krishna and his uh, associates are purely spiritual. And as such, we should not judge them based on our material observation. That's all I can say. And mm -hmm. if you don't mind, I would rather not go deeper. Okay, what's what's the definition okay. of pastime? Because you mentioned pastime, Sam. Um, what is that yeah. in, in your worldview, Antaranga? Pastime means uh, unique activities which are happening uh, between the Lord and his associates. Is that it or is there more to that? I mean, there are varieties of pastimes. Uh, there are varieties of activities which uh, the Lord tries to present either certain message or certain something which called rasa. Rasa means a taste, it means a relationship, it means a mellow. So if the Lord wants to present certain mellow or certain presentation of his mood, he does, does it according to uh, different time, different place and different circumstances, which is pleasing. This is uh, called, is it called Leela or something like that in Sanskrit? Yes, that's another terminology, yes. Correct. Okay, so are we are in, in the... Um, in the bigger picture, are we part of the Leela? What are we? Oh, that's a very nice question. Um, depends on your consciousness. Like, for instance, I've done a bit of research, a bit of study. So um, I have this book, Vedas, Islam and the Vedas. Okay. It's done by one of, and I've done some research. I, I, I've been studying for the last couple of weeks. I have okay. writing of books, which are making wonderful sort of a, who is, who is the author of that book, if you don't mind me asking? There's the gentleman which is from uh, our tradition. His name is Rasa Mandala. Okay. It's an interfaith dialogue. And um, so the answer is, if we are in the Leela, and the answer is, are we qualified to perceive the Leela or the, the pastime of the Lord? So, for instance, in Quran, I'm going to be quoting, 2.7, it is said, God has sealed their hearts and ears and veiled their eyes, Right? So based on your consciousness and your current understanding, you either see or you don't see. Either you're materially absorbed or you're spiritually absorbed. Antaranga, well, well one question there. Who's, um, whose exegesis is that? Excuse me? Whose exegesis is that that you've just explained to us? Who, who is the exegete? Exegete. Um, can you explain the terminology, please? Yes. Yeah, so, so that. So, 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 just let me finish. So, in in Islam, we have we have a, a very we have a very disciplined approach to reading the Quran. So we do not interpret verses of the Quran ourselves. 
So therefore, we we need to be either a qualified exegete, which means you have to be qualified in the tradition, or we go back to our scholars who have actually interpreted those verses according in the light of the Quran itself, in the light of the prophetic tradition, and in the light of other scholars. So the, the that that phrase that you read out, usually in all of the Islamic writings, there is usually a a reference of where that particular quote came from. So what I'm asking is where did that where that not not the interpretation but the explanation that you gave afterwards. Where is that explanation from? Well well I can only refer to this specific book. Uh, I can read the whole section. It's just it might take like one minute. It is said um, consciousness may be reflected by the covering of material conditions as white light reflected through colored glasses may appear to be red, blue, or yellow. Once these colored glasses are taken away, the white light is no longer distorted. Similarly, material activities covered one's original consciousness and spiritual activities revived one's original consciousness. And there's a quotation from Quran. Um, please correct me in the quotation, like how do you do it? Is it chapter 18, point 101? Verse okay, 101. Okay, okay. Chapter 18, so verse 101. His okay, eyes yeah. had been under a cover from remembrance of me, and they could not even hear. This was the quotation, end of quotation. As by digging a well, water is brought forth, but not created. So by spiritual activities, the true nature of the soul is reawakened. So I can continue. Basically, the gist or the, the main purport or the understanding, according to the author, is that spiritual path is something based on the consciousness or the qualification of the individuals who actually perceive uh, unique and specific activities of God. So yes. that would be my answer. If that's so the first, you know, the first passage that you mentioned from the Quran, which was chapter two, verse number seven, uh, if you read the context of that, not even the interpretation, if you just read the context with the, the few verses before and after, mm -hmm. you will understand that this is talking about, um, so the sealing of the hearts is for those people who have persisted in the disbelief. Mm -hmm. So it's not more of consciousness, it's more of their intention. Mm -hmm. So there are people out there who would continue doing the criminal activities, for example. We call them repeat offenders. So it doesn't matter if you give them two years imprisonment, as soon as they come out of the prison, they will start stealing or committing the same crime again. So regardless of how many chances they are given, they continue in that disbelief. And this is when Allah says that Allah has sealed their hearts and the hearing and the sight is covered. They will suffer a tremendous punishment. So this is after several chances have been given to them. Only then they go into that state where they doesn't matter what they do. It's become now oblivious to them in the sense that they will continue doing so because now Allah himself has sealed their hearts and their sights. Um, but then Allah says um, before that, and for so those people who have been guided by Allah, then they will be successful. Yes. So Allah gives you the two different, um, uh, you know, the good and evil that we see in the world today, uh, which is I think prevalent in all the religions, all the faith. We all um, believe in this that there is good and there is also evil uh, in the world, and guidance is something that. Uh, Allah has given us so as long as we obey the guidance and not become disobedient and disbelievers then you will be successful it's a simple matter of whether you're obedient to God or you're disobedient to him so we have a clear connection uh, with our creator in terms of our guidance and we are not left to wander around in this world to to just live our life based on our desires based on our subjective understandings because you know every human has their own subjective understanding what might be good for you might be bad for another chap you know even within the same family so this is something we have more of an objective nature when it comes to the do's and don'ts within islam which you must have heard uh, might have heard of we call it the um, the halal which is the permiss permissible and the haram which is prohibited so Allah has told you specifically things which are prohibited, like eating pork or consuming alcohol. These things are specifically mentioned. Now, if somebody, despite knowing these facts, which will lead to your detriment, 
they continue, you know, consuming alcohol or pork or whatever, and then they call themselves a Muslim, then this person will not be successful. And this is which goes into the next passage where it says that, and there are some who say we believe in Allah in the last day, yet they are not true believers. So these are the hypocrites, which is another category, which they pretend to be believers, but in reality, what can judge from their fruits is of disbelief. So these are the three categories which Allah calls to in this uh, very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, which is the the, uh, the largest uh, Ch chapter two. of the Quran. Yeah. Yeah. So what I would recommend on Taranga is, is again, I mean, you, you're, you're a good student and, and you obviously, you know, you want to do research, is there is a there is actually a, a very scholarly website called Quran.com where you can look up those verses directly in context. Right. And and just like anything, you know, I wouldn't read a verse out of, you know, Bhagavad Gita out of context and say, hey, this is the representation of your religion. You know, you want to read the paragraph or maybe even the chapter and see who, what to whom and where. Because this verse actually is a rebuke. It's, it's, it's a rebuking of those who seek to essentially play games with Allah, play games with God. You know, so they think they can get away with it if they just sort of look the part, but don't do the part, right? And that's one of the things. So, and Allah says, "You don't deceive me. All you do is you deceive yourself. And at the, at the end of the day, you will be the one that will be the loser, because Allah, you know, God is not in need of any praise or any worship. He is He is already perfect. So, if the, if the whole of creation tomorrow stopped praising Him, Allah would not be one iota less." This, right? is, this is completely the same philosophy as is presented right. in the teachings of the Vedas. And um, ultimately, yes, as you mentioned, the activities and one, one thing which I which I wanted to mention is that if you if you perform an activity, it's premeditated or it's basically it's a conscious decision in majority of events. So when I mentioned consciousness, I meant, let's say, the consciousness of a thief consciousness of a liar, consciousness of a pure person, consciousness of a, of a good personality. And consciousness is a sort of an internal conduct, which in great majority of times, or in all of the times, comes on the surface eventually. So when we say that we don't have a consciousness, or uh, it means that our current stage of observing God's creation, or God's activities, or God's devotees, that we cannot fully appreciate the magnitude, yet due to the potency of the process, we may elevate our consciousness to a degree when God will bestow their mercy and give us the vision, something which we call chakshush. First we have shastra chakshush, or the vision, as you've been giving me this, this uh, lovely presentation regarding uh, how to read Quran, you have to have vision through the scriptures, it's a concoction, but you have to see through the eyes of scriptures. We have the same thing. So, but it's just the theory at this point for us. So it's, if you say God is great, is a theory at this point. We don't fully understand the magnitude of the greatness, but that we call it jnana or knowledge. But by the process of applying spiritual wisdom, it comes to vigyan, which becomes realized knowledge. Like for instance, if I say, don't touch the fire, it, you can burn yourself. That's knowledge. But by you sort of uh, not believing me or touching actually the fire, it becomes realized knowledge. And from this point onwards, you always know that this fire is burning. So there's a big difference for us in terms of knowledge and something which is like a realized knowledge. So you mean but theory, so to, theory and practice, basically. Exactly. So the two, two questions. So I have two questions there, um, and two very short questions actually, uh, and then I'll, I'll hand over to Brother Hashim uh, or Brother Sam. The first one is is so this um, state of advanced knowledge. Do you perceive God in God's fullness, or are you still limited? Well, that's that's this is a very very interesting and very deep question. Um, in our tradition, is said that you can never actually perceive God in fullness because even let's say by the mercy of direct mercy of the Lord, He will present Himself in fullness to you. Moment afterwards, His His magnitude will grow. So what you perceived is not the reality next moment. Does it make sense? 
So it's like the opulence of the Lord is eternally sort of a growing and eternally expanding. So what you perceived is not a reality moment afterwards because his magnitude, his beauty, his opulence growed from that moment when you perceived well, Okay, so growth for you or growth in absolute terms? Growth in the presence of the Lord means that his glory, his opulence is eternally increasing. Oh, I see. So, so whether you view him or not, understand him or not, his opulence is always growing. Always growing. Okay, so this means at some point he is less, and at one point he is more. This is this is interesting. I was also thinking about this recently about this question, and um, God is absolute. God yes. is great in all time, place, and circumstances. But because with our mind and with our intelligence, we pose mathematical, numerical sort of a disposition on the Lord, like less and more. But in the spiritual realm, in the absolute truth, is eternally great. But yet, moment after, he can be considered to be even greater. Does it make sense? Uh, no, it doesn't actually, uh, because I mean, it's not that the it's not that the sentence you're saying is, isn't. I, I mean, I understand the words that you're saying. I mean, it's English, and grammatically correct. But what I'm saying is the concept itself does not make sense because if we believe in an ultimate being that is the ultimate source and therefore infinite in, well, the greatest, let's call it the greatest, right? Which means that greatness was there unconstrained eternity past and it will be there eternity into the future therefore at no point in time can we ever ever say that it grew or it became less See, those words are the words that are meaningless well, you cannot apply those words to that essence we call this sort of a expansion or this terminology of uh, greatness of the Lord achintya achintya basically means inconceivable so but some of the portions of the Vedic scriptures, they're saying, yes, God is magnanimous, God is great, God is eternally expanding his sort of a magnitude or opulence. And uh, it, it's like, yeah, it's inconceivable to, to present it in a such a way. But it's not a limiting factor, it's not a li something which will limit the Lord or the God or God, but it's just eternally expanding. That's the only so, okay, so, yeah, so my second question, so, so and we'll get to this later, because the second question I want to ask is, is based on your psychological training, what is your conception of truth? What do you believe truth is? Do you believe in, in what theory of truth do you, do, you, do you hold to? What is truth for you? Truth... Basically, Veda, Veda, for instance, means knowledge. Vedanta means the conclusion of all knowledge. And the conclusion of all knowledge is that God is a person and we have eternal relationship with him in a servitorship. And the, the truth is that the, we as a souls, we are pleasure seeking. Or we always seek something which is we always seek happiness and the truth is that the only happiness we can find in communion or in service to god i would say that's the truth and do you believe in i mean so do, do the concepts of absolute truth and subjective truth are they meaningful to you this is this is one thing about the Vedas, which is very, very unique, is that they very much consider the unique position of the individual according to time, place, and circumstances. So the Vedas, they cooperate, they, they will somehow observe what is your level, your stage, your understanding, your consciousness, your attributes, your abilities, your qualities. And based on that, they will help you to present a philosophy which is sort of helpful for you at that specific time. But there is a concept of absolute truth. But there is also a concept of growing truth. Growing truth in a sense that, for instance, 
um, let's 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 say in the school, the janitor, janitor or someone who's doing the cleaning, he's he's got the supremacy over the halls and the cleanliness within the within the school. For instance, in a in a classroom, there's a supremacy of a teacher, and above the teacher, there's a headmaster. So he has a supremacy over the school. Above the headmaster is some kind of re regional sort of a region coordinator for education. Above him is the minister of education. Above the minister of education is is the king. So there are different levels of truths according to your stage of consciousness, what you can handle. But there is also of absolute supreme truth, yes. And do you believe truth then? Okay, so absolute truth means truth which, regardless of whether I exist, you exist, whether anything exists, this is always. For example, like the idea that um, one plus one equals two. Okay, whether I exist, you exist, nobody exists, that is a truth that is will never change. That is an absolute truth. Okay. Um, my hand is warm is a relative truth, right? It's just right now it's warm, but it could be cold tomorrow. And, and, and the fact that I tell you right now that it's warm, it's true right now, but it may not be true tomorrow when I go for a walk in the morning, for instance. So I didn't lie to you. It was subjective and relative to the moment. But also one of the other hidden assumptions in truth as well is that the concept must be coherent, right? Uh, because one of the things we 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 buy every day is we live by the idea of if I see a bus, then I do not walk in front of it because I know I will probably not exist after it runs over me. So there is this sort of understanding that this logical assumption that I this logical sort of um, conclusion that I come to, based on the information around me, it coheres to it co it, first of all it it. First of all, there is a correspondence to it in, in reality, which is this thing will hurt me. Secondly, there is a coherent in that for every instance where that particular situation comes about, the likely outcome is non-existence for the individual or, or at least severe damage of some kind. So one of, one of, one of the key tenets of Islam is that we believe in absolute truth and we believe in coherence that all of everything that comes from god is coherent by definition why because allah god is the ultimate source of knowledge ultimate source of power ultimate source of understanding and therefore anything that he reveals to us in his wisdom and justice will be coherent true and therefore satisfying to the soul because we are we are designed by god with factor with faculties of rationality and logic to essentially interlink with that kind of knowledge and when it doesn't what do we have as a unicologist we have cognitive dissonance and so whenever we recognize cognitive dissonance in anything our first reaction is this is probably not true how do you respond to that with, with some of the challenges that you've just explained earlier? Um, in our tradition, in Bhagavad Gita, one of the aspects of the mind is thinking, feeling, and willing. And there is sort of a structure in terms of what do we accept as uh, in a hierarchy. So first is the platform of the soul, then is the platform of the intelligence, platform of the mind, and platform of the senses. And you can see different individual personalities according to their stage and level of elevation they're taking their guidance or their predominant source of decision making is based on these levels the senses the mind the intelligence and ultimately the soul so what you presented now at this point is that our mind is many times flickery our mind is many times not coherent our mind says emotion our intelligence says oh, discrimination but what happens, and especially in, in this present day and age, the, the mind is very powerful in a rather negative way. The thinking, feeling aspect of the mind is very powerful. So what the mind says is, let's say, I, I, I don't like someone. So because the intelligence is weak, the intelligence will actually subordinate itself to the power of the mind and say, okay, I'll give you all the logical reason why this person is unlikely. 
On the other hand, if you say, I like someone, the intelligence will give you all the different attributes why you should logically like this personality. But by you associating with the correct source of information, um, for us, the, the Vedas or the spiritual scriptures like Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam and so on, your discrimination becomes detached from the emotional spectrum. So rather than me saying, well, I don't like this person, the intelligence will be, no, but he's a, he's a soul. He's created by God. Therefore, you should develop some kind of respect towards him. Be, be merciful, be grateful, and appreciate it. Otherwise, if you dislike someone, it means it's like you dislike God himself. I hope that makes sense. So, well, yeah, well, okay, so let me push back a little bit here because I think there's some presuppositions here. One is um, this... I mean, this is again part of the the world view that you have, which is, and we'll get to this, which is the if God exists as part of reality, then God is in everything, right? We we fundamentally disagree with this, okay? And and, and again, we will explain why because it goes back to the idea: it is logically incoherent that something that is infinite can ever be contained within finite right so whether you are a person whether you are uh, this existence this creation time space reality right the infinite is not because the time space and reality in this universe is by definition finite how do we know it's finite because the logical exercise of um the logical sort of you know various arguments and we won't go into them today but there's various arguments which demonstrate that this reality that we live in has a beginning and so therefore anything that has a beginning is finite by definition so therefore for me i think everything everything else you've said is fine and, and we can agree with the fact that other souls need to be respected other souls need to be um um treated with equal um um um, deference, etc., etc., as we would expect to be out. So, however, the core of it, the core of it is where if the core is suspect, then the rest for us becomes problematic, even if it's good on, on the other side, right? And so the core of it is, is how do we justify the fact that the ultimate reality, God who has created everything, is also in reality itself? In that, in that confined reality. You see, that for me, the infinite in the finite, similar to what the Christians say, you know, when Jesus became um, manifested in the flesh as Jesus, and we ask, we ask them, we say, okay, is Jesus God? They say, yes. Is Jesus man? Yes. Well, what was he? Well, no, was he man or was he God? They say, no, he's 100% man, 100% God, and it's a mystery, right? It sounds to me, and I, with all due respect, I'm not being... Is the the it's a similar kind of argumentation that you're you're doing here with Krishna. The the main spiritual sort of foundation of the Sanata Dharma tradition is that there's not only one finite. So basically, they say that there's not only one universe, but there there's multiverses. That's what the Vedas are presenting. But there are many, many, many other universes, bigger and smaller than than this one that we are living in at the moment. So God's creation is really, really great. It's basically magnanimous it's it's very big but imagine that you are you can create a house the house is internally within your mind right and you put it on a paper and some or another you approach different personalities and say you construct this so this house becomes a manifestation of your consciousness of your mind of your intelligence and you are the one who's the creator of this of this structure but saying that me as a creator i'm not able to enter my creation is a limitation so me as a possessor of the energy which is what i created i'm the possessor of this creation it comes from me it comes from my energies and to say that because i am unlimited because this limited structure came from my sort of a, as an analogy my unlimited consciousness or my unlimited mindset I cannot enter because of this. It's a limitation. So it's a it's an opposing thing. Uh, in the in the point which you mentioned regarding Christianity, our sort of a conclusion is that 
God is not person as a as a man is, right? Because we are made of skin, flesh, bones, God, blood, veins, bone, and as such, material nature is decaying as a as a natural thing. It grows, it sustains itself as a byproduct that decays and then it dies. But the body of the Lord we consider it to be transcendental or spiritual. Transcend in its root, it means going beyond. So it doesn't have the features of uh, of the material doesn't have the material aspect of kind of a decaying so it may look like a man but it's a it's a transcendental body because there's no difference between the psyche between between the the soul and the body it's it's absolute it's ultimate because for us there's a difference between the soul and our body but there in in god as krishna he's there he's absolute there's no difference between the soul and the body so that's one of the sort of a perspective of the scriptures. So does that mean that... Andranka, the... brother. Go, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I'll, I'll be right back, actually. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, brother Andranga, I have a few questions, very quick questions. Like, uh, do you believe Krishna to be the God, the Supreme Being? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you believe the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam to be the word of God? Yes. Okay. Uh, means uh, uh, the word of Krishna. Correct. Yeah. And do you believe in the translation and commentary of uh, Swami Prabhupada, the Very head of the school? Yes. Awesome. awesome. So as we were talking about the pastime and the Leela, so if we read Srimad Bhagavatam, we have come across few stories about Krishna and Shiva and Brahma. Uh, uh, I just want to know more about the stories. Is it really a pastime or what moral lessons are we getting from that by reading such stories? Hmm. So uh, there is one, one uh, verse here uh, right in front of me. I was just reading Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, book number 10, chapter number 29, verse number 45 to 46. Is talking about the pastime of Krishna with the gopis. Sri Krishna went to the gopis to the bank of the Yamuna river where the sand was cooling and the wind uh, and lit by the reverse wave. Bow and fragments of the lotus, there Krishna threw his arms around the gopis and embraced them. He rose cupid in the beautiful young ladies of a Raja by touching their hand, hair, thighs, belt and breasts by playful scratching them with the fingernails and also joking with them. This is how the Lord enjoy his pastime. So what moral lesson are we getting from this? Uh, could you please explain about this? Sir? Yes, you, you picked the most esoteric of the verses. You picked the most. Uh, we, we consider the 10th, 10th section of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which we call the Kanto, 10th Kanto of Srimad Bhagavatam as a, as a as something which is studied or read after we finish reading and somehow understanding the first nine cantos or the first nine parts. If you read the first nine parts of Srimad Bhagavatam, they, what they describe is uh, how the manifestation of the cosmos happened, uh, what is the unique position of the soul towards, towards Krishna, uh, what, are the, what are the different attributes of devotees, and uh, pastimes which are less esoteric. The tenth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, specifically the section which you picked up it's um it's it's a very very esoteric uh part of Srimad Bhagavatam which if you approach it from a mundane perspective from a perspective of a, as I mentioned before of a person who lives in this material world and is united with let's say with a woman or then we look at it as a mundane material affairs but if you look at it from a perspective that Krishna is the supreme personality of God it and these interactions between the gopis and krishna are not based on lust whatsoever but uh, they are based on interaction between possessor of energy and the energetic then it's acceptable depends on the vision and the approach no, but the words but the words that prabhupada has mentioned there is he rose cupid in the beautiful young ladies krishna rose cupid which is cupid. lust i think so Right. Yes, Cupid, Cupid may be, you see, uh, again, it is said that material world is a perfect, per perverted reflection of a spiritual world. So when we speak about lust, 
when we speak about attraction between man and woman, that is material. That is a material sort of a attraction because I'm attracted to your body. I'm attracted to the way you look, the way you smell, the, the way you deal, the way you're, you have your character. And I, I desire to possess you for my own gratification or for my pleasure. Uh, the unique interactions between Krishna and the young damsels of Raj as a expansion or as a energy, as Shakti, which comes from Krishna, is a rather not union of lust, but rather union of uh, loving and devotional reciprocation between the Lord and his, and his energy. So uh, that's the best way I can offer in terms of presenting these very esoteric points. Um, if you wish, you can make other quotations from first nine cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam because the tenth one, and specifically this one that you selected, is very, very uh, requires. Okay. So there is one. There is one more story. Yeah. There is one more story uh, about the Shiva. Uh, okay. It's a chapter, uh, book number eight, chapter number twelve, verse number twenty-four to thirty-three. It's talking eight, about 12. the Shiva and the Mahatma. Uh, book number eight, 12, 24 to 33. Okay, 24 to 33. This is the one about Mohini. Mohini. Okay. Lord, Lord Shiva, his beautiful senses taken away by the women because of the lusty desires to enjoy, enjoy with her, uh, became so mad for her that even in the presence of the Bhavani, his wife, he did not hesitate to approach her. Mm. So in 32, 32 verse, it says that just as a maddened and bull elephant followed a female elephant who is able to conceive pregnancy, Lord Shiva followed the beautiful women and discharged his semen, even though his uh, uh, discharge semen doesn't go in vain. Mm. So what's your question? So uh, what moral lessons are we getting out of this? It shows that we consider to Shiva to be a very great Vaishnava, a very great devotee. Someone who is in court, very, very renounced, is he's one of the Trimurti, is something between a uh, living entity or a soul and something between Bhagavan, Krishna, something like, like something between, something between soul and something between God. And as such, he's, um, he's very detached from all these sort of materialistic activities. And he's, he's a husband of Parvati or in other name, Durga. And um, he's very detached, as I mentioned a few times, from the material activities, specifically from interacting with the opposite gender. But this specific sequence is so show that Lord accepted this sort of a position of a Mohini Murti. And the beauty of Mohini Murti was so exquisite, so beautiful, and so attractive that the potency of her beauty was out of this material world. And because Shiva is a very great renunciate, and he cannot be attracted whimsically and uh, whimsically by the material luster. He got attracted by Mohiti, Mohini Murti. So this establishes the fact that the beauty of the Lord attracts even the greatest of all renunciates, which is Shiva. So that will be my humble offering as a commentary or as a some explanation. So in terms of... Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, sorry. So, you uh, will, will it be okay? Yeah, just, just a minute. Sorry, Brenda. Will it be okay if we say that Mohini is one of the avatars of Lord Vishnu as Krishna? So, uh, uh, can we consider Mohini as Krishna himself? Uh, we can consider her to be an incarnation. 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 Okay, but uh, yeah, as as a, a, a Krishna is an incarnation of Vishnu, so do so do many avatars, just like Ram, uh, Varaha, uh, Narsimha, and so do Mohini. So can we consider all this to be Krishna? Uh, it's it's other way around. Um, according to, you see, in Vedas, you have different hierarchy of the scriptures. And uh, on the topmost of the all the hierarchy of the scriptures is Srimad Bhagavatam, which we call Amala Purana, which means spotless scripture. And within this spotless scripture is established, it is said, Krishna stu Bhagavan Swayam, which means Krishna is the supreme personality he is the avatari which means the source of all avatars and any other expansions like the vishnu and uh, ramachandra and mohini murti and Bamanadev and Barahadev and matsya and so on and so forth are rather considered to be expansions which are bearing certain portion fragment or aspects 
of Krishna for the specific time, place, and circumstances and message which needs to be delivered. Okay, so uh, my question still stays the same, brother. Like, uh, uh, what moral lesson are we getting out of that? Uh, because uh, uh, we, we read this verses that uh, Mohini was completely naked and she was hiding herself behind the bushes and Shiva ran behind her, caught her with the braids and embraced her. Then after back, uh, like, uh, 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 by running behind her, uh, she, uh, he, he discharged his semen. Mm. So what moral lesson are we getting out of this? If it's a word of God. Uh, the, the conclusion of this specific pastime is that even the greatest renunciate, as I mentioned, which is Shiva, which is not attracted by any material beauty presented in this material creation, was attracted. And this only establishes the fact that Shiva is not the supreme. He's not the supreme personality. Rather, he's an expansion of one of also one of the something which we call Guna avatars of, of Krishna. And um, he was... To a certain degree, he was like very like, yeah, I'm very renounced. I'm not attracted by anything. And the Lord wanted to present that this aspect of mine, this angle of mine, this Mohini Murti is very attractive even to you, who is very much renounced. The uniqueness or the aspect of nakedness and the semen discharge is um, it's there. But again, we're utilizing our material experiences to sort of judge these transcendental pastimes. So... Uh, yeah, you can, whichever way you desire to accept it. But we, as practicing, you know, followers of Sanatana Dharma, uh, we, mm -hmm. we, we ask people or the readers to be cautious not to imply material discrimination or these specific aspects. So it seems like okay. even, even Shiva, who is supposed to be, is he, is he God for you? What is Shiva? Well, no, Shiva is considered to be, um, as I mentioned, Guna Avatar or one of the expansions of the Lord. He's like God in, in association with the material nature. He's the one who deals with the intricacies of dissolution, uh, I mean, destruction of the universe and such. Yeah, so he is God, right? According to you. Uh, no. No, in the, in the format which you have in mind. Okay, so when you mentioned the three... Um, the three Trimurti, you know, you have Vishnu, Shiva, sorry, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Correct. So from these three, who is the absolute God? Who is who? Who is again? Who is the absolute God from these three? The absolute or, they, or, or is it none of them? One of one of the one of the one of the interesting analogies which are offered is that Think about, like, for instance, as I mentioned, Shima Bhagavatam and Krishna is established as the Supreme. Oh. So Krishna is considered to be the Supreme God. And if you have, let's say, one candle, and if you have, if you take that one original candle and light another one, and another one, and another one, another one, the light from the original candle and the other candles doesn't diminish. But there's always the one which is original. So out of these three, Vishnu, Brahma, and Shiva, Vishnu is considered to be God, but he's the incarnation. He he's, this is very technical. This comes under technicalities of sort of the Sanatana Dharma tradition, but he's incarnation of of Krishna, Vishnu. Okay, so is, is he the only one who is incarnation, or is Shiva also an incarnation of Krishna? Shiva is something which we call Guna Avatar. Guna means the quality. So uh, I, I, I'm sure you heard before this concept of Triguna, uh, goodness, passion, and ignorance, Tamas, Rajas, and Sattva. So different personalities preside over these three modes. And think about these three modes as a three colors, right? Yellow, blue, and red. So by you actually taking these three principal colors, blue, red, and uh, yellow, and by mixing them, you get all the palette all the color we can perceive by our eyes at this specific moment. So these three modes, this fashion and ignorance, by mixing them, you have the, all the palettes of the creation of different types of consciousness, different types of material bodies, different types of uh, approaches to God, different different things. According you to need, you need you need the primary colors still, isn't it? Yeah, these are the three primary. Yeah, so the primary colors have to be there. That's the reason I asked you. Why would you not consider the other two as primary thoughts, if you want to put it in that, to, to understand the uh, the analogy that you have given? Why would you not consider the other two primary colors as being primary gods? Um, 
Why would you consider them? Well, first of all, they make statements about themselves, who they truly are. And you know, if you if you not understand or let's say analogy, if if there's some misunderstanding of a specific topic, it's presented by some some personality and we, we don't know who he is, you go to him, approach him and you ask him for his statement about who he is in relation to God. So Shiva himself presents who he is in, in relationship to Krishna. Uh, Vishnu presents himself who he is in relationship to Krishna. And Brahma equally presents himself who he is in connection to Krishna. Now, yeah, brother, but as you said that uh, Vishnu is considered as supreme uh, compared to Brahma and uh, Shiva. But if we read uh, Skanda Purana, there is one uh, story about uh, Vishnu and Vrinda. He committed adultery with uh, Vrinda and later he was cursed. Vrinda cr cursed Vishnu. Uh -huh. So how do you consider him to be supreme when he is committing adul an adultery and uh, side by side he is being cursed by a girl, by Vrinda? You're bringing all these esoteric pastimes out. That's, um, you've done also your homework. That's, that's very nice. Um, so as I mentioned, these are pastimes and behind them there is the, some some kind of a, like a message which is established. You see, if, if we if we judge pastimes like this, we can we should observe the consequences of the activity. So what is the consequences of the activity is that there was a unique presentation or offering of the Lord that he approached the living entities in a specific format or a specific shape of being worshipped. So Brinda Devi as such, she's a eternal servant of the Lord and her curse was rather not a curse rather a, you know it was a manip manipulation to present certain feature of the Lord so what we consider what we see as a curse the depth of that specific unique pastime is that it's actually a rather blessing or rather something positive than what we perceive as negative so um, and ultimately what we perceive as negative or positive is is it's uh, something which brings pleasure to the Lord, because only his very devoted, only only great devotees may have these unique interactions with the Lord, and it's a pastime. So there are different levels and layers to these unique specific features and pastimes. No, uh, the past. Yeah, sorry, sorry to say that, but uh, if we consider this as a pastime, how can it be a pastime when he is being cursed, when someone is getting offended, when some someone is getting deceived, Vrinda was deceived, uh, Krish, uh, Vishnu has disguised uh, uh, himself as a, as a husband and committed committed an adultery with her. Uh, later when, he, when she realized that uh, it's uh, not her husband, but Vishnu, so she pushed him and said that, oh, uh, Vishnu, what have you done to this, d done this to me as you being a god? Uh, you have committed an adultery, fire upon you, I curse you. So how can this be a pastime? Well, what we perceive as something negative in the end is rather positive. So, you see, Vinda Devi, she is ultimately a great devotee, a great personality whose only desire is to actually facilitate uh, the enjoyment of the Lord. So if the, if the Supreme Lord desires to be first to have that unique relationship between his devotee, then he, he will just do it. Why not? It's a, it's a situation which we judge again with our material eyes. But for the Lord, it's a, it's a nila. It's something which is enjoyable, something which is acceptable something which is as a very and uh, simultaneously the outcome was that the lord offered himself <clears throat> the lord offered himself as a worshipable personality to a variety of devotees afterwards so the outcome was rather worshipable and spiritually enhancing all right so i just want to ask there's a lot of noise on the line from somebody yeah i think sam you've got to fix your mic i think there's some there we go yeah it's gone now yeah, yeah. also i you. have to i have to say that the time it's coming to 7 p.m for me so right, if right. there are any sort of a further uh points or questions no, 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 well, well actually i mean what we could do, Antaranga, is i mean we've had a lot of questions uh, i think maybe just um where are we going another 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll open up for Q&A anyway to, to the, to the yeah, audience but, uh, a little bit. I think uh, what Brother, Brother Antaranga, you 
you, you got how many more minutes so we can open for q well, i was i was humbly suggesting that by 7 p.m if we can wrap up as oh. i still have certain services and activities like that. oh okay yes, yes. okay so let's okay, sure. let's open up to q a we have yeah let's do that okay let's do that there's swati waiting in the background so i'll just bring her in assalamualaikum sister swati Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, brother. Wa, wa I just had a very wa. good experience of practicing patience today. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, uh, I mean, greetings to brother Antaranga here. And of course, uh, uh, Assalamualaikum to all the pan esteemed panel here. In so brother Antaranga, I just wanted to introduce you to Sister Swati here because uh, she's a regular on our program. So Sister Swati is... Uh, I would say a new Muslim. She used to be a Hindu, and now she has um, embraced Islam. And uh, I think she understands Hinduism probably better than most of us <laughs> as, as Muslims here because she comes from that background and she has a personal experience, obviously. So, yes, yeah, Sister Swati, if you got any questions for uh, Antaranga, please go ahead. Oh, any? I have, I think I can write an entire book on number of questions which could be presented and gifted to our esteemed guest. Yeah, hopefully, we'll yeah. bring him back. Uh, <laughs> if it's okay yeah. with Antaranga, maybe we can get <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're short on time. So, yeah, let's, because uh, yeah. we need to finish by 7 p.m. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, um, it was very fascinating, very interesting. You know, I was listening to the discussion and, um, of course, what uh, our brother Antaranga had said about it, um, if I could refer to you like that, I hope uh, it'll be fine uh, to you, uh, brother Antaranga, if I could refer to you with this uh, name. Oh, yes, of course, whatever whatever works, it's fine, Antaranga. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I because, yeah, my family uh, used to, you know, like they still uh, are into, uh, you know, uh, they would be worshipping... Uh, Lord Krishna and uh, I had also been for uh, quite you know a number of years been practicing it however there were a lot of questions which you know I would not be able to grasp or you know understand and because of the answers not being received so um, and when of course I read through um, you know the five pillars of Islam and Quran it just resonated uh, so I just wanted to ask you for instance like you know uh, uh, because we were told in Hinduism uh, say Sanatan Dharma, that, uh, uh, you know, the Brahman, uh, in terms of the almighty supreme creator, had the three incarnations uh, in terms of Brahma, Vishnu and Mahesh. And uh, uh, from that, we, I mean, what I understood was that uh, Krishna, Ram and all the Das Avatars, which have been there, have been the incarnation of Lord Vishnu. Uh, whereas you were uh, explaining and saying that, you know, it's vice versa for that matter, where we have Krishna, uh, uh, you know, Krishna being the being the God and uh, Vishnu being the avatar, you know. So uh, I just so in that sense, um, uh, where uh, where would you see the entire idea of that supreme Brahman, which is there also in the Advait philosophy? Because, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you know, here, when you're talking about Vaishnavism, I think it falls more into the Dwait, uh, Dwait sect and more into the Saguna aspect rather than the Nirgun aspect, maybe. Uh, because, you know, of course, it's been mentioned here in Bhagavad Gita that you can worship in any form and uh, devotion being the best, you know, the Bhakti, uh, Bhakti Yoga could be the best form of it to okay. be practiced yeah so i sent so. a few questions there let me just so i don't forget let me go from yes yes please so first question which you presented thank you for them by the way that was very very nice very relevant my um, pleasure nice nice and kind of a concise and quick um as i mentioned there are different degrees of scriptures that we accept and worship you have different puranas itihasas you have different upanishads you have different sure. uh, scriptures uh but one of the top most authoritative scriptures throughout the whole Vedic tradition is uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. And as I mentioned before, Srimad Bhagavatam states very firmly that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. Krishna is to Bhagavan Swayam. And as such, all the different avatars are emanating from him. So we accepted the conclusion of the Amala Purana or mm. of Bhagavatam. So that was one, one question. Another question was... Um, so Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma are different expansions or 
different avatars. Okay, let, I found one quotation. There are 18 major Puranas. Brahma, Padma, Vishnu, Shiva, Vishnu, Shiva Linga, Garuda, Naradya, Bhagavat, Agni, Bhavisya, Skanda, Brahma, Vaivarta, Markandeya, Vamana, Varaha, Matsya, Purma, and Brahmananda Purana. So these Puranas have different sort of a different perspective on how to observe God based on your specific point of view, based on your specific consciousness. So we are all different. We are all on the different levels to approach God and the Puranas and the scriptures can facilitate your growth no matter where you are. Doesn't matter what you do, where you are, there's a still possibility for achieving uh, God. For this day and age, the recommended process is the process of Bhakti or Bhakti Yoga, which means love and yeah. love. And this is introduced in connection to Krishna. Yeah. Yeah, very right. Uh, in fact, you know, I would I would just want to add to that, that since bhakti would be, and that's what we, we see here all around us, you know, people are uh, are into that bhakti tradition, into that devotion. And the way, for example, Sam was asking, and he was, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, seeking clarification about the various pastimes which had been there. And very correctly, as you had said, that, you know, those have uh, very deep esoteric meanings associated with that. And it should not be just taken very literally in that sense, uh, uh, you know, by the people. Because I think, as has been also mentioned in Puranas, that we have a Kanisht Adhikari, we have a Madhyam Adhikari, and we have an Uttam Adhikari in terms of, you know, devotees, the level of the aspirants which have been there. So, uh, you know, being the Kanisht, being the simple one uh, who may just take the text in a very little fashion, the Madhyam Adhikaris being the one who go to slightly deeper levels and the Uttam Adhikari being the one who understands the deeper meaning, the esoteric teachings, etc. So in that sense, I was, and you were also, you know, very, uh, uh, very, very kindly explaining that, uh, you know, it's important to meditate on these pastimes for us to get closer to Krishna. So I was just, uh, uh, but there are also very deep es esoteric meanings which are associated with these pastimes. So unless and until a common man's mind understand the significance of, you know, what is the deeper metaphoric esoteric meaning associated with it, they'll not be able to meditate on it. And they might just take it very literally, which yes. is what I see around, you know, happening around so where people would just take it. Yeah, there is one recommendation before we enter in these esoteric pastimes that uh, just like in, in Islam, you have five pillars. In, yeah. in our Krishna consciousness, we have four regulated principles. Mm -hmm. First of all is no intoxication. So I think right. that's uh, no, no drinking, no smoking, nothing which kind of a mess ups with the mind and clarity of the mind. Second sort of a, is that um, no meat eating. We are purely vegetarians here, what you eat. So we try to avoid any, any bloodshed, any violence. We just try to live a ahimsa lifestyle, which means without any violence. Third one is no gambling. No gambling means that we don't play any hazard of games, which involve right. luck, luck. And the fourth one is no illicit sex. Basically, yes. means only in a marriage for the sake of procreation to have, to have a progeny. So unless one is sort of a regulated in these four, consider himself Self to enter the uniqueness and esoteric and the sensitive pastimes of the Lord. Otherwise, because of our uncontrolled mind, we will, we will offer mundane explanations and we will pre preserve them or present them from a mundane perspective. So Very that's correct. One. Uh, to that itself, uh, Brother Antranga, I would just, the way you had mentioned very correctly, in fact, in Islam also, there is prohibition of drinking, you know, uh, or getting into illicit sex, as you had mentioned, uh, uh, um, and uh, as as well as gambling. Now, uh, I was just wondering that uh, as, uh, in fact, he had also mentioned about this, the this, you know, the very dialogue which takes place in Bhagavad Gita in terms of, you know, uh, Krishna uh, helping Arjuna to fulfill his duty, you know, as and, and, and you had very well mentioned about the guna and the karma being there, that, you know, it was not being forced to him. He was being told to follow his gun and his karma to wage the war of, um, of the Mahabharat, which was taking place in the battlefield of Kurukshetra. So here, uh, I was just wondering 
that you know you said to follow ahimsa now here the gun because it's not based on on birth so uh, so you know arjuna probably at that moment uh, if we just take aside the aspect of birth that he was a kshatriya if we just take that aside because uh, as you had mentioned it that it's not based varnashram is not based on birth it's upon the gunas which you are reflecting and your karmas so if he his gunas you know what why would krishna not you know help him to reach the sattva gun which is that of ahimsa not okay. waging the war and also uh, and also uh, to be able to help him to uh, you know so, because usually it is said that he was getting attached it was I understand, more, I understand yeah. the nature of the question um, if you may i will proceed with answering them yes yes please but we are not sentimentalists sentimentalists in the sense that if there is a threat is there is immediate immediate sort of a activity which threatens your life or the life of those which are subordinate to you non violence is not an option um se- sentimental in a sense everyone is a soul but if someone tries to pillage kill poison create harm in a society and destroy the principles and the pillars of religion and tradition uh there is a caste of personalities or kshatriyas those which are governors and protectors they have full right to protect right so uh cr- the reason why krishna was not approaching arjuna in a way that please you know be, become passive be go to the forest and meditate was that the personalities which were on the opposing party being uh orientated in a rather negative way so it will be actually negative conclusion or neg- of negative consequences if a uh, passive outcome or if there will be sort of a ahimsa will be approach so we try to not be sentimental when there is fire you need to fight fire with fire and if there is a necessity for war you approach it in a such a way uh so no uh, no ways of reconciliation or maybe transforming the way we today also see you know when prisoners are held in prison a uh, lot of times it's said that let's transform them let's change their attitude rather than you know giving capital punishment like that so wouldn't wouldn't the approach be such where instead of having such you know at such you at immense uh, level of killing which was and bloodshed which was taking place to transform it in such a way where you know um, where we could have avoided it and the sattva gun could have got reflected and could have got you know displayed out from from arjuna also and the yeah, other the, side of kauravas also yeah there are certain personalities which are eligible to create a judgment but with every judgment you will kind of a uh, cover or you will receive the consequences of your judgment so these kshatriyas they've been trained from from birth from young age to understand where to kill where not to kill where to protect and where not to protect so again is another sentimental thing but i i i really appreciate your questions and i think they're very on point very sort of a balance in the uh, you know hindu tradition and a very lovely appeal for, for the islam tradition but uh, simultaneously i would like to ask the uh, respective hosts if they have any other points any other questions or any other speakers or any other personalities which would like to offer feedback i think mohammad yes but what so one, one quick question sam, just uh, i mean like just two just questions one last one yeah after sam just one last question then you know we'll sort of not bother you much <laughs> the respective uh, speakers what they what they most We, well, we the, yeah, that's down to your time, Andranga. I mean, if if you have time to address them, we can we'll, we'll engage with 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 the questions that are posed. But we'd rather just have the, these questions. Then we can invite guests on if you have time. If not, then so, we'll have to. Continue in that case. I will humbly request you. If you so we do have some guests in the background. Wait. So we'll bring one of the guests in, and then um, we can ask the other questions. So Hashim, do you want to bring the other guest in? Yeah. Could, no, uh, one of the, one of the uh, audience members actually. Okay. Abu Salam. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. Yeah, thank you for bringing me on. Uh yeah, I have a question about um the the concept the concept of the supreme being in Hinduism uh in in terms of Brahman and how is that related to the concept of uh the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have in Islam of Ar-Rahman. So um you know a lot of times in our even our translations in the Quran we do 
uh, there's a big mistake that we make uh, among the translators that they keep translating the name of Rahman as the most compassionate or the most beneficent or the source of Rahm, of, of mercy. But uh, if you look at the con context in which the way Ar-Rahman is being used in the Quran in many places, uh, it actually is a name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where uh, even it, it, it's, it's stated explicitly and also implicitly uh, where uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, that whether you invoke the name of Allah or you invoke the name of Ar-Rahman, whichever name you invoke, to him belongs all the good names. And also, uh, implicitly, you can understand when Ibrahim alayhi salam, for example, uses the name, uh, you know, uh, 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 when he says to his father that when he invokes the name of Ar-Rahman, it doesn't fit when if we use the 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 the, the, the sifa of Allah subhanahu wa taala, which is uh, when we think about Allah subhanahu wa taala as Rahman as a as an attribute rather than a name. So uh, I know I, I'm you know, and that also goes into uh, our own understanding that Allah subhanahu wa taala has sent uh, over 124,000 prophets. So we are sure that Allah subhanahu wa taala didn't you know He hasn't just forgotten the Hindus or the, the, the people who lived in the Indus Valley, or for that matter, the Chinese, for example. Uh, so even in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, min ummatin illa that what there is no, there's no ummah, there's no nation that has not seen a prophet. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent many prophets. Uh, so could this be that the, the, the concept of Brahman that we have in Hinduism, is synonymous to, uh, uh, to to the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, revealed himself to, uh, to, to, to the people who sp spoke Sanskrit. Just like in Quran, for example, we have seven qiraat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, he revealed the Quran in different dialects. So, so what's the question? So the, the, the question is that, are these two concepts uh, you know, the, of Rahman in Allah in, in Islam, the way we understand the name of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, is that synonymous with the the concept of the supreme being that the Hindus uh, that believe in, for example? Well, if you if you look at it from a chronological perspective, that you know, Hinduism as such as a tradition or a religion or a philosophical outview predates. Uh, any Judaistic traditions, or at least it's uh, sort of a manifestation. Some of the Puranas are many, many thousands of years old, and uh, the e events which are happening in the in the in the, in the Vedic tradition, like for instance the creation, creation, detailed creation of the cosmos, it's billions and trillions of years old. Like when and when you, when you speak about Brahman, Brahman is not exactly sort of a name or it's, it's a rather concept brahman means like an all-pervading aspect of the lord like maybe you heard in the you know in, in in that your body has a something that we call aura right it's like this bioenergetical sort of a thing around your body so think about brahman as as this aura so, but this aura emanates from a person so this brahman it's a it's an impersonal feature of the Lord, all-pervading aspect of the Lord's magnanimity. But this all-pervading aspect is emanating from a person, and that person is Krishna. So we have these three stages called Brahmati, Paramatmati, Bhagavaniti, Shabdete, which basically means there is Brahman, which is the all-pervading impersonal energy of the Lord, which goes through all the spiritual material creations. Then there's Paramatma, which is the Lord, which resides as a something which like a super consciousness within the heart of every living entity and there's bhagavan this situated centralized person which all these aspects and different incarnations emanate from so um it's it was a very sort of a philosophical slash sanskrit and uh, arabic question in the sense like how these if they can if they are connected i don't have the full capacity to give answer yes or no in terms of its literal meanings um, you look very equipped in this in this fashion that you you have that understanding, but um, Brahman as a concept is an all pervading aspect of the Lord, and if there is some connection, could be possibly, I don't know really. Yeah. I'm not very much a scholar, simple monk. I don't know many things. Well, th thank you so much. So th my my follow up question to that would be, 
does does Hinduism or Sanatan Dharma uh, do they look at uh, is that there are multiple? It's not a monolithic religion, is how I understand it. Sorry, that, brother you know, Salama, yes. uh, just want to interject because uh, Anat, um, Antaranga has to go, and we yeah. don't want to keep him beyond what he has already committed to stay. He's been very generous to spend like two hours with us. Yeah, no problem. We'll burden him beyond what he has already committed to us. So if you could please excuse him and just stick to one question. Uh, people who are waiting in the background, you need to switch on your camera for verification and then switch it off before you come live. If not, then we'll have to remove you to make room for other people because the, uh, the background uh, is, is completely full now. Uh, right, so Antaranga, I think uh, we will have to um, let you go, even though we don't want to. Hopefully you will come back again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask him one quick question about on the commentary of Prabhupada? With your permission, Brother Antranga, if you allow me. Who will be as a caring again? Oh. I'm sorry. Who, so it will, will be, be a quick easy? question and very easy. We'll be uh, it's very about the commentary and, commentary and translation of Prabhupada. As you said that you believe in the commentary and uh, translation of Prabhupada. So I just quote one one verse uh, from Srimad Bhagavatam, book number four, chapter number 25, verse number 41. Can, can 425. I, can I, yeah. Okay. 425. 4, 25. 41. 425. 41. 41. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. In the pulpit, in the commentary of Prabhupada, he says that in this regards, the word vikyatam is very significant. A man is always famous for his aggression towards a beautiful woman. Okay. And such aggressions is sometimes considered as rape. Although the rape is not legal, legally allowed, it is a fact that a woman likes a man to, uh, uh, in fact, it, it, in fact uh, that, that a woman like a man who is very expert at rape. So do you believe in this translation? Do you agree with Prabhupada? Oof. Okay, let me find it. This is pretty, this is pretty heavy. Um, because he gives many to every mother to have children, but for any husband, because he's called by sex. And Brother Hashim, after that, just one very simple question from my side. Mine wouldn't be as difficult as Sam's. Is that right? <laughs> I don't know Thank you. The thing is, you know, I think we will invite uh, Brother Hashim again. Okay? Yeah. So maybe let's leave it after that. Because just one, please. I'm just, I'm just going through this first, just to, to read it again. Um, uh, Antaranga, look, if you if that question is difficult to answer, we can save it for the next time. Yes, it's uh, it's yeah, I don't it's want like you taking all these juicy things. Yeah. You know, the Brother Sam, you we got a lot of feedback still from your microphone. Yeah, so yeah. Swati, you are gone. Quickly ask. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, and brother, brother Antaranga, just one thing, because I had been seeking for these answers for such a long time. And since you're here, I just thought maybe you could just enlighten me about it. Uh, this one is very, very simple, because I think every person from Sanatan Dharma knows about it. Uh, this very verse, which is so common in chapter four of Bhagavad Gita, uh, the verse seven and eight, and you would be very, very much aware of it, uh, which says, Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharataha abhyutthanam dharmasya tadatmanam srijanyaham paritraraya sadhuna vinashaya chiddushkritam dharam sansthapanathaya sambhavani yuge yuge. So here, uh, when Krishna is saying the ultimate God, he's saying that I'm coming, you know, whenever there is loss of religion, whenever there is adharm, whenever there is iniquity which increases. Uh, you know, to protect the gentlemen and to destroy the wicked, I come to establish the religion. So he comes every. I was just wondering that uh, how did it happen that he came in Dwapar Yug to establish that dharm? You know, God coming down to establish the dharm, and after that we are having the Kalyug, where you know we see a dharm being, you know, being practiced to its to its core to its hilt. So I was just wondering, how could it be that God is coming down to establish Dharm and, uh, you know, after that should be the Satyug? Why is Kalyug coming after that? Is something I keep wondering. Um, thank you for the question. Well, just like you have four circles or four seasons, right? There's a spring, there's summer, there's autumn, and there's winter. You can ask a question why these four, four seasons are happening. And the simple answer would be because that's that's the way it was designed. That's the way that 
material world is functioning and functions in a cyclic way, cyclic fashion. So there's a sort of a creation, there's a sustenance, then there is diminishing, and there's complete sort of a slumber or annihilation. So these four ages, Satya, Dvapara, Treta, and Kali, represents the consciousness of individuals. So in the age of Satya, they said the consciousness was very, very elevated of the individuals or the personalities present. And as the age has been progressing, uh, the consciousness been diminishing. And now we are in the age of Kali, which is considered to be age of iron, age of hypocrisy. Yeah. And uh, it is said that you, Sambhavami Yuge Yuge, every age, the Lord appears according to time, place and circumstances to help people with their specific problems, challenges, and to establish the Dharma. So it is said the Dharma of this day and age is Harinam Sankirtan, which means uh, chanting, chanting or remembering God's names. So we chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And within tuning to this sacred sound vibration, you can uplift your consciousness. So different age according to place, time and circumstances, specific Dharma. So, and with that said, <laughs> just that the dharma didn't get established that's what my you know problem was that after even after him coming and saying and promising and giving the oath that once i come i'll establish the dharma still we see deterioration of that and of course what you had said very correctly that in this age maybe uh, you know people are not able to uh, maybe dwell on that uh, metaphoric or esoteric meaning which may be very complicated for them to understand so uh, the very easy way out is for them to chant but what I'm seeing is that just chanting without understanding is leading to a lot of superstition amongst them and a lot of fear amongst them. So probably, it, you know, that establishment of dharm, which was the purpose of God, was something which was not getting fulfilled, was my only sort of, you know, worry or maybe concern. It so, but thank you. Within yeah. the aspect of chanting is everything is already accumulated, everything is already there. So when you chant, naturally the dharma will follow because the name is no different from the origin so the name of allah is no different from from god himself in our tradition from our perspective so that there's no difference from different names of god and god himself because the sound vibration of the name Correct. of the lord carries Correct. carries the potency the magnanimity of the lord himself so if you produce the sound vibration of god the name of god naturally you're associating with God and you receive the full blessing and benedictions. So the only the thing, the only thing is that, you know, with Allah, it's not the so, you know, the kind of pastimes which had been associated with Krishna, they are not there. So pe it's easy for people to be able to relate to it. And, you know, with the name and with the attributes, it's yeah. easy for them to dwell. But here it get, the mind gets yeah, so, so confused. So yeah. I'm sorry, I'll just stop then. Yeah. Yeah. I'll pray, I'll pray. Yeah, yeah. Brother Antaranga has to go. Um, so just, just some yeah, final words. We're all words. very eager to ask you questions. As yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think this yeah. definitely deserves us another program. Um, Brother Antaranga, if you're interested and you, you have the time, we would definitely like to invite you back on for a, another show um, at your discretion, of course. Uh, and uh, Brother Hashim, Hashim will be in touch with you. Me and Hashim, we, are, yes. we have our exchange, our phone numbers. So Fantastic. We... Fantastic. Yeah. And so again, um, thank you very much for your time, your generosity and your openness in sharing um, the the details of your faith and your understanding. And we look forward to uh, connecting again. Thank you so much. And thank you. with that, we'll thank say farewell. How, how was your experience before you go? Just tell us what is it that you wish to change or something that it was, it was very nice. I, I need to I need to admit um, I was a bit sort of uh, reluctant in the sense that there was a bit of an aspect of fear in a sense like, well, because the concept looked like four personalities which are coming from a Muslim tradition and there's one me who tried exactly. to somehow, with a very limited amount of knowledge which I possess, to somehow present Krishna consciousness or Sanatana Dharma. But I truly need to admit it was a very wonderful experience. I apologize if I um, commit any offenses or if I said something which is politically or philosophically or religiously incorrect. Uh, I was definitely enhanced by this wonderful experience and I uh, hope in the future if I may serve you in any way and uh, truly that we may de demystify Hinduism in a correct way, in a right conscious way. Uh, we, I think we will do great service to to 
other practitioners. So thank you for your time and for your... It was thank a you, pleasure uh, to have you uh, as a guest, and we look forward to um, more episodes yeah. with you. Because as, as you know, there are very few Hindus who actually are willing to come and exchange in this kind of uh, interactions. And you're, you're absolutely right, you know, four against one, five against one, it's just not fair. But we hope we didn't treat you unfairly and we we made you feel welcome. And we hope that more of these kind of interactions take place uh, rather than some sort of mudslinging as we have seen on so many other platforms. So thank you very much for, once again and um, have a good day and hope to see you again in the future. Thank and you. Brother and Taranga, maybe if you would like, you may read Quran also <laughs> to right. see in case it appeals you. Inshallah. Thank, Thank you, Adran Shankar. Thank you very much. So we, we will we'll carry on with the stream, of course. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank okay. you again. So Have a lovely we, rest we, of the evening. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. So we'll carry on with the stream because we have a lot of guests in the background for Q and A. That's right. Um, okay. Alhamdulillah. So Assalamu alaikum, Brother Mansoor. How are you doing? Uh, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Sorry. Oh, is that the microphone again acting up? Yeah. Nope. Okay. Right. So we got some people in the background. Uh, let's bring them on one by one, if that's okay with you guys. Uh, yeah. Brother Sam, I mean, if you fixed your microphone, uh, still a lot of feedback. We have a lot of noise from your microphone, brother. We have a lot of noise from your microphone for some reason. Can you hear me now at all? Yes. yes can. Can now, you now. Is it, it's your headphones. I I think oh, is it fine now? Or, or no, no, no. You, I think it's your connection somewhere. There's, there's some connection issue. Yeah. Feedback. Having a lot of technical difficulties. Guys, yeah, we use the saying... background. Those who haven't switched on their cameras, uh, can you please switch it on and then? Well, the once we can hear you, yes, yes, we can yeah, hear yeah. you. Yes. So, how how was the show? Because I think I missed um, most of it. I was just listening on my way back, and the initial part of it, probably like a half an hour, and then um, was there a lot of yeah, interaction. We, we, We've only had one guest on so far, and um, yeah, before the guest, um, I mean, with with Antaranda, I mean, the, I mean how? Oh yeah, went quite well. Yeah, okay. yeah. quite good, and uh, we we kept it amicable. We kept it down to earth, rather than <laughs> Sister Swati didn't get much chance. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't get much chance, Brother Mansoor. I had so many things to ask. I was seeking so many answers and clarification, and by the time I came, it was time for him to go for his service at seven. So, you know, I, I just you could ask very time. simple two, three questions. That's it. That's I mean, if he's willing to come back again, I mean, I'm sure we can defer those questions uh, for next time, inshallah. Inshallah. Yes, indeed, inshallah. So, Brother Hashim, should we open up for yeah, uh, so Brother got, KK? Uh, yeah, bring KK in. Yeah. yeah, let's go. Hello, KK. How are you? You're, you're muted. Hi. There we go. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Uh, how are you? Thank you for picking. Ah, I'm fine. Okay. Um, where are you calling in from? Which continent? I'm from India. You're from India. And have you listened to the whole show? Or have you just joined no, us? Not entire show. Uh, you have. Okay. Uh, when Sham asked some question and Panditji couldn't answer. Uh, uh, which, that one, part. which one you think he didn't answer? Well, no, no, oh, before that, what, what, so, so what, what is your end. tradition, KK? So, KK, yeah, what is your I'm tradition Hindu. first? I'm Hindu. No, I, I, are you Hare Krishna? Oh, no, no, I, no. I'm Hindu. I believe in meditation, uh, Patanjali yoga meditation. Oh, okay. So, how does that how does that differ from Hare Krishna then? No, Hare Krishna, I guess uh, they follow uh, Bhagavad Gita. No, in Hinduism, there are very different ways, different people uh, follow differently. Even uh, someone newly, uh, he can start something also. It is very like open book, uh, like uh, there is nothing fixed to it. So it is like that. It's like, okay. uh, God creates uh, different things in a various diversity. So religion also like that, different, different kind of religion. All religions okay. are uh, like God's creation. Brother KK, so, is yours Advait is yours Advait that you are saying because you are saying you would rely more on meditation? Yeah, yeah. my concept of meditation is uh, we don't know as we come onto earth what we are. We have no idea. 
and we have ego due because our mind separates us from the uh, reality so as soon as uh, in patanjali yoga sutra there is one saying uh, uh, chitta vritti nirodaha that means as soon as your mind will become still you will perceive the reality and what is that reality as a, uh, as long as you are as a person man in flesh like as a, unless you realize that you don't know what is the reality you cannot explain it in words like there, there might be a ninth color you can never explain that in words or in any way that okay. you have to get some senses and experience it so you would totally That's rely on meditation you would rely yeah, on meditation to be able to reach to that uh, almighty yeah, yeah. so uh, would thank be you. would there be any scriptures that you would you know you would follow to be able to uh, practice the meditation other than patanjali yoga yeah. in terms of vedas upanishads or puranas Ah, uh, we have uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we have uh, um, something called uh, uh, sahas marga meditation uh, uh, so there uh, actually the teachers uh, from patanjali yoga sutra so uh, patanjali sutra uh, yoga sutra they will extract the message and tell us how to practically do it it's very simple you simply close your eyes and uh, Uh, let the uh, conscious drive you where it goes so without any pre notion you shouldn't assume something like uh, there is one god no god nothing you should you should be like you feel like uh, uh, you don't know anything so that way it will take you somewhere so uh, you, when you presume something uh, you will uh, circle in that only in that presumption only uh, like say if some people will uh, say we think everything has start in your through our eyes i see we see everything starts and ends so what we think is there is a god who will be there who has no start and end it is all presumption we don't know who is the god we have never seen no one knows so we have to avoid all those presumptions and let the conscious uh, take us where it is going okay that, that means that just to close point. the eyes and just let it go anywhere that it is going so don't you yeah, fear yeah. that maybe it could you know there could be there could be you may get astray or there may be some evil um, whatever spirit that may sort of try to deviate you from that path oh ah, yeah it is knowing no, no, knowing no. the god yeah as you go na it yeah uh, you won't have your identity like uh, uh, you won't have any thought you know, thought process it will simply go what ha uh, there is one more thing also uh, uh, whatever thoughts as you are thinking uh, if any thought is coming you have to ignore those thoughts so when it is like in a pond uh, uh, ripples are there only when those ripples are uh, settled you will see what is there in the bottom so anything uh, uh, we will what we are advised is any thought is coming just don't uh, pay attention to them but uh, i was ignore. just wondering brother that you know this could be very momentary for the time for till the time you are doing it that's the time that you are doing it where you're numbing numbing yourself totally but in your day to day practice for instance whatever rituals of the day that you are being following uh, going for work and things like that there you need your thoughts and you need your mind to be active and to be knowing how to work how to conduct yourself so you are saying that in this practice you just totally you know any thought that comes you just sort of uh, you know turn it aside so but you can't be in that numbness 24 hours a day so i was just thinking how does it uh, really help in the practical day to day routine of yours uh, this particular branch or whatever method of hinduism sanatan dharma so oh, it is uh, see uh, on, you know, we will we will be doing this for certain period of time like i will be doing it for one hour that's it in the early morning uh, that's it after that uh, i will be into my routine life it is uh, we are said like uh, uh, life is uh, life is like a bird of uh, bird with two wings one is spirituality another one is our society so yeah. we have to balance both but so how do you get that- your code of conduct in terms of your behavior the way in islam we have the five pillars we have we know what to do what is haram what is halal so how do you get that here uh, with just numbness and your mind and your thoughts being totally you know turned off 
through this meditation how do you get that guidance from where do you get it no actually all this guidance whatever we have to do this is actually taken care by uh, society let's say even though islam allows to marry for women but there are countries you cannot marry for women so there you cannot uh, do this similarly if i do if i go to saudi arabia i cannot do my, my, my pra- pra- practice my things so you have you see it is not that uh, there is a religion you will follow you are bound to do what majority are following okay it so you go by you go by the society your, and the sorry, culture okay. okay what did you say about saudi you know not to practice your religion really no no if you go to saudi arabia yeah. maybe a certain kind of uh, religious practice you can't do no you can according to the religion in your own home there's no problem at all i think there are, there, oh, are, no, no, no. Like there are no, no, no. thousands of hindus over there expatriates who work there you know in and a lot yeah, yeah. especially if you are from south yeah. india you should know you know there are lots of people from kerala who work in saudi and other gulf states yeah uh, in south india we do ganesh puja we do uh, yeah, like so we can play town but you can still practice your religion in your home So there is no ah, let's say we have radha yatra radha yatra we can't do in south uh, so uh, on the on the whole i'm saying and the radha yatra here in in the uk you know so he says at, at, at least there will be one kind of what mr swati was asking you is about the practicality of your day to day life now just meditation itself you know it's one of the spiritual aspects within all religions you know like in islam we have the five times prayer which is a sort of med- meditation that we focus only on god almighty within our prayers and not mm. about the outside world so this is this is not something that is unique to hinduism only now no, it is prayer, prayer, question, prayer, question, prayer question, and meditation are different about, listen just one second the question she was asking you is about your day to day life for example your morality your ethics where do you get this from just medicine he's right? saying uh, he's saying i think what he said was that he gets that from society whatever majority believes and follows yeah but in the uh, society you know yeah. let's say majority starts taking drugs then what yeah you start taking drugs as well yeah. no, i guess so. to, we, we learn from the uh, uh, past experiences and what our consciousness see uh, uh, I, i don't eat uh, non veg because Uh, killing an animal hurts me so uh, keeping wh- one i follow is what my consciousness tells me and, and another your, thing your consciousness is subjective so for example if oh, if yeah, in your that, that book, if in your scriptures mm-hmm. if ram and lakshman if they killed an animal like a deer and then not only ate the meat but also wore the skins of those animals then would you be okay see these things that's why i told you sir. at that time killing hunting was okay but now you can, we cannot hunt, why, we why cannot was being oh, vegetarian not okay that time no yeah, yeah why could ram and lakshman not survive on vegetables like you no actually uh, maybe uh, in some scripture you might have say uh, read uh, they might have eaten meat uh, i am telling you uh, I don't like killing animals and eating them. I, I told yeah. my parents. Are you are, are you saying that you understand the world better than Ram and Lakshman? No, no, Ram and Lakshman. Gods, you know, no. They are your gods, so they yeah. understand it better than you, isn't it? No, no, no okay. Ram and Lakshman. Uh, Ram and Lakshman understand better than me. Of so course, for me, so they, they, with, they, with, for with, them, uh, if it was okay to eat meat, then why are you saying that you have some? higher philosophy or principles no i can i am just telling so maybe ram and lakshman ate because they know something more that the reason they ate so, so I, it, that, is point, okay. that is a point mm-hmm. if ram and lakshman know something more and if they have said this in the scriptures that they did eat the meat of a deer and they killed it mm-hmm. after killing it mm-hmm. and then why would you oppose their principle by saying that my principles i have realized that my principles are better somehow maybe why uh, they at that time maybe that was right okay you know at that time yeah. what was different you know animals are animals today they have a life yes they want to survive they don't want to die obviously and today also is the same and back then also is the same the yeah, life of an animal problem. or of a human is always dear to them nobody wants to die okay specifically not being hunted by a human and being killed and then eaten 
okay if you what ask was different? that tell me what was different back then compared to today yeah i will tell you okay uh, first thing uh, if we we are really not asking dear whether can i eat you and uh, it is not that she is offering me yeah neither ah, did okay, ram he did not ask the deer either he just so, killed it and ate it yeah so uh, that is one thing and uh, you are saying ram killed deer and ate it so yeah. maybe ram ram is uh, god maybe, uh, maybe he can do something i'm not sure who's we god as per who's god as per you brother kk in the meditations that you have had done so far for all these days did it help you to uh, get the realization or revelation of who's the god who's that almighty no it is a very long process i am yet to reach there but uh, by doing meditation i have become a uh, better person by the way whenever i read any scripture be it quran or quran everything i can realize what is good in it what is not to be accepted in every brother re- brother, I, brother, mm. brother brother hashim mm. asked brother hashim asked you the same question uh, ram ram doesn't med- meditate that time lakshman doesn't meditate that time are you the only one who is meditating and getting closer to god and knowing much more, more than no, 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 no. it's more than just meditation yeah no no see with my i am i am not saying uh, see with what what knowledge i have uh, with that knowledge i am saying if ram killed deer means it's wrong be it anyone if someone is doing wrong means wrong but oh, the see, god is doing wrong. wrong that's what you're saying yeah that's that's something no, no, which no. is very risky no no, no, no you didn't you didn't hear me properly with my limited knowledge i am saying Yeah, yeah. Now that you have knowledge, look. If we show you the scripture, okay, where it, this is mentioned, then it won't be your limited knowledge anymore, right? Yeah. No. What is telling? No. No. Okay, uh, again, you what, what sometime context? back, sometime back, I told you also. I read different scriptures. In every scriptures, I found good things and bad things also. No, but uh, I on. don't have yeah, even if I, I, I read, I read no, no, I read the Quran completely. Many things I didn't like in Quran. Ma- see, allowing a man to marry four women that is very wrong. There is a wisdom brother, behind brother, it which brother, needs to be understood. Yeah, brother, <laughs> yeah, brother, I need to stop you here. Are you being a Sanatani? You are saying that you mm-hmm. haven't read your scriptures, and right now you are saying that you have completely read and uh, learned Quran. Exactly. <laughs> no, no, learn no here. Uh, so you- So, you said you have right married 16000 women yeah gopis are you saying he was also wrong so i am telling i am asking marrying 16000 ma- women it's not a practically possible but krishna is a god that. remember he's not he's not a human like you he's a god he, he's god, is, god, is, god has done means there must be something we, we don't know why he did it See, the first of all, I'm not about why. The question is, no, the question is, is was it morally right? That is the question. Hmm? If, if Krishna did it as a god, was it morally right? That's the question. Ah, uh, with my limited knowledge, I am saying it is morally wrong. But Krishna, my, his god, maybe he has but something else. But exactly, this else. meditation is not Krishna helping him. His knowledge is still limited. Have you realized that? It's the second time you have admitted that your god is wrong. No, no, no. See. you know, we don't any uh, first of all thing how you are believing uh, there is god uh, uh, first of all you are believing in quran means uh, uh, it came from muhammad means if there is one error also it cannot be a word of the god i agree uh, i am saying so there is 18 847 verse uh, if you read that verse uh, as per that verse earth is flat if if uh, no, no is, is the mountain earth will me, appear no in the plain. quran does he say that the earth is flat This is which which verse is this? Eighteen forty-seven. It says, "If Allah yeah. removes all the mountain, earth will appear plain, leveled, or flat." So it is. Yeah. It means author of the Quran doesn't have idea about the shape of that. No, no. Hold on. When something is a plain, that is hmm. flat. It doesn't mean flat like, you know, if, if you remove all oh, the oh, mountains. Oh, listen, oh. listen. If you remove oh. all the mountains from the earth, yes, oh. it's no more rough. You know. is going to become plain that's what it means no, no it is first of all earth earth uh, earth shape is not depending on mountain even whether there are mountains or not it, it is still the shape of the earth if, 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 allah says mountains are pegged if mountains are removed then there will be hole 
Uh, how it can be explained? KK, let, let, give me a second. Give me a second. So, KK. Um, He's just making up things, uh, you know? Uh, no, no, just let, let me say, I have to come in here. I have a couple of questions. So, first thing is, are you aware of um, tectonic plates in geology? No, no, all that I'm not saying. Simply 18 okay, no, points no, first. No, 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 KK, 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 KK. KK, okay, listen to me. Mountain. Listen to me, but I'm yeah. going to drop you. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I will drop K you. Okay, K K so listen, listen to me. To listen to me. Mm -hmm. Do you know yeah. what tectonic plates are in geology? Not completely, but yeah. No. Okay. Now, bit. now you are making an. Ac mountain. Let me finish. You are making an accusation about mountains being pegs. Have you explored what the geologists say? The mountains play when we have tectonic shifts under on the crust of the earth. Yeah, that have, you, is have how you looked into this? Play. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Play. No, have you what, looked into what this? What looked about it? Let's see. If, uh, if then, then I suggest. Mountains. Look, hmm. I'm being I'm okay, being so. being very very generous to you. I suggest okay. you do your scientific research before you pose a question like this, because this is a scientific fact right now. The mountains stabilize the tectonic plates to ensure that we do not have constant earthquakes around the world. Huh, but I'm, they, I'm, they, not, they, I'm not saying that now. Mountains are removed, earth yeah. will look plain. But if yeah, you remove no, 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 and one of the day when we will remove mountains and you will see the earth prominent and we will gather them and not leave behind from them any, anyone. So this is talking about the day of judgment, okay? When Allah says that, and warn them of the day, the day here is the day of judgment when we remove the mountains. So the mountains will be removed and then the earth will become prominent in that sense. Where does it say over here that the earth is flat? Based on your... Can uh, I show you where it says? You open carbonquran.com. There it says word to word meaning. There it says yeah. leveled or plain. So even if mountains are removed, there will be high and low areas and hills will be there. How can uh, earth will appear plain? And earth is spherical, irrespective of whether mountains... Where does it say the earth is flat here? That's an that's a accusation you made. Yes, Where exactly. over here... No, the accusation, it's simple. It's Clarify me that, Doug. Then explain me that. Explain, explain me. It's very simple. Look, when it talks about mountains, now you're looking at which translation are you looking at? Cars there are, dot... There are, yeah, and Quran dot Quran com, there are several translations. I'm looking at Sahih International. Which one are you looking at? No, no. Th there is a word-to-word -word translation. If you do different, see, if you see many translations, uh, prominent is one. In one, it will say leveled. In one, it will say plain. Like that. Okay. Brother Mansur, you want to come in here and explain to KK what the Surah, uh, Surah Al-Kahf 47 says? Sure, sure. Um, I think my audio is clear now. Yes, yeah? it is. Yes. So, KK, um, interesting observations you've made. I think there are a few things I think you need to really reconsider. When you look at the verse itself, it talks about that this is something that will happen to the earth later. So if you're now saying the Quran says the earth will become flat later, that may be an interpretation, but it doesn't say the earth is flat already, but this is a process that will happen later. Suppose that was your interpretation, right? Do you understand so far? Yeah, yeah. This is something that will happen in the future where mm -hmm. mountains will be removed and your understanding is at that point the earth will become flat. Does that mean the earth is flat already? Is my question to you. At that time when mountain will be removed, mm -hmm. what, yeah. what your Allah is saying is if mountains are removed, earth will appear flat. Let me help you there. Mm -hmm. So this is an event that will happen on about the earth in a future time, right? So yeah. in the future, the mountains are removed because mountains are removed. Now there's a leveling happening of the earth. Does that mean the earth is already flat now? No, it is very good. Good. So the Quran doesn't say the earth is flat. As it stands today, right? 
See, it is saying you will see earth flat. It well, is what I'm asking you, KK, what I'm asking you is before these mountains are removed, mm. like now, today, yeah. is the earth flat according to this no. verse? No. Good. So now no. we establish one thing. The Quran here does not talk about a flat earth. It's talking about a process that will happen about removing mountains. And as you remove the mountains, which has high elevations from the ground, a leveling is happening. Isn't that what you see? When you, when you remove the mountains, what you're left with? Level. Plain. Hills and low, low and down areas. No, no, no. The and mountains and hills and all elevated substance. Yeah. This is what you're talking about. Mountains will pass mm -hmm. away like clouds. Right? So this is how the earth structure will transform. In that transformation, it doesn't talk about the earth will become flat, as in a squared flat two-dimensional object. It talks about the surface of the earth will be level, yeah, plain, so, become plain. So now we establish no, one thing. It is not saying, KK, it is not saying uh, KK, surface sorry. of the earth. KK. It, it is not saying surface of the earth. It is saying earth will appear. You I mean, will see what? earth leveled. Please. KK, I appreciate yeah. your misunderstanding of this verse. We are trying to help you clear your misunderstanding. The word earth. I, KK, I will, uh, you yeah. are not allowing me to finish. This is like speaker's no. corner. Are you from there? No, no, no. Good, good. You're from India. So let, let's have some mm. understanding. I listened to you and I, I understood your question. I'm trying to clarify to you what your misunderstanding is. The word ard or earth in English doesn't mean in the Arabic language the globe itself. The word ard or earth that is there, it talks about the surface because the Quran uses one point when it talks about celestial bodies with the earth, then we can understand the shape of it. It talks about the whole earth. But when it talks about the earth itself and what's happening within it, mountains and rivers and all these things are happening, it talks about the surface of the earth because that's what it means in the Arabic language. So you can't just simply assume the word earth here means the whole planet. It refers to the plane of that planet, the surface of the planet. That is embedded within the Arabic language. Two things we established. The verse does not talk about the earth has been created flat and it's flat as it stands today after its transformation. It talks about, the second point, Something in the future time, there will be some transformation happening. There's many things. The stars, the, the earth, and many other things, many transformation. This is one of those things of that earth where the oceans will burst forth. You know, earthquakes and mountains, so many things. It, it's before the end times. It doesn't mean at the end times the earth will be flat. It means Mountains will disappear, leaving a simple plain surface. I don't think that is going to be very difficult for you to understand if you appreciate what the word Earth means here, as I've explained. And, no, and I also think you're, that... You're that adding, the, uh, you are adding Kuma, your interpretation. Uh, but, so there is not complete... Uh, uh, like there is no proper choice of word in the Quran. There are very limited. Unless you introduce your interpretation, uh, you are not have, able to... Uh, 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 I have not used any interpretation. I've just given you the meaning of the word as it appears in the Arabic language. So if you're not familiar with the text and its meanings, then it will be difficult for you to understand. And that's why it is important before you, you know, approach a text of any scripture or any book or any literature, you need to understand what it's trying to say within the context. The context is here very clearly. As you agreed with us, it will something be of the future event. So that doesn't help you in your first accusation, the Quran says the earth is flat. So, so as you now realize, this is not an error of signs that the Quran introduces a geographical concept of a planetary body like the earth, and it describes its geometric shape wrong. That's one point. Is there any other errors that you've come across in your understanding that you think is error that led you yeah. to somehow discredit or leave and, and, and leave Islam yeah, from even thinking? Yeah, there is 4.11 4 inheritance yeah. where, yeah. where it says yeah. Sun yeah. Will, okay. We have given you enough time Yeah, now. Maybe and we should take that only very quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Before yeah. that, before 4, you, 4. KK, brother, 
Thank you, brother. Before you leave, just a minute, just a minute. Brother, brother, Mm. just a minute. As you entered the stream, you said that uh, uh, brother Antranga did not answer my question. What was that question that he did address me? A question I didn't hear. Can you please tell me? I will try to answer. No, you said that Antaranga did not answer some of the Sam's questions. So which question was that he didn't answer? Ah, that question I couldn't hear. No, because, oh, uh, you couldn't uh, hear. Okay. So what yeah, is Sam, it? Sam, can you please answer that question? If he could not answer... I think that's what happens if, 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 does too much meditation. Because meditation is not helping him to get clarity of thought, be it of Quran or be it no, of no, what has to, been due asked. Due to signal. No, no, see. Due to some uh, disturbance, I couldn't hear that uh, uh, the question. See, yeah, yeah. I'm... That's I'm, perfectly fine. The question brother, was about... Just, yeah. this is it. The question was about the pastime between the Krishna and the gopis. Yeah. Uh, Krishna and gopis. Yeah. And the pastime of uh, Shiva Lila. and Mohini. Leela. Yeah. yeah. Did what are we learning from that? And, and the other question was about the commentary of Prabhupada where he mentions about the rape. The word rape. The women like to be to be to get raped. Uh, uh, so, question is what? So, why women like to be get raped? Is that the question? That's no, been the mentioned Prabhupada, there in the, the scriptures. Commentary, the comment, yeah, the... the commentary of Prabhupada says. Let me read once once for you. A man. I know you will be rejecting this. So, still. A man is always famous for his aggressive towards the beautiful women, and such aggression is sometimes considered rape. Although the rape is not legally allowed, it is fact that the women like a man who is very expert at rape. These are the words of Prabhupada. Do you agree with him? No, no, definitely not. Okay. All I right, know that you were rejected. I okay, think we have to let the, give chance to the other people. Mm-hmm. But if you've got questions on... Yeah, so- yeah. Can join our next stream. Mm-hmm. Have no, okay, I, I have one question if you allow me. No, we will save it for next. We'll be up, we'll be up, no, we'll no, no, no. I, I will just ask, ask the question and go. I, I just want to know yeah. why. why you can't, no, can't just ask no, why? Question is expected, you expected to respond to a question. You can't just hit and run yeah. like that. You can't just leave. But thank you for yeah, your time you and run. save your questions for the next. No, stream. my question is why Allah created this universe? Because there are so many people are suffering for all due to, let's say in Africa, uh, some uh, uh, kid is there uh, for no fault of his uh, him uh, due to his parents' poverty. He is suffering. Brother. So yeah, we got you, we got your question, brother. We got your question. Yeah. Thank you so much, brother. Yeah, all we right. heard your question. Mansoor, Mansoor, yeah. Mansoor do you want to answer that? I think, look, let's let's leave it for no, next time. Yeah, yeah, let's leave it for next time. People has been here a yeah. long time already. Maybe no, he can dwell on it. Already 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 told because I, I'm not already getting this question. answer. So, KKK, K, 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 the simple answer is Allah creates all of us, mankind and jinn, to worship him alone. That's it. That's the simple answer. There is a much longer answer we can give you, but our goal is to be grateful yeah, yeah. Maybe, and praise Allah. Yeah, yeah. Because he deserves to be praised. That's it. Maybe, maybe some other time I need a long answer yes, because sure. this is not convincing and is not justifying. Okay, still, uh, okay. Like okay. we can have a bigger discussion around this, but that's that's the short answer. No. It makes okay. Allah a criminal actually. Yeah, no, okay, yeah. look, okay. you can't you can't do it. Okay, okay, you're being disrespectful now. You can't do hit and run criticism like this no. and run away. This is very disrespectful. I think I'm sorry. It's... He drank. I think that's what meditation does. He did not know who God is. He just kept his mind blind. He said it will be numb and you'll just get the revelation. And then he said, when we asked, how do you have your day-to-day conduct? He said, whatever majority follows and does, that's how I go along. So yeah. that was so irrational and it, he was asking about yeah. these things. He do, the, he do the same thing on my stream as well. Oh, he is one of my old oh, friends on the yeah. yeah. Okay. One clarification. Sister Swati was absolutely right when she said that meditation is supposed to give you clarity of mind, and this is something that we uh, we experience as Muslims when we do our salah or when we do dhikr in in, in particular, which absolutely. both are form of medica- uh, meditations. Is something you get clarity of mind, and also of of the heart. Your heart is more in tune with your faith, your deen, and your purpose in life. So this is something which shouldn't be confusing. You know, your life shouldn't be confusing. So when you, are, when you experience difficulties in your life, you still have clarity of mind, and you will, you will take the right 
steps and you'll take the right decisions at those correct steps. and the major difference is because it's coming from the divine right from allah that instruction is there from there and the way in which he was meditating was just random you know just like numbing his mind closing his thoughts and just following the majority and the culture he still have not got who is god after so much of meditation and he said it's yeah, a long journey if a, guy, <laughs> if a guy says that the god is doing wrong that's it that's it. even as <laughs> a hindu that's yeah. it you're done you know? so so in reality in reality sister swati you know we have no idea what is going on inside the mind of somebody else right so so this idea of meditating to receive answers you know we have many cases of people who have personality disorders we yeah. these are medically medically documented we have cases of people who um hear voices and we found that they have right. medical conditions that cause this to happen so there are many many situations where this is actually simply misleading and in other cases probably destructive to oneself which is why you need an outside external supreme divine revelation absolute. as the absolute guidance because and then it means you you have a benchmark against which to say i'm thinking this but let me check with the actual source see if right. it's right He did not have any anchor, and probably he demonstrated that here because he was not able to understand simple, you know, ideas which he was referring from Quran. As Brother Mansoor explained him about mountain, about the polygamy that he was talking about. That's what happens when we do random meditation. We don't get any concept of God, conduct of life, nothing. Total chaos, which was very well demonstrated by the caller. Sure. Hello, Salaam, Brother Faisal. You need to unmute yourself. We still can't hear you, Brother Mansoor. Your mic is gone. Yeah, Faisal, just, you want to unmute sorry. yourself so you can. Okay, um, there we go. You're back. Before we bring in Faisal, I think we have clarification needed from the previous caller. We want to let him go. That's fine. Um, hit and run tactic doesn't help. I mean, if you had a question about why Allah created everyone and there are people who are suffering, uh, you know, they're not seem to be all equally equipped with the same kind of facilities and opportunities, and that seems to be some kind of discriminatory behavior from from God. And He said God is like a criminal or something like this. Yeah, what that's what He said. Now, that's what He said. Now, now, obviously, I mean, if you want an answer, then you don't drive yourself to a fast conclusion like this, or you know, then then why ask in the first place? Um, as Brother Muhammad answered already, the reasons why we are created, there's a purpose, and behind this purpose is wisdom of why Allah created. Allah would have could have created everyone with the same equal opportunities and facilities and faculties and reasonings and understanding, but He hasn't because there's a wisdom. Because one of the things is Allah has created us. Even as we speak now, we are speaking in English. There are many people that don't understand English at all. I mean, does that mean if God If God revealed Allah revealed something like an Arabic language, and we will be somehow discriminated against because we didn't know their Arabic language, people can come up with many questions like this. So one thing for sure, you see, the reasons why this gentleman asked this question is nothing to do with Allah. It's the question about this evil and suffering in the world. This is a question that he's been hearing from atheists. He's been hearing from, you know, a question that is often asked against theists. Just because they are suffering in the world, that means there is no good, benevolent, uh, benevolent God, merciful God, kind God around. That is supposed to somehow, you know, disprove the existence of God. I mean, this is how it's clothed and packaged. This question, and okay. the idea that you know God has created, Allah has created in in different kind of unequal opportunities means that He doesn't exist ultimately. I mean, this is what we need to be really, really careful about. The reasons why Allah created like this. is from his wisdom and he's created us everyone to our own level that we are capable of and we will not be burdened with a task that is beyond us so even if we were born blind even if we were born not able to speak and not able to hear we are able still to fulfill the purpose of our life and this is a test we are tested with health and we are tested with ill health So some people might think that people who are suffering, people who are you know lame, and some people who are you know somehow disabled, blind, and so on, they're the ones being tested. No, we can be tested with our health also. Many people who are healthy, they can go against 
God, become a rebel against God. They can totally reject God and totally, you know, stop themselves from worshiping God and become a disbeliever, for example, just because they're so much in, in their health and their wealth and their fame and so on and so forth. That is a test which they would have failed. So health and ill health both is a measure of test that Allah can place, but he does not burden us in anything that is greater than us. Uh, for us to bear. So this is one thing bear in mind. So the question about all the suffering it becomes redundant because if we were to ask the same question, had God, him, yeah. had God created no suffering whatsoever, I mean, how does that even solve the issues about God's existence, God being there or not? You know, this is an atheistic question that we ask often to the atheists and they say, oh, it doesn't prove that he will exist. If there was always good in the world, it would not automatically prove that God exists. Okay. Brother Muhammad. What I would add there, Brother Mansur, is that we call Jannah. And yeah. this existence is not Jannah. Exactly. So by by its very nature, paradise or Firdaus, you know, you know, one of the names that we have, is reserved for after you have passed the test. You don't get to enjoy the benefits of, of the results while you're doing the test. It's after the test. And so if it was perfect, it would not be a test. And don't forget the greatest tests were given to the people who were the prophets and messengers. Absolutely. So how can you say that we will not be tested? Even those right. people who just say that we believe, Allah says, do you think that you say that I believe that we, and you will not be tested? So this is something from Allah. Every trial and tribulation in this life is something that we all go through. It is how you respond to those trials and tribulation which makes you a person who is a believer or a disbeliever, someone who shows gratitude to God or someone who actually rejects God and turns away from him. So inshallah with this, I think uh, Brother Faisal seems to be ready now. Faisal, do you want to unmute yourself? Last chance. Oh, yes. Hello. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Okay. So actually, I don't have any question because I'm Muslim. Uh, I just came here to uh, just to salam to everyone. So uh, my uh, lovely salam to everyone and uh, especially for the same stolen brother. And I just want to say uh, two salam. to three lines. Yeah. Okay. I, I want to say two to three lines for the all the Muslim people watching here. Uh, I request you or a kind of request that you people, you, I mean, we, all the Muslim when you pray, you should pray for our same stolen brother, especially may Allah protect him because the place, the place he is living in, he has the high, high risk. His life is at very, very high risk, right? So please make dua for the, our same stolen brother. And uh, one more thing, one more thing I want to say is what the way we, Swati? she also lives in a high risk place. Which one? Sister Swati. Sister Swati, but uh, <laughs> yeah, same for her, same for her. Okay, what about but, the uh, that didn't come from heart, brother Faisal? It was what, just what, a what about the entire community? No, no, no. Brother. I mean, uh, 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 no, no. Actually, actually would, brother Faisal, listen, was, first and foremost, should, should, yeah. you know, it is. Yeah, yeah. actually, we, uh, you know, from, many, so many people one have one seen. Faisal, one second. It okay. is from the etiquette of Islam that when you come in a gathering, you do not say special salam for one particular person. This is not from the etiquette of Islam. Instead okay, okay. of creating salam, the whole idea of salam is to create peace. But when you do this, you create disharmony and division. So follow the sunnah okay, okay. of Salaam Salaam Salaam. Just say salam alaikum. So the people can then respond to you that salam be on you as well. When you say special salam for this, this is not from the sunnah. It causes okay, division. Okay. Secondly, when yeah, you make dua, okay, make dua. I mean, of course, we all make dua for Brother Sam, Sister Swati, and everybody else as well. Alhamdulillah. So this is very good. But, you know, this is when you come on a public forum, which is, mashallah, good to your, your um, uh, asking people to make dua for them. That is good. But again, when you have specifics like that, just because he lives in a high-risk place, yes, of course, you have to make dua for them. You know, we say we make dua for the people in Palestine, for the people uh, in India, for the people uh, elsewhere, you know. Alhamdulillah for that. So you can, those are okay. But from the sunnah, giving salam is for 
specific okay purpose. yeah yeah sure 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 yeah and uh, one more thing i want to add is yeah. like we muslim we have been watching the live stream for like 5 hours 4 hours the iman union team stream and islamic awakening stream and dawa wise stream and irpc stream so it means uh, what does it indicate it indicates that we have iman we have a strong iman uh, within ourselves so why not let's let's take our iman to one more step closer and i am asking i am urging and i am requesting all the muslims who i mean uh, it's just a request guys please if you watch things like movies music can you please boycott this i mean please stop watching movies and music why don't why shouldn't we come one step more closer to the allah please stop watching these right so these are the two messages that i wanted to uh, deliver to my muslim friends okay jazakallah khair brother keep us all in your thank you very much yeah. thank you okay assalamu alaikum welcome salam Who's next? I think the biggest test for me, you know, had been from the previous stream was first of all to not not be asking our guest who had come a lot of questions which I had in mind, and also like the brother who came, brother K K. You know, there were so many things which were not making sense at all, and with a lot of callers, it happens. But to be totally silent, to maintain the courtesy and decorum of the stream, not interject them, just listen to them, even if it is not making sense, allow them to speak. and then towards the end if you get a chance then say this was like a major you know i mean i had to really practice it a lot because when they yes, when they talk no, no sense how is in how <laughs> the first thing you under, you have to learn is a lot of sabr you know this is this is a thing that the prophets had practiced all their life you know can you imagine nuh alay salam doing this for 950 years yeah only getting a small portion of believers I, I just know. imagine that you know Not fifty years, nine hundred fifty years. But brother Hashim, imagine. I mean, totally, absolutely, hundred percent irrational. You know, yeah, argument, no. and yet to maintain that sabr to say, "All right, let it be, let it come." I mean, that's like the toughest part, not to say, yeah, not to catch that's it, that's fine. and just that's, to look, say. Look, so, <laughs> so one thing we do when, when so we so I do some other teaching, for example, and one of the things we we teach our students is. world views and perspectives and it's, it's a big topic and it takes quite a while to teach you but but one of the challenges with individuals that are born into a particular world view is they don't realize that there are alternatives and so they have they wear these glasses permanently and look at everything through those lenses and it is actually almost impossible for others to tell you by the way there's another way to look at things it's almost impossible it has to come from the inside which is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is why islam i mean we refer to dawa as a reminder yeah it is not about inserting the knowledge into people's head this is not the case yeah. you see allah has already given you the ability to understand and it just needs awakening it just needs to be told hey you're asleep this is the message recognize it and that awakening and that recognition is what dawa is all about Right. So it is not about forcing somebody to believe something because we don't do this in Islam. It is about awakening the fitra that we know Allah has given to every soul, and it is about then saying, "Has that fitra awakened?" And if there are layers and layers of cloudy misunderstanding, then it may take fifteen, twenty, may take a lifetime before it is uncovered. So therefore our goal is to make sure that we deliver the message as clearly and as succinctly and as sort of sort of with as much patience as possible and then we step back and we and we leave the rest to Allah Yeah. This is how we do. The things. only and thing is, brother Muhammad, that if it is a pure ignorance which is there, no, then it's very easy to keep that patience because you know that the other person genuinely is wanting to seek or understand. But what if when you are seeing that they are deliberately trying to, you know, the way they would not the best of the explanations given, and they would not they would totally discard, and by before going they will just pass, you know, comment like that, you know, just hit and run. So that is something which just you know, had it been pure ignorance or purely. 
somebody not knowing then there is no but when you see that manipulation happening no then that time to maintain that sabar that okay let it be even if they are just playing around fooling around still just let them speak like that and that's difficult yeah, for me so i'm practicing uh, it. No, 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 it 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 is i agree uh, yes yeah, so, right, i'm going to bring the next uh, it, it, it is next question yeah yeah so well, while you do that yeah. it is a natural response i think to become frustrated yeah. but this this is part of our self control that we need to do right mm-hmm. so so we we need to mm-hmm. help we need to grow ourselves as well so inshallah you know um may allah protect us all may allah give us all sabr to do the very best we can and at the I end mean, of the day the awakening is by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all we do is deliver the message hey rosilva you want um, to unmute yourself and uh, proceed with your question or comment rosilva are you there okay Brother Raw Silver, are you there? Can you have you left? Come back in cuz yeah, we'll have, we'll bring somebody else in and you'll have to come back in later, inshallah. Okay. Yeah. Right, we got uh, Ajay Rathor here. I think we saw him on Hello. Hi Ajay. Ajay, Ajay. Yes, Ajay was on uh, our previous fine. stream, I think. You came yeah. in. Hello again. How are you? Fine, thanks. How are you? You still haven't fixed your mic, have My you? <laughs> Yeah. my voice is coming no it's very very poor it's quality there's a lot of disturbance in your audio no and no there's a lot of disturbance in your audio ajay you need to fix your mic and then come back yeah unless you got no. a good question for us no we, we, is okay so carry on let's see if we can understand you okay i, I want to answer a question which swati asked Okay. Sorry That's brother, it's it's breaking up. There's a lot of jitter on the line. So it sounds like your broadband is probably not very probably weak or your mic connection is not very good. What is no. the question what which question you want to ask of Swati? Swati. Yes, she said that Krishna came in and said that he will come in every age to establish dharma. dharma. Okay. Yeah. And then she said then she said that when he came after that onward dharma is not still there. means kalyug came so how it's possible that was his he our question sorry sorry to interrupt you there ajay but the audio is terrible we you really have to fix it maybe write, write your question in, in the background just in the background just fix it and yeah. come back okay okay the question was very important and maybe he could fix yes, his mic yes, and then answer question. that's why i said no. uh, he has to come back right we got uh, mr joster Hello. 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 Actually, I'm a medical student, and uh, I have an interest. Means uh, I'm pursuing medical studies in Ayurveda. So in Ayurveda, it's both uh, modern plus Ayurvedic uh, medicine. Are you, so, are you calling from India? Where are you calling from? Yes, I'm ca- uh, calling from India. Okay. What is What is the meaning of Ayurveda? You want to explain that? Ayurveda means ayu which means uh, life and veda means knowledge so knowledge of life something around the lines of that okay. so oh, okay. i i i like to ask some questions like i want to keep some questions uh, even though i'm a muslim but i want to keep some questions because i have debated a lot of people and they have never answered this very questions so one of the question is in ayurveda there is uh, uh since ayurveda is from uh, there in uh, basically hindu scriptures are divided into rigveda atharveda and uh, similar and similar things so ayurveda is part of hindu scriptures and it's uh, it's since it's a part it should be 100% correct and it's a part of atharva veda so uh, there is a god goddess a god uh, named dhanvantri who has taught this uh, science to her disciples so her disciples uh basically uh gave us texts which are called as shlokas shlokas so in different shlokas there are uh, different meaning some or in some shlokas which are really violent and i want to ask this question that in uh, uh, some diseases like uh, which is related to you know uh, psychotic diseases uh, like seizures and etc if if we correlate it with ayurveda it's called as apashmara and different names so in such diseases there is a concept that if someone is disease, uh, suffering from disease, uh, this disease this particular disease it is because due to karma okay 
so let's have a hypothetical uh, argument let's say uh, it's not even a karma thing that is uh, astonishing but if someone is uh, suffering from this disease which is caused due to karma there are a lot of diseases which are caused due to karmas so one should not show empathy or sympathy towards the person who is suffering from the particular disease so let's say a 7 year old boy suffering from uh, lymphoma so it's really uh, it's really you know uh, it's ungodly type to you know uh, consider that kid as you know we should not show empathy towards him uh, because since it's uh, he is suffering from cancer it's because of his past deeds which he does not even have any recollection of like uh, at least we should know like uh, if i have done something wrong i should at least know so i can correct it in my present life or something like that but according to karma there uh, there is no recollection of that memory and he should suffer that disease and everyone should not show any sympathy towards him which is kind of a uh, which i wanted to ask uh, the previous guest and two more questions one question yeah, is hold that on, uh, hold on brother wait, wait, so okay okay sorry is with the to karma yeah Yes, karma. Okay, it's actually way, not a question. Way. It's actually, actually, brother Hashim. It's actually not a question. Observation. It's an observation. Yeah. It's an observation. Yeah. That this particular yeah. teaching is actually um, inconsistent with reality, because because we have treatments available to us generally, uh, you know, medical treatments available, but Ayurveda teaches something that is something don't do anything about it. and if it was from god this would not be true so this is the observation that he's making Absolutely. um so so one question mr joestar which is is this a, a a requirement of your medical education do you are you are, is it mandatory no actually actually what we do is we practice uh, both modern modern in the sense like erythromycin and all the stuffs like basically no, no, i understand was, uh, but, but is the Ayurveda, ayurvedic medicine is that a mandatory module or are you taking mm-hmm. it because it's interesting no actually uh, i was interested true. in medicine that's so true. in india there is a ranking system so uh, like it's it's a hierarchy basically so ayurveda is in second place so let's uh, uh, let's keep it aside but ayurveda is practiced only means like for uh, immuno uh, immunological purposes like for uh, boosting your immunity or controlling your immunity modulators means like uh, histamines different type of inflammation okay. causes so we can yeah, okay. decrease the inflammation okay 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 i understand okay so yes yeah, so yes i agree with you i think yes this is an evil practice um, there is no basis for it um, and i i would really love for any of the audience that are a hindu and follow that tradition to explain to us why karma is the explanation for a for a medical medical problem and and one more thing and one more thing that it should not be treated also it's not like we right, should treat right, 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 right. it but it should not also be treated so if a 7 year old boy who is basically innocent have no sins how can a 7 year old boy commit sin since is uh, not you know uh, so basically that and two three thing uh, two three things more like uh, there are god uh, there uh, hinduism can be divided into polytheism or either monotheism so if there is monotheism let's say the, it's hinduism is monotheism so there is one the uh, omnipresent which some say om vishnu we will not get into that debate but let's say om is the omnipresent okay so there uh, then uh, god and goddesses will be the uh, means uh, they they will be the part of that omnipresent one according to hinduism so like if let's say if a god marries a goddess isn't that kind of weird ma- like like uh, how can a god you know marry a goddess which is really weird if you think about it i don't want to go in further details but you can imagine the outcomes like they're having uh, an offspring which is yeah, we, kind of weird we get, we get the point so just uh, you know the first point you made about not treating someone who is afflicted with some disease or some mental health Uh, yes is this something written in the scriptures or is something you observed no no this is written in the scriptures uh, i said Lord, earlier that the yes the references are in charak samhita i will give you in the next because uh, i have to you know there is a lot of books i am in second uh, i am currently in second year so there is a lot of book i have to search in some so i read reason, it earlier the reason i'm asking you is because we we use the same principle yes yes use in islam you know if somebody makes a claim 
or an allegation, you know, like the guy who said flat earth. And then when he gave the reference to an ayah about the day of judgment, which has got nothing to do with the flat earth, it's, uh, it's that kind of thing. So maybe there is an explanation that the Hindus might give you. Which you I might... don't think so, Brother Hashim, there is, because in fact, uh, what uh, Brother Joestar is saying, in mm -hmm. fact, we the entire thing of, you know, uh, the rebirth, reincarnation that is dependent on this entire idea of uh, past uh, karmas how your future lives yeah? and not just that even the garun puran which is there which is supposedly the vaishnavs would follow that garun puran so the problem is that you know your future lives are dependent upon the past karmas however the garun puran you know there when you when you have that intermediate period when, when you're waiting for your rebirth then the dead people they are tortured by the yam the so-called yam deity on the basis of the past lives in the in the multiple realms which are there in garur puran 28 hells are being you know talked about there and the tortures the tor the kind of tortures which are there it 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 uh, you know entails from impalement or dismemberment or you know burning boiling everything so it doesn't make sense how you have on the one side you have your past karmas determining your future lives and then in between you have this intermediate hell also so which is there where you are being you know where you are being tortured and yeah. and not just that you know the and that's the reason why you know people warn the pundits the priest they warn that how your dead the, the dead family members they will be tortured for their past crimes in this in these 28 hells which are mentioned in garur puran and if you want to minimize that what you need to do is you need to give different kinds of donations to the priest and which is why then, you know, uh, giving those kind of offerings and donations to the priest who conduct the funeral becomes uh, very, very paramount then. Uh, so, so it, first of all, a lot of contradiction. And second of all, this kind of, um, you know, sort of exploitative You, you can actually mechanism. minimize your, your punishment by paying the temples. Yeah, especially the priest who does the funeral. You so pay something to get your, your punishment. Yeah. yeah. That's how it's been mentioned in so so too many contradictions. Like the first Catholic of all, to me. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Ajay, what do you think? What do you think of these? I don't know claims that the Muslims are. Yes, is my, is my voice coming? Yeah, it's your coming. your audio is still breaking yeah. up. Let's let's give you one more time. Okay. So, so I will answer that earlier question which Fatih asked. Okay. Yeah, you need to invest in some good microphone, man, next time. Something Brother, is somewhere. Uh, I think it's problem. Yeah. Brother, yeah, Ajay, you're not audible better. <laughs> the audio is terrible. No. Sorry, mate. Uh, I think, I'll tell you what. Come next time with your audio fix. And we'll let you have a go, okay? Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Let me bring Brother Ashir, I'm, here I'm really sorry to interrupt this because uh, it's late in my country. And, you know, I have to attend college and everything. Yes, so yes, yes. I want to make my point and I want to leave. Sorry yeah, yeah, for no. any problems. Okay, so uh, and two, three points more I want to make is uh, in Ayurvedic text, like there are different season, seasons like Grishma Rutu, Sharad Rutu. Sharad Rutu is, uh, can be uh, compared with winter season. So in winter season, I can give you evidences that uh, meat soup is prescribed. It is called as Mamsa Yusha. Mamsa meaning meat and yusha meaning soup. So meat soup is prescribed and in many places like in, uh, yes, uh, one topic, one point I really want to uh, uh, tell you guys is during uh, pregnancies, in pregnancy, if the pregnancy extend over nine months, so there is something called as, uh, uh, what we'll say, uh, sacrifice, what we'll say, bali, 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 uh, bali. We have to give sacrifice of an animal in order to preserve the child. So if let's say they are saying that, oh, their uh, Sanatan Dharma is very peaceful and all, then why does God need a sacrifice? Like, uh, why uh, why don't they uh, the God just ask for like uh, worship or something more hu uh, more human according to them? Okay, yeah, good point. Yeah, thank you. I think it'll be good next time if you have your references with you. Because yeah, okay. I, 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 I can give you references. Here, one principle that we expect yes. them to use. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Of course. Right, uh, can that. I mail you? Uh, yeah, you got our email bottom right corner. Okay. Our at gmail .com. okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right.
you know what i'm thinking is uh, this particular aspect which was there which he which he talked about in terms of uh, the karma theory uh, the entire world nashram is also built based on that uh, and and the entire idea of garud puran where they're mentioning about the hell so uh, as brother hashim had said about this the same thing which is present in christianity i think such a description of hell it is also found in buddhism it is also found in jainism and in fact probably it is somewhere revealing the influence of uh, you know the zoroastrian or the christian ideas which came to india through that through that northwest some i think some maybe whatever 2000 1800 years so 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 in you know in purely if we see the purely karmic metaphysical theology you don't need then any heaven or hell because it's based totally on your past deeds which will shape your future lives but here in hinduism in sanatan dharm you have the inclusion of heaven and hell also mixed into it and then you have certain authorities which are who are there to control the behavior and if you give them the offerings and the whatever you know the ones who do the funeral if you give them that they can reduce your punishment in that intermediate hell and heaven so this becomes absolutely i mean i don't know how could rationality explain this kind of a thing and i didn't ask this at all to our guests it's, it's one way of making money for the priest and the temples basically it's just yeah. it's a con basically that's what it sounds like because you can't bribe your way out of hell isn't it yeah con and plus those two contradictory theologies present into it karma also and hell and heaven also so yeah. i really wanted to ask this also but i thought maybe let let's keep it very decent and civil and well, very you simple have another hindu brother here maybe you can ask him indian you want to unmute yourself Hello there. Can you hear us? Indian? You need to speak up if you want to. We can't hear you at all, Indian. Okay. Let's bring somebody else in. Right. Liar Hunt is that his name? Hello. Hi there. How are you? I'm fine. Good. Where are you joining from? I'm joining from UP, India. From India. Okay. You have you been watching our stream or you, I don't know how Yeah, yeah I I have I have been watching your stream and I want to uh, say something. I want a conversation with you, but I am not very good in English, okay? Your English sounds pretty good. So, go ahead, yeah. so i was asking what is your problem with rss or hindutva or anything what is happening right now where shall we start as you wish <laughs> okay so you know this stream right now is to be honest we are not discussing any politics here so okay we are discussing the hindu religion so okay you, you can discuss, discuss Hinduism, you can you you can discuss that also okay so Swati had a question for you with regards to the link between karma and reincarnation. Uh, Swati, you want to ask? Uh, yeah, what should we I call think. You? What's your name? I don't want to call you liar. <laughs> okay. What do you want us to call you? Liar. Okay, if you wish. <laughs> Although we, I would like to say that we never had talked about RSS or anything. We were just talking about the theocracy. Exactly. so i am so not the, saying what you are talking today i have seen a video also, i have seen a video just ask him the question before deal in this yeah okay so brother liar um uh, yeah, since yeah. You, i yeah since you would be knowing about the sanatan dharm i would i i had this particular thing in my mind that basically excuse me excuse me excuse me basically i am an atheist okay and hindu okay. atheist okay oh a hindu that's atheist great. That's so you don't believe in god No, that's the most convenient one to be a Hindu and to be an atheist and to come on yeah. the stream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Basically, Which, Hindu is okay, not. Okay. Can you? First can of you all, first a, of all. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. I want to educate you one thing. When you put Hinduism into religion, okay. No, no, Sanatan Dharm. Basically... We are not talking about Hinduism. The Sanatan Dharm that it is. Sana. What do you know? What Dharma means? You please help us know that. Guide us. The deeds which are doable to do is known as dharma. And what are those deeds? Who decides that whether it's doable or not? 
who decides that according to your what is the dharma of a lion I don't know. Oh, yes. You enlighten us. A dharma, a dharma. Let's talk about human beings for now. We understand the question first. No, no one decides. decides that. Wait, wait. In in Hinduism, no one decides that. You you need to first listen to the question. In yeah. Hinduism, whether you're an atheist, you're a theist, yeah. whatever you are, in Hinduism, yeah. do, is it up to every person to decide that dharma, or is it something that is based on the scriptures? It's according to your own conscience. Okay. first of all hindu is first of all hindu is not a believer religion it's not a religion of believers it's not a religion of believers so what believers. do you see around in the temples so many people worshiping keeping fast i will come i will come on i will come on to that also okay see there are particularly two types of thoughts in hinduism what we call today as hinduism okay Where is first, the reference for what you are saying? Any scripture which is saying this, or just your own consciousness talking about these two things? My own of consciousness. Atheists don't follow any scriptures. They so do you. So you don't belong to then a particular religion, no? Then you are an no, atheist. No, no. I am a Hindu atheist. Where is it mentioned in any scripture that you can be in from Sanatan Dharm and also be there atheist? There is no compulsion. Where so, is it written? So, so the wait, wait a minute. Are But you I have said you, there is no compulsion. No, no, hold on. First of all, see. Wrong? First of all, see. You don't know the concept of the first of religion. What is a religion? But Do you know what is a religion? religion. You are discussing atheism. Yeah, I am. I so am. So make up your mind. Discussing first. religion only. Are you defending Hinduism as a religion, or you are not? No, okay, I am good. not. So now I am not defending. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now that we have got that clear. What is yeah. your understanding of the term Sanatan Dharma? Dharma means constitution. Constitution. No, no, no. You just said that following deeds. Dharma. You said yeah. doing certain deeds. No one says that. That is a con. When when you when you limited limit the dharma into a single book or anything else or a set of rules, then it became a religion. So are you telling me? That all these okay. Hindus that we spoke to. Wait a minute, liar! Are you telling me that all the Hindus that we spoke to so far, and when they said yeah. Sanatan Dharma is something yeah. which is like an eternal nature or duty that they have? Yes. Yeah. Are they all? Are they all telling lies except for the liar? Yeah. <laughs> basically, they basically they are not telling lies. Basically, they don't un understand that. So the liar understands the Hindu who practices yeah. religion don't understand. Wow. Yeah. Basically. Basically, irony. what I'm saying, okay. irony. Brother, how can how can we how can we believe that a liar is talk, talking truth? How can we believe in this? You you can believe in that because there is no prophet let or me. there Hinduism not is an organized okay. religion. Let me ask you a simple no problem. Let me ask you one. Let me Every, ask you one simple question, brother. Everybody can have first of all, see, brother. Hinduism not an organized organized religion. Okay, everyone can have their own opinion on that. Okay, so it's not a religion. Then it's a philosophy. No, it's, a, it's not a religion. It is a philosophy. It is a philosophy. Okay, that's what I'm saying. So Sam, that's what I'm saying. Do you want to hear the question, Sam? You want to repeat the question for him? But Sam. I don't think RSS yeah. is. Uh, is yeah, is we we came him. with RSS etc. Sister. That was not a philosophy. Sister, that's okay. a religion. Yeah, it's okay. Let's first of all, I am not saying that RSS Lying. don't follow a religion. Hinduism becomes a religion. It is not a religion, but it becomes a religion. So according to you, it is at not some a at some time at at a time when they have to face as a community from other side, like Islam used to kill people in India when they came here in India. They used to kill people. Doesn't make any First sense, brother. You, you're one of those guys But, who, likes, who likes the politics and likes yeah. just much slinging. First of all, it not it not about oh, politics. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. The billions See. of Hindus who who actually worship gods are they wrong? According to you? Yeah. Is it based yeah. on philosophy? Yeah. Wait, so yeah. Let me answer the question. Yeah. So What they are wrong. You're right. First of all, every... first of all, answer the question. Are those billions yeah. of Hindus? Who worship yeah. gods and goddesses? Are they wrong? Yeah. Good. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs> If he doesn't have respect for his own religion, I doubt he'll have any respect. And a guy who calls himself a liar, he belongs in the bin. 
Absolutely. I I don't want to waste my time with him to be honest with you. Right. So have we got any other you guys need to please verify your with your camera on. Uh those who I'm going to bring um Feroz I'm going to bring you in next if you want to keep your camera on is up to you or you can switch it off before I bring you on live. Okay, good. Assalamu alaikum dear brothers. Welcome to my audible. Yes. So <clears throat> so um I see the topic was um, demystifying the hinduism so i was just trying to um think of a society where everyone tries to be the most pious of their religious uh, of their religion rather i would say so let's say like if i take of christianity so correct me if i'm wrong because i'm not much aware of uh, of christianity or um hinduism okay so uh, next if everyone wants to try to be a pope so can we have a balanced society no we are not because the fundamental thing what the most pious people would be like what i observe is they are unmarried so over a period of time there will be any human beings okay so the same thing if i see with hinduism so the most pious people or let's say like the shankaracharyas so i would see like uh you correct me if i'm wrong uh, maybe swati she might be aware so even they are unmarried so due to maybe various reasons as per according to the scriptures so even their society can't exist even for 100 years okay because i leave let's if we take like the, the span of it a uh, life span of a human being is 100 years so they can't exist so whereas if you take islam so it teaches like to marry the and then you do a business so if i take the on the other hand like the the uh, the way how we earn the we livelihood so the most wise people they have to be the, uh, the teaching the religious scriptures only right on the other hand the islam teaches i mean it's it's a way of life it's not just say like you be a priest and that's it your job is being a, a pious person so the, my whole point is like if everyone wants to try to be a, the most pious person let's say like the other person i don't want to insult any religion let's say like the sri krishna i don't know if they marry or not if everyone married, becomes had, like uh, yeah he had more than 60, 16000 wives brother in fact that's very mm, good observation uh, that you had made that mm-hmm. he had 16000 no, uh, wives and no no that, 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 yeah. that's the uh, that's a bhagavad gita thing i'm saying yeah. the 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 priest whatever i'm saying today if we look if i look at the priest they okay, were ascetic at, they were yeah. the ones who came so, who were, he was a ascetic yeah uh-huh, so if 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 uh, if a hindu wants to be like him or let's say like uh, if all the human beings want to be like him so can you assume the human race to exist we can't right so but on the yeah. other hand islam yeah. says like yeah you marry and i mean i mean and and it says like uh, it, it it can't just uh, uh restrict you to be a priest it says like you do business i mean you do farming you do every damn thing which is halal right on the other hand if i look at the, i mean this is my observation so i see like um, they they are very adamant or they are very i mean uh, focused only to uh, teach or on the priesting kind of uh, a profession Yeah. So uh, Although yeah. I would say uh, I would say brother Feroz I mean I also had that same observation which you had made which was very correct that you know when he especially with Krishna because uh, you know his their own lord had had ha- have had more than 16000 wives and the and the devotee f- of, of Hare Krishna they are following the ascetic life so but but I would say that not all in the sanatan term the ones who are priests they are not all um, uh, ascetics they have their families and they do get married also the only thing is that uh, yeah the contradiction which you can see here uh, that's quite uh, apparent but it's not a general a blanket kind of a phenomena where nobody does marry it's not it's not like that the priest doesn't marry the way it, it may be there with nuns etc mm-hmm. there are so, priests who have how, married, how, yeah. how, and, and how about the livelihood i mean how do they earn money for their uh, livelihood 
the that they get from the temple you know in terms of uh, no, no, the th- offerings that, that is fine no my my point is let's assume a society where everyone tries to be like the most pious person of their religion can society exist of will human not. race sustain this Which is, is my whole point yeah, yeah this true. is my my question can society can human race sustain if everyone tries to be like the most pious person of their religion but you know they would say this that uh, empirically you don't see everybody following the ascetic lifestyle and they'll give you then varnashram system where they'll say we have brahmacharya grihast uh, vanvas and sanyas so they'll say we are we are never saying that you don't indulge into household realm or you don't get married that's the kind of you know argument which comes from sanatan dharm to the que- the observation which you have raised they'll say that you can have and lead a pious life even with grihastha ashram which is the household realm and you just need to follow dharma and keep an eye on moksha which is salvation so that's the kind of you know i think that that's what he would say to your observation okay i hope mm-hmm. that answers your question brother feroz uh, yeah. thank you for yeah. coming thank to us spring jazakallah khairan okay. okay. of course the very idea of what is dharma and what is moksha that becomes totally abstract you know so that's the that's the problem all right salam alaikum shaykh omar right. Yes. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we yes, can. Yes. Mashallah. I'm really happy to talk with brother Sam and sister Swati for the first time in my life. Alhamdulillah. Where are you joining from? Jazakallah khairan. Yeah, I am following brother Sam and sister Swati. I am listening to them since many months now. Um I am an imam here and a lecturer and a speaker in Guyana, South America. and alhamdulillah 11 of hindus and christians mix alhamdulillah they have embraced islam after listening to my talks i usually alhamdulillah deliver khutbas and talks listening brother sam sister swati so they are benefiting the people alhamdulillah here so all praise goes to these two all praise all goes to allah. allah yeah praise be to allah man lam yashkur an nas la yashkur illah yes You have to obviously do sugar, but all praise always goes to Allah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Some praises may go to Sam and others, but all praises go to Allah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was just uh, specifying on this topic. Okay, mashallah. We, I think you probably are you. You said you're joining from Guyana, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm from Guyana. You know. What um, What percentage of Muslims are in Guyana? Um. Now, um, it's it's reaching um thirty five percent. Okay, that's pretty good for a Caribbean island. Yes. Yes. Um okay. my question today is that I want to um move to advanced level of this thing now. Um I want bro- sister Sawati and brother Sam Stallone to suggest me some books to read uh, in Hindu Hinduism, Sanatan Dharm and these type of um areas in these religions so I can get more knowledge and get the references. Okay. Sure, brother. Brother, there are many separate books you you need to read. It's not like uh, uh, all in one you will get one book. Uh, mm-hmm. There are separate books. The main book, the main book is uh, uh, Vedas. Then comes mm-hmm. Upanishad. The mm-hmm. people who believe uh, uh, mostly are are in Ramayana, Bhagavad Gita, Shrimad Bhagavatam, and Manusmriti, mm-hmm. and few Puranas. So these mm-hmm. are the main books which people believes on. Okay, I have wrote only two for now: uh, Vedas and Upanishad. and what are the two others okay. ramayana valmiki ramayana okay ramayana bhagavad gita bhagavad gita shrimad bhagavatam okay manusmriti manusmriti and few other puranas and mahabharata as well but they deny the mahabharata no? No they no, they do accept it yeah. because it's a they part of bhagavad gita. Yeah. Oh, okay. This one will be accepted in uh, in their references, right? Yeah. Right. It's part of itihas and puranas. Okay, 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 okay. Thanks for uh, your precious time um and Barakum the suggestion. Barakumullah. I will like to join you often now inshallah taala. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. Inshallah. Assalamu okay. alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Right, so we got. That's so brave of the brother to be reading all these texts, which makes no sense at all, and filled with lot of contradictions. 
Mm-hmm. I think he wants to give dawa to the Hindus. So yeah. That's the reason. Yeah. So he mentioned references. It's, so this is a good way of doing it, isn't it? You provide them the references. You don't, you don't just make claims and say this is... Yeah. You know, right. You show them the references, which is, mashallah, what uh, Brother Sam and I think Sister Swati, you guys have been doing. And alhamdulillah, you know, may Allah accept from all of us. But this is um, quite, as you can see, your, your efforts are, mashallah, reaching all the way to South America, you know, which you, I've never met this brother, I've never known him. Yeah, you know? I had you no clue what, at uh, all of this. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what uh, benefit you're, you're, you're basically giving to the ummah, mashallah, with your da'wah, and this is exactly uh, what we as Muslims should be doing, you know, helping each other uh, so that we proclaim the praise of Allah and give the, call people, give da'wah to, for them to be invited to Islam, inshallah. <laughs> Right, so Manzoor Alam, you need to unmute yourself and state your question, please. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, can you hear me? Wa alaikum assalam. Where are you joining from, Manzoor? Hi. I can barely hear you, you need to speak up. Uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous, so I'm like speaking very high in the low sound. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. We can. Yeah, it's fine, it's fine. Carry on speaking, so it's okay. From- so uh, thank you, thank you for joining uh, joining me. Actually, I see you from like I watch your videos from last one and two years, I guess, uh, on Hyde Park. So I learned a lot of things. Okay. So what is like I have one one observation which I can share with you, which can like there is a one like I what I used to uh, tell to my friends to establish the point there must be a creator. Without the creation uh, creator, we cannot define the creation. Okay. So uh, and I see the many uh, atheists uh, in the Hyde Park. They like they don't want to like establish uh, understand the point that there uh, that this nothing uh, anything cannot come from nothing point, right? Zero plus zero is always zero. Uh, but there seems to be like they don't, un- don't they do not understand this point. So I have another observation where I can like put in another simple way that establish that point there must be a creator. Okay. Can I can I tell it if you allow? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so if you see like any uh, every uh, chemical reaction like there is a, one is a reactant and one is a product so in chemical reaction like na plus cl nacl you will get always uh, like 5 gram uh, 10 grams of reactant is there then you will get only 10, 10 grams of uh, product so mass is always conserved so if you see if you see uh, the uh, human body like it's a chain of re- uh, chemical reactions okay you get something from the uh, uh, atmosphere uh, you, uh, you chemical process is done. You get some uh, um, body mass and you uh, give it to uh, nature. And when you die, you give all all of these things. So and you, the nature also in the nature, this chain of reaction is going on. Okay. So we can, uh, but mass is always conserved. So we can say that uh, uh, today, what is the mass of Earth is now? Hundred uh, days ago, the mass was same. To hundred years uh, also back, the mass was same. Okay. So that means this all this chain reaction is happening by electron and the mass is for proton and neutron. But in the basic theory of electron and proton is that you cannot create it and you cannot destroy it, right? But it exists. So my point is how it can exist, uh, how electron and proton exist when you cannot create it. So there must be a creator, right? Sure. Are you getting my point? Yeah. Yes. I thought this was a chem, I didn't know this was a chemistry lesson. <laughs> but but I, like, I understand there's concept. another way to put it yeah, yeah. So this is and good for atheists yeah. where energy can neither be created nor destroyed um, it's in a, in a closed environment so this is quite important to yeah, in a, mention okay. yeah. and, and if we include this um, M equals James uh, um, like energy equals James square equals James square if we put like to create uh, uh, one gram of uh, electro- energy uh, pro- uh, mass from uh, source of energy only, so it takes a huge amount of energy. So if you if if you see this theory, like if you uh, incorporate this uh, uh, like uh, equation, so how powerful the creator will be who created this whole universe whose mass is huge, like humongous. So the the creator must be so much powerful, which which is beyond our imagination, right? If we include this equation in this point. Uh, where are you calling from, Manzoor? I'm from India. Okay, that's good. It must be quite late there. So thank you for joining us. And yeah. Jazakallah. Yeah. Okay, salam. Right, so there are some people waiting in the background. None of you have 
switched on your camera uh, camera to verify so we can't bring you on the on that the was a good point that. brother hashim which he had made in terms of you know but that's good for atheists to you know be able to get but what our guest for example would have said that yeah we do believe in the creator the only questionable aspect was that uh, the creator itself is getting cursed indulging in deception is get is dying you know things like those which of course would have esoteric answers you know the way he would say those are metaphors and deep meanings are associated which never gets revealed that's the problem the way sam was also asking him about giving the incidences from the references but or uh, what i could make out or what i observed was every time every time it was just said that these are very deep esoteric meanings which are associated and you know mortal minds or you know mundane mm -hmm. level of understanding cannot grasp it but the thing is if we can't grasp it then how do we practice it so that yeah, was the these problem. are just uh, the, these are just I think excuses for them so that they avoid uh, explaining it and giving us some rational understanding yeah you know when you say esoteric at least there must be a fraction of those people who can understand it you know so ask them and then explain exactly. it to us exactly. just saying esoteric doesn't mean that uh, you're not you, you don't have to explain it correct the whole purpose of any revelation of any scriptures is so that the people will understand the message if the message is such that the people will not even understand not even comprehend then i think it it's a moot point for that scripture to even mention such a thing in the scriptures isn't it mm -hmm. Because you're confusing them more by making this esoteric statements. Uh, if there was some real meaning to it, or like Brother Sam asked uh, the, the, the guest that we had, what is the uh, teaching from this? What is the morals that we learn from this? Because everything, whether esoteric or not, there must be some purpose behind it. Uh, God mentioning it in the scripture in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. And there was no moral that was coming out from that. Yeah, no so guys, uh, waiting in the background, those who have switched on the camera, please do so for verification before we bring you on the panel. Uh, Brother Muhammad Omar, if you want to keep your camera on, you can, it's up to you, but you can switch it off because we're going to bring you on next. Right. You had been so lenient with him. I mean, there were so many questions which were there and, and he didn't get to like answer any of that. <laughs> yes, yeah, Swati, we want them to come back. <laughs> yeah. That's why I think even right. Sam was. Salam alaykum. Alaykum. You're very not very audible, uh, Brother Muhammad. You have to speak up oh, or okay. increase your mic gain. Okay, can you hear me now? Still very faint. Okay, is it okay? Now, is it okay? You're still barely uh, audible. Muslim or non-Muslim, we have the same rule for those waiting in the background. You all have to verify your with your camera on and then switch it off before you come live. Okay. So, Brother Muhammad Umar Farooq, um, you need to fix your mic to okay, make... Let me, let me do it for him. Um, okay. Who is unmuted? Him? Okay, we need to unmute. You need to unmute yourself, Muhammad. Okay, wait, let okay, me just... can you hear me now? Yeah, just one sec. I'll just increase yeah, a little bit better. Okay, go ahead, yeah. Okay. Uh, so my question to Brother Sam Stallone and Sister Swati would be, I mean, uh, I have been following your streams for a while now on Dawa Wise. I don't know if you have your own separate channels where you come online and stuff. So my... We uh, do basic have. Question, okay. Uh, it will be better if you can, I mean share your links maybe in the description or somewhere sure. so my basic question is uh do you can you recommend any book that we can read to know the flaws that are there in hinduism and uh so that it can be helpful for us to do dawa with the uh hindus i mean a while ago a brother asked about questions like uh, i mean about books but uh brother stallone just referred to him their own I mean, books, their holy books like Rama and Bhagavad Gita and others. I mean, I uh, think, if brother, if you stick to, you know, the way Sam had given, because if you stick to the primary references, no, that will be better rather than reading the secondary sources, because then they'll say this is an interpretation. We want it from the original text. 
so it, that's why it's always better that we stick to the original one of course there are of course varied versions within that also for example ramayan would have but the ones which have been which is read and which is accepted by majority for in, for example those could be for dava purposes i think if you directly give the reference from there that will be more beneficial than reading an interpretation from a secondary source no i understand what you are saying about the uh, primary source but i'm talking about like uh, i i mean do you do you want me to reinvent in reinvent the wheel again i mean uh, is there any research no. done on this topic already that is what i am asking i can refer back to the primary sources once i have the secondary sources like uh, if any muslim has okay. any good book on the topic or not you want to you want to know the flaws a book which contains only the flaws of hinduism so there no, is I no mean, such book no. made brother till now yeah okay maybe sam okay. can write one yeah <laughs> right it's not the right one you yeah. yeah i think uh, i think in that case maybe sister swati and sam stellon can do that work because i mean in the dawa scene uh, not much the uh, materials are available on hindu language like we have on christianity Yes, so, uh, maybe Inshallah, not in Inshallah, English, Inshallah. Uh, is probably available Inshallah. in other languages. So, uh, let me provide a, a, one additional sort of um, guidance, I suppose, Brother Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. Um, you see, when we're approaching Dawah in this case, where where you approach them with the with the intention of finding flaws, it's actually a faulty approach because what they will immediately say is, "Where's my references?" Or, or they will say, okay, well, I don't agree with this, and then you're stuck. But right? then, then you have nowhere to go to, which is why we need to. Which is why we say to our interlocutors, have you studied the Quran? Have you studied the Hadith? If you yeah. haven't, then don't, then don't just take verses out of context and throw them at me, because it's meaningless. So in return, we should give them the same respect, because this is what we are asked to do. Which is we are asked to argue with them with the very best of of manner and akhlaq. An intention, so we study their their books. Now, there is a there is a there is sort of several layers that we can do for Dawa. The highest level, or, or let's say, sorry, the most peripheral outside level, is we approach the symptoms, or you know, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. This is a this is a very interesting comparative approach, but it assumes that you understand their worldview. And if they have a different worldview to you, then they will instantly say, well, I don't believe in that. So, for instance, in Hinduism, as we've seen on today's program, there are, there are sorry, Sanatan Dharma followers or the Sanatan Dharma uh, devotees, theistic, pantheists. They all exist within the worldview of Sanatan Dharma. And if you don't understand this, then you cannot simply say you're wrong, which is why if you if you recognize amongst all the programs that we ask, the very first question is, please state your position. Well, what are you? Now, there's a second, there's a level, sort of a deeper level that you can go to, which is to say, okay, we can take a theological approach, which is what actually Islam teaches us, which is we go to Tawheed. And we say, okay, we believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here's how we validate and and recognize this oneness, and we have argumentation, and and um, uh, many many scholars have written on this. How we get to it, and if you start with this crux, which is who is God, how do we know what who God is, and how do we know that what we have in our hands is the truth, i.e., revelation? Then you can have a different kind of discussion without necessarily having to read all of the texts. Yeah, and this is actually probably an easier approach. And there is a there is actually a more deeper level than this, which you can take what we call a theo philosophical approach, which is you go down to the absolute crux of the issue, and you discuss things like what is the nature of existence, what is the nature of truth, what is the nature of ethics, where do they come from, how do we know, know something is true? Is it true because it by its essence is true, or is it true because we decide it's true, or or is this? And this is now a deeply philosophical discussion you can have. So at each of those levels, we can do dawah, but it depends on the interlocutor. If the other person on the other side comes at you with a theophilosophical perspective and you are taking it from the peripheral 
do's and don'ts, halal and haram, then you will just miss each other completely and it will not work. So this is why we need to understand, first of all, all three of those levels, at least to some level, some, some basic understanding, and then we lift them up or we bring them out into the level that is most comfortable for you and them to, to, to talk. And otherwise you'll just spend two hours talking to each other and nobody yeah. will agree with anything. Very true, mashallah. And right. maybe, the, and maybe he, maybe then you know, probably not go, getting into the text, having a very staunch and uh, you know, very uh, sort of solid base of of uh, Islam, and maybe just getting a very cursory idea of the various sects which are present within Hinduism. Yes. For you to then yes. be knowing whom to ask and uh, you know address what, because it's such a diverse and vast thing. The way you see even atheist Hindus come, then you have the Advait ones coming, then you have the Hare Krishna coming. So just to have a fair idea of what are the different sects which are present within that, so that you could address accordingly to the person. Exactly. That may help. So, yeah, so Brother Muhammad Umar Farooq, how was that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with uh, whatever you have suggested. I have no problem at all, but I think uh, something has been lost in translation, maybe. Uh, but now my question is uh, what uh, Sister Swati has suggested. So my question is basically, where do I get to start as a person? This, I mean, this is what she said. As a Muslim, so, yeah. As, so, as a so, Muslim, sorry. Where do I start we, from? I mean, do we have any resources? <laughs> yes, that, we do. Uh, we, we do. I mean, we do. Actually. Uh, we do. Yeah. So what was lost in translation, first of all? Can you just explain that piece? Okay, my question is like when we uh, start with maybe Islam and Christianity, for example, we have the books of Sheikh Ahmed Didat as a starter. Then we can go through his books, learn, get the basics, and then we can do our own research, read the Bible, uh, A to Z, and other books, maybe uh, the books of uh, the Christian scholars, you know, X, Y, Z. That is what I wanted to know. Like, where do we start to study Hinduism. I mean, are you suggesting me uh, who doesn't know anything about Hinduism just to start reading the Vedas or the Ramayana or Bhagavad Gita? I mean, Maybe I'm not damn Vedas because I'm... Vedas are as it is very, you know, they'll not make much sense because it's a lot of uh, hymns, mantras, etc. Uh, uh, Upanishads would become too philosophical for you. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, Gita would be probably that way is very elementary compared to them or Ramayan for that matter or Manusmriti. These are very, these are very, uh, you know, compared to the Upanishads and Vedas, these would be very preliminary and very elementary to just, you know, glance through it to be able to have just a basic idea of it. And I think why Sam wants watch, to add something. Brother Muhammad, why don't you watch the streams of Brother Sam and Swati, you know, when they are, and then make notes, you know, if they give any references, uh, wouldn't that be a good thing? Yeah, that would be a very good thing, but that will be reinventing the wheel. That is what I'm saying. I mean, it's not reinventing doesn't, sister, wheel. No, it's not. doesn't Sister Swati have her own research? Doesn't Brother Stallone have his research? Yeah, they, maybe they, they can publish their works. Maybe they can publish it yeah, in Allah, future they, in yeah. a book form, or maybe they can publish it in on websites. Like we have websites, like, you know, since ages. Like, so uh, I think there is, uh, there's a website, isn't it, Brother Sam? What is it called? Yes. Uh, with, with. Uh, Wait, Kabhel. Yeah, that's a good website to start. Okay, that's in Hindi. Or maybe, no, yeah, it's in English. Uh, it's in English. Or you okay. can, or, or you can refer to my Instagram page. You will get a lot of uh, insight of uh, Hinduism. Oh, yeah. My Instagram page is uh, Sam underscore Stellon one. Okay, inshallah, I will do that. Yeah, yes, that's a good place is. to start. Thank you. <clears throat> right. So what's next? Uh, okay, thank you for the questions. Inshallah, see you next time. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, well, alaikum salam. Salam. Right, we got uh, Wiska. You want to switch off your camera before we bring you on? Okay, good. Switch That's off, please. <laughs> he switched it off and then he switched it on again. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right. Sorry, Wiska. Um, hello, how are you? Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes. yes yeah, I'm from, uh, my name is Heather and uh, I'm from Kolkata, India. Okay, good. Um, so you, so you're Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, oh, I understand. Right, you got um, a question for us? Um, yeah, sort of, basically. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Ustad Hashim and Ustad Mansur. Um, I watch a lot of your videos and I learn a lot from those videos. Uh, basically, the place where I'm living in, uh, we are um, surrounded with uh, lots of Shiism. And uh, 
like some people uh, who do grave worshiping so we do work on them um, we uh, so the problem uh, we are facing is that like uh, when they talk on history we can deal with it but when they say that uh, when they are going to uh, majalis or when they are going to um, some graves the connection they are feeling the contentment the sakina uh, it is irreplaceable so uh, how do how to deal with that sorry did you just say that they are saying they are trying to justify by saying that if we go to these places they feel tranquility yeah exactly like when they are going to some majalis or when uh, they are doing some uh, you know if, I, if a hindu tells me that if i pray to krishna it gives me tranquility so what is that justification uh no it's not it's not justification uh, but how to tackle that how to answer no, that we don't go based on our desires we don't go based on our own whims and desires because this is what the quran warns us against you know human nature is such that we feel good things which are contradictory to what allah has permitted now who understands the deen better is it allah and his rasul or is it the people who come afterwards you know so if yeah. the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam never told his ashaba radiyallahu anhum or his wife or his um, or the ahl al-bayt or anyone you know to go to the graves and you know pray to them or ask them for things then who are we to judge you know yeah, why would they, this is... why would they do things which the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never mention in the quran or in the hadith yeah basically uh, this is the point what uh, i try to uh, end up with but the thing that they are uh, pretty much stagnant is the connection that we are feeling the contentment that we are feeling in our heart um it, it yeah, somehow tells them that it's one standing isn't it you can feel like yeah. i said look if you ask a drug addict are you feeling good when mm. you take your drugs and he says yes mm. i'm like in heaven mm. <laughs> what is that true it doesn't prove anything it's just your own subjective feeling and understanding which is emotional uh, that was that was a nice point <laughs> i must use it well, yeah. what i would add as well um, brother is this is now getting very close to um, shirk in many cases right yeah and we have yeah. to there's a there, you know if you know for instance <laughs> we can go to a grave to pay respects to people that have passed away perfectly fine in islam you can you can do that but the moment mm. you start sitting there and expecting baraka or expecting any kind of goodness to come because you are doing it at a grave mm. and this is rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam warned us against this you've attend, you've essentially made that grave a masjid and Rasulullah mm. sallallahu alaihi wasallam warned us against this this is one of the reasons that we are not allowed to bow or pray in 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 anywhere where there are graves right yeah. so it's a very slippery slope and we don't know what is in the heart of the person that's telling you he's getting sakina or she is getting sakina right yeah because because and this this is the problem so what and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam warned us he says stay away from this just don't do this you know there is a um, in the seerah there is a um, a story where you know Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam really wanted to visit the the his mother's grave right yeah 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 and and he prayed and prayed and prayed and yeah. eventually he was given permission and then it was taken away he says we yeah, do not do this ever away. again right right this is the example that that people only say half of that i mean i don't know the hadith mm. i'm i don't know i don't know this hadith at all all i'm uh, is i'm just paraphrasing uh, what i've read but you have to understand it was it was removed and forbidden mm. at the time of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam doing this yeah. and this is the thing exactly like uh, what we say we are a group of uh, four or five friends and uh, there are many uh, youth that uh, who understands it and who act acts upon it but uh, their relatives and uh, their friends like they threaten us and uh, there are all sorts of uh, like mischievous things that they do but uh, yeah thank you and um, yeah, so so i, I would yeah. say look fo focus on tawhid focus on on removing shirk from your belief 
and then I think yeah. everything else follows from this. Uh, because if you work on the peripheral things, it doesn't usually mm. work. So we try and get them to understand that, you know, what does it mean when we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one in in, yeah. in his oneness? What does it mean when mm. he is the Lord, he is the Rubabiyah? What do we mean when he mm. is the only one that is to be worshipped and praised? What do those actually mean? And only when you actually internalize and understand that do people sort of say, okay, here's my touchstone. If it doesn't meet these requirements, which Allah has revealed to us, then I don't, I don't do it. Simple. Yeah. Uh, and this is something that don't expect it to be yes. a solution overnight. You know, it takes a lot of effort. Right. Yeah. Because don't forget, these and people have been following this way for generations sometimes. So, yeah, yes. there is about something. And there is one clear hadith about this uh, worshipping of the great. Uh, it's uh, from Musnad Ahmad. Uh, uh, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam made dua to Allah, saying that, "Oh Allah, do not make my grave an idol that is worship." Allah, Allah's wrath was intense upon a people who took the graves of their prophets as a place of worship. Yeah. It's a sahih hadith. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. yeah. Somehow we uh, like uh, we um, communicate the uh, message to the people, uh, to the guys who are doing the grave worship, uh, worshiping. But uh, the Shi the yeah, Shiites, yeah. But the Shiites, you need to educate much, uh, them from the Quran and Sunnah. Yeah, yeah. That is the, uh, only the way Shi to... yeah. The yeah, Shiites, the they just come. Um... Yeah, go on, go on. Yeah. What uh, about sorry, the Shia? Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, the Shia the Shiites, uh, they always come to Jamai and they always come to Sifuin. And uh, how much should we try to educate them on? History, yeah, they, they just refuse, they just refuse to, they just don't want yeah. to understand it. Like I said, look, it's dawa is not something which is a walk in the park. You need to yeah. work hard. You need to put your effort in it. And look, your duty is to convey the message. Yeah. Yeah. Even the Prophet yes. was unable to convince his own family members. Yeah. 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 Then who are we? You know. But yeah. Allah doesn't expect you to work miracles you know to do things which are beyond your scope beyond your means so stick to yeah. what is beyond your means if it is just giving them dawa bringing them the hadith or the ayat which uh, refutes their arguments then you have done your duty basically isn't it and this is yeah. something that, uh, we all have to go through you know hidayah is always in the hands of allah so make dua for them as well you know sometimes at the dua, your efforts might seem trivial, your dua might seem trivial to you, but dua is such a thing that it is the weapon of the believers, you know, it is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to change your takbir with the right dua, yeah. Yeah. so it's not something trivial so make yeah. make all these inshallah. efforts and inshallah Allah will give you the answer for your efforts and may Allah give them hidayah as well, inshallah inshallah, inshallah I can okay, just so, I have a, a, a little uh, uh, request to uh, specialist on Hashim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you please uh, give my salam to Ustad Adnan Rashid? Inshallah. Wa alaikum yeah. salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Thank you. So, Brother Hashim, yes, well, it's, it's quite late. <clears throat> it's quite late over in, in over in India for Brother Sam and Brother Sister Swati. Uh, are we sort of heading towards the end of the program now? Shall yeah, we, we got start only closing down? more people. Only yeah. two, two okay. more, inshallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Right. Uh, so we got, uh, I think, one non Muslim here. We'll bring him first. Hello there, the one. Hi, how are you doing? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. How are you guys doing? Yeah, very well. How are you keeping? Yeah, we're well, good. Great. Everything's fine. <coughs> okay. where, where are you calling from? From London. I spoke to you guys last on the yeah, last stream. He came, he came last oh, time. Oh, okay. So, do you know that this yeah. uh, stream is about Hinduism today? Yeah. So have last, you got last, questions related last, to Hinduism? Last, last time <coughs> it was also about Hinduism. It was about Hinduism, right? Yes, yes, it was. <coughs> no, I think we had um, open Q and A as well in the middle, where mm -hmm. you can ask any questions. So ideally, we would prefer questions about Hinduism. But have you got any other points that you want to make? Maybe. 
Yeah, I mean, last week I was asking you about the the Quran, right? Right. Um, I can ask you questions regarding that because I, I have a lot of questions I wrote down in my notes while I was reading the reading the Quran. Okay. Um, if you give want us your best ask... look, we don't have much time, so give us the best question that you have you want to deal with, and inshallah we'll yeah, take. Yeah, but just since, one, since, since, just one since question, you... we'll, because the thing is we're going to close soon. and there are some yeah. people who are waiting two more people waiting since you since you told me it's about the the hindu hindu questions i can ask you i can ask you about hinduism um so it's up to you to really which yeah, yeah go ahead just one question topic right. um yeah so all right let me so um right in the quran i was reading this this passage right um chapter 11 verse 119 okay read um, it it says except whom your lord has given mercy and for that he created them but the word of your lord is to be fulfilled that i will surely fill hell with jinn and men altogether Right. So, what's your question? So, so the question is, um, this mercy is only for certain people, or, or I mean, basically in the Bible, God, uh, God, God says that He wants everybody to come to heaven. He doesn't want He doesn't want a single person to go to hell. So last week, your brother Mansur he told me that it's the same God. who is in the bible and in the quran so wh- why is god yeah, so, saying one thing in the bible and another thing in the quran you know once again brother we are we are not making the bible our yardstick so just because we believe in one god whether it's the god of the hindus the god of the muslims the god we don't have such concept we believe there is only one god now if the hindu wants to worship him he's their god if the christian wants to worship him is their god but it's how the scriptures have portrayed god for example the passage that you read uh chapter mm-hmm. 11 surah al-hud uh number 119 can you read 118 the ayah just before that <coughs> okay one second um and if your lord has willed he could have made mankind one community but they will not cease to differ mm-hmm. now read the next one in the 19 yeah 119 yeah um except whom your lord has given mercy for that he created them but the word of your lord is to be fulfilled i will surely fill hell with jinn and men all together So okay, the word so. is given is this this is this is basically a prophecy that is given um so he he was going to fulfill this prophecy No no it's not is a that... prophecy it's a condition Allah is telling you so Allah is telling you that if Allah had willed he could have made all of mankind one community but then Allah says but they will not cease to differ okay well, what's that, that going to is, do this with... is not going to be possible to make all of mankind yes um into one community because obviously everybody has subjective understanding and they will not come to one agreement and then right. allah carries on saying that except for whom your lord has given mercy do you know what the term mercy means here um no okay mercy means the ones allah has pardoned has forgiven okay so these are the people who who commit sins and then they seek forgiveness from him they repent to him and allah pardons them because they are sincere in their repentance and they do not associate partners with allah so these are the people that allah will forgive for example if i were to ask you do you think there will be anyone in hell fire uh, from the christian perspective those that god has pardoned no exactly if, if god hasn't forgiven them if god hasn't pardoned them he hasn't showed them his mercy then they end up in hell fire but it's not because of that only that it's because of the sins that they have committed is because they have continued in that disbelief is because they have disobeyed god continuously even after god has given them many chances then 
Allah will remove his mercy from them and they will end up in hellfire as Allah promised them in the Quran. So even when the prophets and the messengers who came to all the nations in the world, yes, they would come as a warning to the people, as a warning against the consequences of disbelief. And then they would also obviously give them the guidance from Allah, from God Almighty, that if you do X, Y, and Z, then Allah will guide you. And his guidance and his promise always comes true. So my oh, friend, this is all conditional. It's not like God wants them to go to hellfire. It's that they refuse to go to heaven. You know, there's, a hadith, there's a famous hadith of the Prophet uh, where, where I'm par uh, paraphrasing. It goes something like this, that only the people who refuse to go to Jannah will not go. And who are these people? Oh, the companions, they asked him, who would refuse to go to Jannah? You know, the Prophet then um, mentioned, I don't know if um, Brother Mansur or Muhammad can correct me, maybe. It's those people who have disobeyed Allah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And their abode is the hellfire, isn't it? If they do it deliberately, after Allah mm -hmm. has given them the warnings, the messengers have given them the warnings, the people have given them the warnings, and they do not heed the warnings, then they have made their abode themselves in the Jahannam. They cannot blame anyone else except themselves. In fact, even the shaitan, you know, the shaitan mm -hmm. will also, on the day of judgment, he'll say, I have nothing to do with you. All I did was like, I motivated you or I whispered in your ear, you're the one who followed in my footsteps. So mm -hmm. no one forced them. It is their own doing which leads them to the hellfire. Right. So if, if, you, find, if you find mercy, right? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, yeah. So if you find mercy and you 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 go to heaven, um, so you you are you are promised to to get some virgins. Am I right? Sorry, God's I didn't catch the last bit. If you if you got mercy, so so so, so so you you obtain mercy, mm -hmm. and you make your way into heaven. Yes. So are are you gonna get some virgins in heaven? Yes, we will get other than virgins a lot of good things. What's the problem? Well, so, no, 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 no. I'm and saying, by the way, this, sorry, you, you mentioned virgins. These are going to be the wives. They'll be given as wives to the believers. How, how many exactly? It's up to can I just Can I just interject there very clearly? Um, obviously. So in first, you had a question about the, the differences you've noticed in the biblical understanding of God, that God wants to go to heaven and not to hell. And the Quran seems to be indicating otherwise. Now you're asking about the very nature of the reward in paradise. If I, yeah, if I, I mean, was asked, I, I mean, before I, I, we, before I, I, we, before we answer yeah, these questions, I mean, the answers are quite clear if you read the Quran. But what I want to ask you is, was well, something on a, on a fundamental level. If you believe in God, what sort of reward do you have in mind? Do you, do you expect uh, to be given? from God? Do you just simply want paradise to be a place in which, what, what is in your mind? What, what is the reward well, that well, you, you seek? I can, I can only speak from what I read in the Bible. I can't, I can't no, 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 no. Not from a biblical perspective. Leave all scriptures aside. Ask yourself, if, if I want to be in paradise, what is your expectation? What is it? What, what, where do you uh, want to spend your eternity? What in what? That's, that's, in, that's what I, that's what I'm trying to say. If I give you my perspective, my mind, my mind is very finite and limited mm. to, to because I, I have not I have not been there. I have not seen anything there. Like if you ask me what Hyde Park is like, I can tell you this is what Hyde Park is like because everybody everybody in London knows. But if you ask me what heaven is going to be like, what are you, you going to expect? What you what you expect to do there? I no, don't, I can't tell that's you. Not, that's not my question. My question is rather different. What what are you expecting? You you exist now. Mean. You exist now, and you know that heaven or hell is going to be a place of eternity. Well, either well, either you in a place of happiness or in a place of suffering of some kind. What no, are you no, expecting is, heaven is, to be like? There's no suffering. There's no. Um, it's going to be peaceful and um, full of joy. Um, Good, all the good things, basically, all the all the good things are gonna be there. So why like do what? you think why do you think wives are not good thing? I didn't say that. I didn't say that. 
what is, just what is the reason? It was just a question. Can you tell us it the reason just... why you asked that question? If it was not because a Because I wrote it. I wrote it down. I told you I have, no, I have notes. I, I take you know, down the, notes. When you wrote it down, there was a thought process. Yeah, because, because, <laughs> all right, all right. Let me let me put it like this. I mean, be frank. Look, it's not the first time we have heard this question, so we are not really embarrassed about it. In I'm, fact, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not asking. This is a blessing asking. from Allah. If He gives us something, we don't we don't actually be ungrateful or deny it. My, uh, if my I, brother, because yeah, the question I'm that we want to, let me, the question let me, that we want to clarify. Sorry to um, speak over both of you. I apologize. This, the question that we need to clarify is this: Is heaven a reward of spiritual nature, or is it really beyond spiritual nature? Are you going to have enjoyment and pleasure, bliss and happiness, joy, all of that? Really, is it purely spiritual, or is there? non-spiritual like physical material pleasure that is what, what i'm asking you know to the root of this question because in christianity for example they seem to indicate that you know it will be just some kind of spiritual joy and so on when the bible actually doesn't limit to that many christians don't even know what the bible talks about material pleasure and so on like you know how can you have you know something that's material there in, in, a, in a spiritual <laughs> um, enjoyment so what are you expecting from from your expectation not you know what you've seen or what you've read if you want happiness and joy are you simply wanting and limiting yourself to spiritual enjoyment and spiritual contentment uh, tranquility or do you feel that okay because we are a physical spiritual duality in a makeup we need to have the catering for both of our aspects what is it you're expecting yeah before i answer you i want to i want to get one thing absolutely clear out of the way i am not asking any of these questions to embarrass you guys or put islam down or or anything of that nature okay i i genuinely wrote this question down while i was going through all these topics right and i want to get there's no not there's no better people to get this answer from except you guys could you, you you guys know well much so more. okay so brother the one can i just come in just a quick comment so uh, there are many many people that are better than us subhanallah you know we, we're just ordinary people doing a, a show so please do not i, I know put us I know, so but, but, let me just clarify let me just clarify. Me. No, no no let me clarify because these are big words and, and we don't like them because it, it, it puts people on a pedestal we're just normal guys who are doing a show and if what we say is good it's from allah if what if what we make a mistake is from ourselves and shaitan Okay, th Mom, that, those are the rules we offer. Okay, the, the so way, the, the way I see it, the way I let, see let me it. Let, me, let me ask you one question. So, so that's the clarification. So, the question is: Is heaven in your conception? Is it of this world, or is it a different existence? Is it a metaphysical? Is it sort of sorry, an ex a reality that is beyond this reality? Is it a different reality? Yes. Good. So, of that other reality, how much do we know? We can only know as much as what we read in the text. Good. You, so you, you, you know, you know as much what you read in the Quran. I know. As you much know, I we know as Bible. much as what Allah has revealed. Okay. So the yeah, language basically. that. So, so let me finish my questioning with you, and then you'll understand where I'm going. So the language and the words that we use are. They... Sorry, I can't hear anything you're saying. Th this language, the words, the, these you, English words that are coming out of my mouth. Okay, so is the language that we use to communicate to each other and the books that we read is the language of this world or is the language of the other world? Where, what is this language of? The words, the meanings that, that we say to each other. You know, if I say to you table, is that a, a word from the other world or is it a, a word that we use in this world? If you say table. Yeah, if I, if I word. use a word, how do you understand it? In yeah, any I mean, word, ta table means table. Like I don't, how, I don't know how do you how about. do you know how do you know table means table because you have in your mind an idea of a generic thing that has a flat surface and four legs. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. What if Allah tells us we have a table in the other world? Do we know what that table will be like? Mm. Well. Well, 
Yeah, because it's going to no, be, we don't. No, 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 because we have no idea what that reality is. So no, even though the word, it, it, so it, even it, though it, the it, word is the same word, no, the only say, thing we say, can say if, is we know what a table is in this world. We have no idea what because there is no other word that will help us understand other than our human word. So when Allah says He will give us fruits and things you have tasted and things you have experienced before on the other reality, these words are words that have meaning in this reality only. What they mean in the other reality, we have no idea. So the best right. analogy, the best similitude of like thing like this, but he also qualifies it and he says it'll be nothing like you've ever experienced before. All right. So, okay, so, so can I? I think can the I question. You, sorry, brother. No, one, one second. One, one second. Let yeah, me let ahead. me just make a point. Let me make a point quickly. The reason I asked about these virgins, right? The the main the main specific reason is, obviously, I just read the Bible, uh, the the Quran recently. But when I read the Bible previously, um, Jesus is saying um these 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 uh Pharisees and scribes, they come to him and. You know, they're always trying to catch him in his words and trying to find a fault, basically. So they asked him, they, they gave him a scenario. They gave him a scenario. Um, they said, these seven brothers are there, and the first brother had a wife, and then the, the first brother died. So the wife, wife went to the second guy, and the second guy died. The, then he went to the third guy, all the way to the seven, all seven brothers had this wife. And all seven, all seven of them died. So um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the story I'm talking about. Um, so the question they asked Jesus was, when these people go to heaven after they die, basically, when, when the wife, the wife also died. So when when they go to heaven, um, who whose wife is this woman going to be? And then Jesus gave the gave, gave the reply. He said, he said. Um, they, 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 they're going to be no marriage in heaven. There's going to be no wives. There's going to be nothing of that sort. Everybody's going to be like an angel. So they don't get, they don't marry. They don't, they don't have relationship like we do in, in, in the earth, like have a family, husband, wife, children, and all that. There's going to be nothing like that. It's going to be a totally different um, scenario there. So, yeah, so what read... do you make of, what do you make of this passage in the Bible? Uh, I mean, I agree with you with regards to, I think it was Matthew 22, 30 that you quoted, that mm -hmm. at the res resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They'll That's be like right. in heaven, yeah? Yeah. What do you make of 2 Corinthians 11, 2? One second, second, Corinthians 11, 2, yeah? Yeah. So this is Paul's, uh, allegedly Paul's words. Do you want to read it for us? Oh, I'm just getting you one second. Okay. I'll read it while you're so, getting it, and you tell me if it's correct. So Paul is saying here, I promised you to one husband to Christ so that I might present you as a virgin to him. Mm -hmm. So if there are no marriages in heaven, what what is he trying to say? This, this, this is not a literal marriage. Okay. So what kind of marriage is it? This is basically the church. The chaste virgin is the church. And Jesus is the the husband, basically. So, so, so wait, what, a, what wait is... a minute, wait a minute. So, church is the uh, the bride. Yeah, church bride. means when you say church, it means the Christian. So you, you, all, you, all, you already know the answer before I even give it to you. The church no, no, is the bride. When you yeah. say church, it means the Christian people. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. So whether no, you course. are a whether you are a Followers. male or a female, the promise is that. You have been promised to one husband, who is Jesus Christ. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So it's, you will be present as a pure virgin to Him. What the, What does that mean? Without Without sin, without any kind of blemish, without any spot, without any any kind of faults, um, it's, it's going to be pure. Okay. So why Why is Jesus a husband here? What does that mean? It's an analogy given basically no, in Genesis. I, mean, I don't understand what the analogy means. Why? A That's husband... what I'm, I'm, I'm explaining to you. In yeah, Genesis, yeah. in Genesis, mm -hmm. um, when when Adam and Eve were, were created, uh, God said, "These two shall be one flesh." Okay. So when we read the last book, which is Revelation, 
in chapter 21 and 22 which is the last two chapters it talks about the marriage that's taking place in heaven so obviously you know the whole book of revelation is nothing literal or or everything is symbolic <clears throat> so um so the bride so the bride is the church and jesus is there and they're going to be one they're going to be joined together yeah so in the case of adam and eve because they mm. were husband and wife that was literal yeah. but you also shall be one flesh this is metaphor there shall be one flesh yeah yeah no like so the, so the, hold on hold on so the, hold on. So the it point say, it says yeah you will be a virgin presented as a bride no 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 i'm talking about husband. the genesis verse in genesis yeah. in genesis says, is um, this you know they, they shall be there shall be one flesh yeah in genesis yeah, yeah, literally because they married yeah, as one yes. so exactly. husband and wife so, are married so, as one so it's literal so the, so so the point here is the yeah. church and the uh, bride bride and the and the bridegroom jesus is going to be one to get one so that's what that's the meaning of it it's yeah, not going to be true is you will it's, it's, it's husband it's says the husband and the, and the virgin who is like you said uh the pure virgin is a, is a church yeah so if you read the last two chapters so of will revelation will be married in in heaven or what no it's not literal that's what i'm saying Okay. basically so the why are you giving a literal joined. definition from genesis because that's the analogy um, god god said that these two shall be one the husband and wife shall be one and no one no one should put them put them away separate them basically so in spiritual terms these these two entities um the bride and bridegroom they're going to be joined as one that's that's okay. the meaning of it right so uh, i mean still look Jesus is your god or your husband what is it No I mean not literal husband not literal husband the bible is just giving that giving but the Jesus is called the shepherd and we are called the sheep are we literally a sheep and he is a shepherd no it's just an analogy Yeah but do, do you know, the shepherd the, she- the shepherd takes care of the sheep Yeah but we are not sheep that is, are that is the analogy which i understand now so why, the wife, why would it's not all that you have the analogy of a husband and wife yeah if you just want to be one you know you'll be one with god simple as that yeah that's what that's what it trying to here is saying i promise you to one husband to christ and mm-hmm. hold on why only one husband if you want to be with god what about the other two what about the father and the holy spirit they are one we, we discussed will it last time they are one them? will you not be with them How many so, husbands have we got in heaven? Three husbands? If you one if you if you if you are with if you are with um your god there are one we don't there's no exactly. three gods. This is here specifically I promise you to one husband to Christ. Yeah because there's going to be antichrist. No, so no, there's no. going to be no, an antichrist. No, I'm telling you what I'm saying. And he's he's well, coming. Your explanation was that you will be with God the church meaning the Christian people will be one with God. but here he says you will only be with christ not with the father and the holy spirit yeah because jesus is the head of the church in a, in another place in another place it is written that um jesus is the head of the church as the husband husband is the head of the house so yes, it, it also um, says it also says the head of christ is god yeah so do you believe that as well of course if so that's what is written Wait, wait a minute does god have a does god have a head does god have a have a boss no but he, he the father the father is is obviously the father and son who obviously you you are not bad you are not going to be in a high this was very clarifying just house. the very point that brother hashim had made that the god would not have any boss i think that's the point of clarification where you do we don't have any confusion in terms of trinity you know the passage yeah. that you mentioned uh, in order mm-hmm. to say the, the uh, jesus is the head of men mm-hmm. and then you not said, head of men head of the church no it says jesus uh, is the head of all men this is first corinthians 11:3 you can check it for yourself he didn't say head of the church in there so he says I, i'm i'm referring to uh, another another other passage no but the one about the wife about jesus and about god is in first corinthians 11:3 so jesus is the head of all men obviously during his time we believe as prophets were the head of people so he was the head of all men at that time the head of the woman is man meaning in a marriage no the, you you got the passage um in a wrong way 
But I would, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of yeah, said. woman, woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So what this verse is saying? So you see what, all these three. What, it boils what, down no, to head what, of Christ what, being one, God. One, one second, one second. What yeah. this verse is saying, just as how the man is head of the woman in the house, same way Christ is head of the church. That's what. That's basically what it says. And what? What about the last statement, which you after that? Wrote? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Christ. Christ. Christ head of Christ. Head of Christ, Christ, is, head of Christ is God because Christ. Obviously, you know what Christ means, right? It's called Messiah. So ultimate is the God. The anointed. One second. One second. The Christ means Messiah or the anointed one. God means Almighty God. So obviously, God is going to be. Um, so you overseeing. you don't believe that Jesus and the Father are co-equal. Um, and also, no, some brother, wait, 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 please. Jesus is the is the second person in the Trinity, where the are Father is the first person. Friend? Are they co-equal or they are not co-equal? I think they are co-equal because they are one. So, so if they are what, co-equal, what is your creed? What, 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 which, sorry, brother. Which creed do you follow? What is your creed, your Christian creed? He said he was a Protestant last time. A Protestant. So you follow the Nicene Creed, right? Yeah. You do? So in the Nicene Creed, can you tell me what it says about about um, about who is God? There? What does it say in the Nicene Creed? Sorry, what, can you repeat that? Yeah, what does, it, what does the Nicene Creed mm-hmm. say about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? What does it say? That they are equal. Exactly. So it says, well, it says more than that. It's, it's several lines, but it's several lines. Can you, do you know it at all? I don't, mem- I don't memorize it now. No, no, fair, fair well, enough. You can tell I me. Don't, okay. I don't expect you to. Okay, that's fine. But essentially what it says, is says the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. The yeah. Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father, and the Holy Spirit is, is not, not the Son. Mm. These are the the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but these are not three gods; they're one God. So, how many gods have you got? One. This this is what I was explaining in the last stream. We forgot. Maybe we can again explain in the next stream because this was demystifying Hinduism. Yes, <laughs> we are demystifying so, Christianity right now. So, no, well, okay what, because what, he, he asked the question, and I think he's he did. probably the second last. Uh, yeah. Guest here, uh, I mean, guests in in waiting. So look, my friend, all I'm saying is that when you read First Corinthians eleven three, all three mm. examples given, Jesus being the head of uh, men, um, the the husband being the head of the woman in a marriage, mm-hmm. and thirdly, mm-hmm. the head of Christ is God. There is something common in all this, which God, uh, which uh, this passage is talking about, which is in terms of authority. Do you agree? Yeah. Okay, do you believe anyone can have authority over God? No. Good. Does Jesus have anyone in authority over him? Well, the Bible says Jesus is subject to the Father. Is that a yes Um, or no? Does Jesus have any authority over him? Yeah, he's subject to, to the Father. Good. So, you know, you have just contradicted yourself. Have you realized? When I asked you, does God have any authority over him? You said no. Does Jesus have well, any authority not, over it's him? Not re- it's not really so, yes. a contradiction because it's not very easy subject to understand. And clearly, it's very easy. Look, look, the one, it's very easy. Mm-hmm. There is only one God. Yeah, it's really yes. simple. And he's okay. the That's almighty saying, authority. You know? Exactly. So, so saying, what makes it difficult? So, I'll I'm tell not not you what. I'll t- you, know, you know what makes it difficult? Is the Catholic Church, which had its origins 200 years before Christianity, that's when it started. The Roman Catholic Church, which is what it was, had a two century beginning when Christianity finally came along. And when Christianity came along, it ruined it and created this trinity in order to merge everything up. So, here that's the challenge. The challenge is this is not an original brief uh, belief. It took 400 years after Christ to come up with the conception. In the middle, it was a binatarian conception. Then it became a Trinitarian conception. And for the longest time, there was no Holy Spirit in the discussions anywhere. So, And we don't find this in the Bible anywhere. And then what we find with most of the Christian scholarship out there, they say, look, the Trinity is a forced narrative. 
in the Bible okay. with specifically hand-chosen Gospels out of thousands that could have been chosen to drive home a particular, and, and, they, and not we don't say this, the Christian authorship say this, uh, and, and, and the, the scholars, they say this is essentially a form of early propaganda because they wanted the whole of the Roman population to come under one understanding. Now, so, this is your this is your sort of problem. Now, for the Islamic situation, there is one God. Heaven is physical and spiritual, and we are given gifts and delights in heaven that are suitable for the believer based on what he is, what he deserves from Allah's mercy. That's it. It's really simple. No, no complications. So, no running around the houses. No roundabouts. Are you saying? Um, I mean, are you denying the existence of Holy Spirit? Okay, look, in your conception, to, yes. So, in know. your conception, no, no, no. yes. According, no, no, no. According to your 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 belief, for us, no, the Holy okay. Spirit is Angel Jibril. You know, exactly. Allah says in the Quran, Ruhul uh, Quddus, and that literally translates to the Holy Spirit. Okay, so your understanding is different. We don't believe Angel Gabriel was God or co-equal to God or anyone is co-equal to God. Your own Bible clearly shows you a contradiction where Jesus, according to your creed, is supposed to be co-equal with God. But in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 11, 3, it says that the head of Christ is God, which means the Father, okay. God the Father. Can and I just was, remember, this was after the ascension of Jesus Christ. So you cannot say while he, won, while he was on earth, he was subject to God and so on. This was after the ascension. Now he's sitting on the right-hand side of God, according to your Bible. And he is subject to God, which you confirm. And also he has a boss. Okay? He has someone in higher authority than him. I just want to make a comment here very quickly uh, so that we are very, you know, clear about this stream. So it's a demystifying Hinduism. So I want to make a link. Hindus believes in several deities. Um, do you think this is polytheism, Hinduism? So when Christians believe in Jesus is God, Holy Spirit is God, and the Father is God, do you believe this is polytheism also? No. <laughs> so why do you consider Hindus polytheistic and this Trinitarian belief not polytheistic? Because the three are one. That's what you I keep, I keep telling That's you. That's what they the last... would also say Hindus. The I, three I... incarnations are of one Brahman. Exactly. Yeah. No, you you have you have millions of gods, not three. No, 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 no. Look, look, the one. So you haven't been Hindu watching the stream, have you? You haven't been watching the stream. In, so in, in Hindus, let, there let, are me, let me explain to you. No, let me explain to you. So in this stream that we had today, we had a follower of Krishna. Okay. Now, and okay. and their belief says I did, Krishna. I, didn't see that. I just came on. Well, well, this is why you I need to have context, started. brother. You can't just jump into a stream and start yeah. no, talking no, about no, whatever I'm you talking... feel like talking about. So no, let me saying, explain. Let me, let me explain. Hindus, let... There's more than three gods. Let me explain. Okay? The, the stream that we had today was a specific strand of Sanatan Dharma, which is the follower of Krishna. And they say that Krishna, who is the manifest deity in this world, and also the intimate supreme deity of the godhead they have them on both sides and in the middle what they say that this is a sub divinity or, or a, a a trio of brahma vishnu and shiva mm -hmm. now and they say these three are one okay mm -hmm. almost word for word the same nicene creed that you have so you yep. call them polytheists but you don't call yourselves polytheists that is hypocrisy well, i would say one one thing i do know is that there are so many um, stories in Hinduism that's inspired from the Bible. So the way, the way you know, when... Um, so the Bible is Krishna, polytheistic then? If the Bible gave rise to polytheism, then the Bible at its core is polytheistic. Any, anyone, anyone can be inspired. Even, even, even Islam is, is inspired from, from Christianity. But what I'm saying is... Um, no, no, no. No, 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 no. You can't run over a sentence. Of all the key doctrines of Christianity. What are you on about? Yeah, exactly. And we, we have to sin, miss out. The, reinc the incarnation of a God, the, the the sacrifice, the crucifixion, resurrection, the Trinity. These are your key doctrines. Tell me which one Islam advocates. None of them. Anyway, I think, you know, I'm, I'm like we, about we the you last story. Time, we, story we would of, like to, um, if you, you live in London, so come down to Speaker's Corner. We'll have a chat somewhere yeah. in the corner. And uh, we can take it from there. But and this, to... as uh, we pointed out earlier, 
was mainly about Hinduism. Exactly. So let's give chance to two more guests who are waiting. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. One final, one final comment, if I if I may, just to, to link it again together. You know, this claim that you made about how Hinduism and Islam has been somehow influenced and they have similar stories. I mean, have you read the Gilgamesh epic? Have you read yeah. the Atrahasis epic? Have you read no. the Enumelish epic? These epics predate the Bible by thousands of years. And the Bible has similar stories. So the Bible definitely, clearly, obviously has been influenced by those stories from cuneiform you know, tablets that we can see and read. Just to put it in context. Yeah. All right. Thank anyway, you. Anyway, visit, visit the brothers in, in Speaker's Corner and Brother Hashmi Mansur. They go there every Sunday. And please, you know, just go down there. We'll find a little corner somewhere and they can talk to you. Yeah, we can have a chat. Yeah. Sure, sure. Definitely. Yeah. You can definitely. have a chat, yeah. All right, brother. Take, take care. Look after yourself. Well, well, one, you. one, one second. One second. Before, before I go, I would like to make one point. One last point. You, you remember last, last stream, um, I said to you that you know me by my name, Anthony, right? And next stream, I come on, and you say, I say to you, I'm the guy from, guy from the last stream, and you will know who I am, without the name. You, 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 you really knew, knew who I was, right? I, I, no, look, we, don't, the, the, we don't know who you are if you change. We your don't name. know who you are. Yeah, all we know is we hear a voice, and and voice. Uh, that's all we know. We don't know who you are. No, absolutely not. Yeah, you, you recognize my voice. You recognize maybe, my, I don't maybe know. You your name, um, yeah. same, so we recognize you. Or, or you just switch your video on, and then we, at least we know who you are. I mean, yeah, and I even then, we don't know who I, you are. I, I really enjoy talking to you guys because. You Thanks, know, guys. I, Cheers. I, I like to you know interact interact with um, people like you to. You know, I um get more knowledge about the subject. You know, that's Absolutely, what I, that's yeah. what I was trying to say. Because this is what we're about. Yes. Yeah, so I don't I, I don't know any other people, um uh, um talking about this subject. Like I only know you guys because I've seen you on YouTube and um the way you guys talk in Speakers Corner. So I know that you are knowledgeable on these topics. Therefore, I'd like to come and you know, discuss these things. But um, there's no no disrespect. This I'm not trying to put put the no, no, one religion no. down. Yeah. Um, nothing, understood. nothing of that sort. Nothing of that sort. All right then. Yeah. Thank take you very much. We take appreciate care. that. Take Thank you. We we'll take care. Look after yourself. Yeah. You too. Yeah. All right. So we got uh, we got someone called an Hindu atheist, but he doesn't want to switch on his camera in the background, so we can't bring you on the on the panel. So it's entirely up to you. Uh, I've got the brother Yusuf here. Brother Yusuf, assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum, brother Yusuf. Are you there? I think you, you, your mic may be switched off. Oh, it's, there we go. Are you there? We can't hear you. All right, I'll I'll bring another brother here. All right, brother Khan. Oh, you want to keep your video on? Okay, it's up to you. Uh, Salaam alaikum, How are you doing? All right, Khan Ashik. Yeah, well, like, salam. How are you doing? Yeah, alhamdulillah. Good How are you? Good. I'm pretty tired. Yeah, tired in Bangladesh. It is now 2.45 and so night, you know what? Well, like, salam. And alhamdulillah. Well, doing yeah, well. But, uh, patience, brother. You've been waiting for a while in the background. background to the clock here. Yeah. I don't want to take up well, more, much of your time. You got any questions or comments for us? Yes, uh, yes, I have a few questions. Uh, uh, Swati Ma'am also knows about a uh, few questions because... Uh, it's just one Indian... question. We don't have much time today. Yeah. So just one question. Why? My question is, why people are always attacking Islam only? And uh, sometimes I feel like, why we don't get... Uh, <clears throat> Direct help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have a few questions about that. Like, why? So, why we so are attacked? Why we, why, why we don't seek help from Allah? Is that what your question is? Why we yes, don't yes. receive help why? from Allah? Oh, I see. Okay. No. I'm understanding your question. Manso, we can barely hear you. Is it my mic's going again? Okay. So if I'm understanding the yeah, yeah. question properly, 
you're saying Islam is on the receiving end of attack. Everyone's attacking Islam um, constantly, you know, consistently, and we are not receiving any help. Is that what you're yes. questioning about? Why is this so? Think about it. Yes. If Islam wasn't true, if Islam wasn't, you know, the actual correct, acceptable religion or way of life from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, then it should be something that people shouldn't attack. People shouldn't bother about it. Because there's truth within it, people are struggling. Remember how the Quraysh struggled with the concept of one, uh, you know, being one uh, deity, one one creator, rather than so many of these deities they had. So there's constant battle and quarrel, the constant this antagonism people have because they're struggling to accept the truth because they know the truth is there. So Islam, if it was false, for example, then people wouldn't care about. I mean, who cares about anything that's false? They do not care about like, oh, this doesn't have anything about it. Because Islam is true and it has the impact on people's lives here and hereafter. And those who do not want to accept it, they will be constantly attacking it. Because they know that unless they can silence Islam, just think about how, you know, for over hundreds and thousands of years, people are trying to, trying to stop the spread of Islam because they know if Islam spreads, then it will go against their economy, it will go against their polity, their politics, it will go against their social structure, against their economic structure, against the whole way of life. So the reason why Islam is attacked, because this what Islam stands for, it stands against any kinds of evil, any kinds of you know things that Islam says is not good for us. But people want to go for those things. They want to do all these things because whether it's to do with the satisfaction of their greed, for example. So they will exploit people, they will abuse people, they will try to rob people, cheat people, commit killings, murder, genocide, rape, you name it, for their greed and their needs and their desires. And you know that Islam is against all of that. So if Islam is going to be quite prominent and strong and politically you know, you know, quite solid and grounded, then they can't do that. They can't have you know, all these prostitution places. They can't have all these drinking places where they get drunk and they do whatever they want to do. Islam says no to these things. So people will oppose. Think about the industries that you see in terms of whether it's the industry of gambling, pornography and so on. Billions and billions of dollars and pounds people are making from this. If, yeah, from Bangladesh, Indian company yep. looted about 100 crores Bangladeshi taka. Few mm. days. One or two days ago, Tin Party Gult named the company. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you if you worried that why Islam is being attacked constantly, you know why. Because what Islam stands for, that it goes against people's selfish needs and desires and what they want. So when you see, you know, just like when Muslims are being attacked whether in a societal level, like the whole country is being invaded, it could be because they want to take our resources, they want to control our resources and so on, and in our mind intellectually too. So... Uh, get muted. We lost your mic, brother. That's how you are. No, mic is fine. It was just unmute. You oh, somebody asking. muted him. No, I think it's uh, when the internet drops. Sorry. Does. Don't don't think, Brother Khan, apologies for this technical glitch, <laughs> that Allah is not helping us. Allah is constantly helping us, and Allah will help us. But what Allah wants is to change our situation so that our situation can be better. We need to change us because it's not simply like, you know, just because we believe and we will not be tested, we will be tested. But if we want to change the situation of anything, we need to change ourselves. Allah's help will not come unless... We change that. This is you, you'll find the teaching grounded in the Quran. So we can't just simply sit there, do nothing. We have to, like this is one of the things that we're doing now in our eyes. We have to be part of Al Amr bil Ma'roof and Wan Nahi and Munkar, forbidding the evil. Don't do that, then there will be this problem that will be will will will, will suffer. Unfortunately. Exactly, and and plus I would add, uh, Brother Khan. You know, we have no idea how Allah is helping us. Exactly. You know, so so just because, you know, we don't see it, you know, <laughs> you know, fruit falling from the trees and things, doesn't mean Allah is not helping us. You know, we have no idea. And you know, if you look at the the, um, just in terms of statistics, 
you know, only a few years ago, um, Latin America was a mostly Catholic Christian country, you know, based on the bloody history of the Catholic Church. Today, alhamdulillah, almost with, you know, minimal dawah, there are droves of people coming into Islam in Latin America, right? And many of these who are coming in are such staunch Muslims that it makes actually born Muslims ashamed of ourselves. That that we you know even even after they've been in Islam in maybe you know three or four years, many of them I know have memorized you know, large portions of the Quran, and are doing dawah themselves. So you know where is the help? Just because it's not in front of you doesn't mean to say Allah is not helping us. You see, Allah helps those where the need is most, and only Allah knows that. Okay, brother Khan, I hope you got your response. Inshallah, keep us in the class yeah. and we'll speak yeah. to you later. Yes. Another, another one question, please. Go ahead. Uh, look, Go ahead. Uh, some people are uh, me using bad languages about our uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and our Almighty Allah. So it sometimes hurt me a lot. So what can we, uh, can be done in this aspect about? Uh, after uh, seeing bad words, uh, I feel distressed. At, you know what? I feel distressed about these uh, bad languages. So how can we reply or uh, get out from this frustration? This is the biggest problem of uh, our Muslim community. We get uh, frustrated due to this the use of bad languages about our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu yeah, we've got your question, brother. Um, just very quickly on the brother Muhammad, inshallah, um, add, add his comments on there. The thing that you describe, you're describing that you have Iman within you. If you did not feel what you're feeling when you hear the insults and mockery uh, being you know, played at, and, and when they're calling and insulting Allah and His Messenger, then where is the Iman left? This is the sign of the Iman that you feel that this is not right. This is not, you know, you, you feel, you know, disgusted. You feel, as you describe some of the feelings, for example, this is at least minimum that we should find in our heart. Now, what we need to do, instead of then feeling sorry and getting depressed and having anxiety issues, we need to channel this feeling in a positive way to make changes. It could be that you channel that and say, you know what, the reasons why people are doing this, maybe they're ignorant. Maybe they have misconceptions about this. That's why they're insulting. That's why they're making mockery. Maybe what we need to do now is to educate these people. Maybe we have to change their perceptions. How do you do that? You sticking, saying, okay, they are ignorant. They need to know. How do we need to tell them? So we have to have a program in which you disseminate you take that knowledge, correct knowledge, to demystify their misconception, to, to clarify their misconception, to give them the correct understanding. Because once people are given the light of knowledge, then their, their errors will be quite clear like day. And they will say, oh, I didn't realize that. I'm sorry. I apologize. And they will do that. Others, they do that knowingly because they want to provoke you to a reaction. They want you to act. They want to do something so that they get benefit from this reaction. I mean, we see that in, in, in London in Speaker's Corner, for example, where people want to provoke you so that you become angry and you commit some kind of physical violence. You get arrested, they close that place and they tell the whole world like how Muslims are very violent. There's a lot of agenda behind why people instigate and they want to provoke people's reactions like that. So you can't you have many um, you know, aspects of this. But if you feel that there are people who are simply doing this and you know that they don't know, then you need to channel positively your anger into like a passion and a drive to educate yourself more and educate the community and educate those who are misconceived. Brother Muhammad, you wanted thank to say something earlier. Really. No, that was beautifully said, alhamdulillah, no, nothing more. Okay, thank you, Brother Khan uh, I think you need some sleep now. Uh, don't Shit. forget to do your fajr. <laughs> it's time for fajr, I think. Yeah, yeah. okay, brother. thanks for joining. Assalamu alaikum. Yes. Jazakallah and wa alaikum salam. Okay, we got our last guest today, uh, Brother Yusuf. I hope he fixed his microphone. Brother Yusuf, are you there? 
We still can't hear you. Oh, no. you see? Oh. oh, here we go. Yes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah. How is everyone else? All good? Very good. We've had a very long stream today and you have the pleasure of being our final guest. Alhamdulillah. Oh, jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. So you're the best for the last. MashaAllah. Inshallah. So I think we already spoke and I gave a little backstory. And and I had a I had a question for Sister Swati. Yes, please. Is that okay? So w- w- what it is, I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't really wasn't a, like a devoted um, um, Hindu, and I didn't look deep into Hinduism. I just looked at the because the basics was um, ap- appealing to me, so I didn't really look deep into it. But I just want to ask a question about Raksha Bandhan now. Uh, yes, my, my my family, you know, I, I used to still, as a Muslim, I was still participating in, uh, f- you know, festivals and functions like Raksha Bandhan. But I, di- I thought Raksha Bandhan was like um, between brother and sister. And I don't have brothers and sisters, but I have a large family of cousin sisters. So the question is, I, I never really looked into it. Now I'm a bit curious. I'm a bit worried. Is there some form of shirk in Raksha Bandhan? Because I don't uh, the, know the full details. Yeah, the thing is, brother, I mean, yeah, Raksha Bandhan and yeah, we also had the Bhai Dooj yesterday. That's also on a very similar track of Raksha Bandhan. So, yeah, although it is, you know, though it's it's celebrated like a, you know, bond or a kind of very auspicious bond between brother and sister. However, the thing is that because it's observed on a particular day, which is that of a full moon day of, of which is called a Purnima as per the Hindu calendar, you know, in terms of the Shravan mass. So, uh, you know, in that sense, uh, it's not just purely a very secular kind of... Uh, you know, idea, because it's also, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the way if you see the history of it, you will find that, you know, basically what had happened in that in Mahabharat, the epic, the Itihasa, you know, it, it's mentioned that, you know, once Lord, you know, the Krishna was basically flying a kite, and then he cut one of his finger with the thread. And then mm-hmm. Draupadi, he, uh, she tore a piece from her sari and then she tied it on Krishna's finger to stop that bleeding. So Krishna was very moved by that gesture and he promised her that, you know, he'll take care and he'll protect her from all kinds of evils throughout her life. And then that that was taken to be a significance of, you know, that's one of the, the ways in which uh, the story beh- behind it goes. So then that was taken to be a kind of a memory where the sisters then tie the brother with the kind of, you know, the, they tie a knot mm-hmm. on their wrist and then sweets are exchanged and things like that. The, the problem with this is that... Uh, uh, the way in which Krishna had promised that he'll protect, if you would read Mahabharat, the way she was disrobed in the gambling incidents which had taken place in Mahabharat. Is this uh, the so, wife of the five Pandavas? Yeah, yeah. Oh, she's the wife of five Pandavas. And, and the entire oh, thing okay. of gambling which had taken place where she was absolutely disrobed and humiliated and there, you know, Krishna was trying to protect her by robing her with... So, I mean, that's not a kind of protection that one looks at. But, mm-hmm. yeah, the but, you know, the way you're saying that, would it be called a kind of shirk? Yeah, because it's associated with these kinds of, you know, uh, kinds of uh, scriptural text where the 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 actor or the character is not just any other character but taken to be a deity so mm-hmm. or a god himself so therefore you know and imitating whatever the godly act this kind of thing is celebrated so then it does become a kind of you know shirk which is why every festival for that matter has been taken from you know from puranas from itihasas so mm-hmm. that's why it doesn't come out to be very secular the way it sometimes because people don't see usually the story or the narration behind it that's they just follow the ritual so yeah. that's the entire you know problem with it because none okay. of the festivals if you would see would be secular in itself it all has linkage with the scriptures yeah i think that's that's a very good response because uh, mm-hmm. in terms of the actual act where where a brother is supposed to protect a sister, yeah. regardless of whether you tie the thread on the hand or exactly. not. Exactly. Yeah. It's something yeah. which is common sense, isn't it? And I think it is a root of it, which like Sister Swati said, in the beginning of it is from Krishna tying, uh, I don't know, being uh, protecting Draupadi, who is not even his sister. 
yeah yeah oh, i mean draupadi okay. tying that thing on uh, on his yeah. uh yeah yeah so that and also very particular see it's not just one day which is fixed it's again mm-hmm. the moon entire thing of you know seeing the moon because if you would see within hinduism astrology is also related with that so seeing those you know i you know sun moon positions pla- positions of planets and then the dates come like that so mm-hmm. it's all entangled together in that ways none of the things which are celebrated are uh, are are bereft of the scriptural background but uh, brother yusuf i understand when yes. you ask this question mashallah you know look if you have done something out of ignorance out of mm-hmm. things that yeah. you didn't know then okay. allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafoor uh, rahim you know he's he's the one who pardons you and out of his mercy he will he, as long as you didn't do it purposely you know no. allah allah is able to pardon you and he's able to forgive yeah. you so no. make tawbah to allah uh, yes. and inshallah allah will uh, inshallah. pardon you inshallah and that was that was very 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 detailed uh, because all i saw was that one my one of my cousin's sisters tying this thread on on my on my wrist and i'm mm. handing her a 10 pound note <laughs> and that's how i saw it <laughs> right Correct. but yeah yeah i can see i can see the dangers of it as well so i'm yeah. just going to keep, keep away from that as well yeah. and just a one last thing as well about the brother who was here earlier on i can't i'm really really bad with names and and daranga Das? Antaranga, yes. Antaranga Das. And I yeah. see how bad that was. <laughs> that was really bad. But see, I, I'll be, I'll be, I was looking at him, observing him, his character, his conduct, the way he came forward, how polite he was. You know, he just reminded me of my father. Because my father was, as a Hindu, had the same characteristics, right? He, he, was, he was, out of all the family, he, you know, you never hear him backbite, you never hear him. Uh, swear or say anything bad if he had something to say about somebody you will always be on a positive uh, a good note otherwise you tell me to, you know tell us you will tell us off you will tell us off mm-hmm. so so when i used to make sorry one second so when i used to make dua to allah I say ya allah please please just add of just just make his good character the means for him to enter uh, the folds of islam just just the, his character because he had a, such a good character and 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 that's the character of soul so so the character is there but it's just we need to just make dua that they you know they see the enlightenment of islam because i wanted to ask him a question is did he before he chose this path uh, and and before he became um, the devotee of krishna did he actually searched other religions did he actually look uh, into islam in the, with the same light with the same attitude did he actually look the into islam in depth the way he did with hinduism that's why i wanted to ask him and because you know, i think he's just chose one path and he devoted himself completely to that path without researching and looking into islam itself so that that was the question i wanted to ask him but yeah good question brother mashallah i think uh, brother muhammad did touch upon it Oh okay. Correctly, I but, um, yeah, maybe so, so, I wasn't yeah, here for the whole Yeah, story. maybe in part two we can delve a little again. I mean, today was just to get to know um mm-hmm. Antaranga. I mean, part two we can delve a little bit more. Um but yeah, you're right. I think I think this this journey to to understanding um you know different faiths takes different paths, right? I mean, people do different things and sometimes I mean like like Antaranga said, he made up his mind very early on. that he wanted to adopt an eastern yeah. religion and so i asked him you know where did he get that intuition from and he just said it just felt like it so yes we could i mean there could be a whole stream just on that alhamdulillah sounds like you have some fans brother yusuf joining us <laughs> his family is <laughs> yeah, yeah. your family is joining us yeah alhamdulillah um no, sorry. Oh, what's he doing? That's what he's doing. He's supposed to be playing Roblox. Well, there you go. He's joining you. No, give me one second. Is he, let, let me tell him off. He's not supposed to be doing that. You can tell him off in a little while. Just let me yeah. finish this. So, so I think to answer the question earlier, so, so the other thing I was going to mention, actually, is one of the things we need to be careful of as Muslims yeah. is also the idea of mahram and non-mahram relationships. Okay. Mm-hmm. And and this is especially true with cousin sisters because technically they they are not your mahram. Okay. right mm-hmm. so so while yes you can you know we can be nice to them we can be kind to them but if there's any sort of um um you know opportunity where they are touching you or 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 getting close to you then this is bordering on on you know you know 
sinning. You know, if you do it inadvertently, you know, okay, Allah has, you know, you speak, speak to Allah, but we should not ever put, our, put ourselves into a situation mm-hmm. where you tying things together or you're getting very close, you actually are, are really skating sort of close to the edge. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Although, I mean, uh, we, uh, it, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, carry on. Sorry. You know, you, you have a, uh, and again, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of go down. But I think, you know, being in a family, as you've said last time, where you are in a, you know, mixed environment, you have, you know, both, a, you know, you are, you see, are, are you the only Muslim in your family or is there anybody else who's reverted? Not the only, the only Muslim in the family. You're the only one. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so that, that must be even more difficult because family functions, etc. Yeah. you know, they're always mixed, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, you know, we appreciate, I mean, I appreciate the challenges that you're facing yeah. uh, and may Allah make it easy for you. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I think of it this way is like it's been 23 years since I've been a Muslim, alhamdulillah. In those 23 years, the way I look at it is like no one else has become a Muslim in my family in those 23 years. And just to look at the rarity of that, you know, it just makes me cry. You know, every night it makes me cry when I pray to Allah. I'm so grateful because out of all my family, all, all you know, he chose me. And it's still been 23 years. This no one else that has become a Muslim and I have been trying my best throughout the years. Yeah, um, you know, there, there are some family members are very hard to approach. Um, you know, some are, are approachable and uh, some people, some family members have kind of like, kind of like disowned uh, me, uh, close relatives as well in the fear that I might, you know, somehow, some way uh, get their kids reverted, you know, because we we're all the same age, so so it's it's been tough, but handily like it's it's been good with my family and my kids growing up as well, and 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 the reason of coming out of the shadows is because this is the path I want to take now. I wasted too many years just gaming because I spend a lot of get time in gaming as well, but mm-hmm. now I want to make a difference just for not only for myself, for my kids. I want my daughters to be dais uh, as well. Mm-hmm. Inshallah, so inshallah, you'll use inshallah. your. Gaming equipment to give power. <laughs> inshallah, inshallah. I do have a Discord community of um, quite a few people there. Yeah, I thought that's what you might have. That's why I said, you know, turn yeah. it to give power, yeah. you know. Yeah, you inshallah. get the uh, best of both worlds then. Yeah, yeah inshallah. inshallah. Actually, I'll, uh, there's, a, there's a brother. Um, who is it? Oh, I've forgotten his name now. The Christian brother who became a Muslim card. Well, he, run, he runs a, like a gaming style dawah. Oh, yeah. I think I know him. Is it yeah. Ismail or something like that? Yeah, no, that's no, right. no, no, no. Not, yeah, uh, but there is, but there's another one. Isa. No? no You're not talking I, about I, Benny Kra, are you? No, no, no. He's, oh, he's no, the no, American no. brother. He's an American brother. Yeah, he's very well known. I think his name's just, oh, it's just I've just lost his name. Yeah, I, I yeah. said a new it. Um, or Ismail or Isa or something like that. One of yeah, those. But anyway, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, inshallah, you know, you can yeah. always use your. Your microphones and your cameras. And yeah, that's... Your you should, yeah, Yusha Evans. Yusha <laughs> Evans. Okay, Yusha. yes. Oh, no, yes, that yes, is a while yes, back. Yusha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so Yusha Evans uh, was yeah, sort of... And, and he's he's sort of... And if you want to see some of his streams online, okay. uh, and he gives some advice on maybe how to do that as well and how to okay. approach that. So Yusha, why USHA Evans? Mm-hmm. I think also Isa Dawa, he's also the same caliber in terms right. of... He became exactly. from gamer to... Yeah. No, but I, 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 I oh, sorry. No, but I just want to get away from. I'm just gone too old. My reflex is so bad, so it's not normal gaming for me. It's <laughs> fine. <Right now. laughs> okay, so brother, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you for joining us. Jazakallah for having me. Thank you. Jazakallah. Question for Sister Swati. There was a, on the comment. Someone is saying it was Parvati that ties to Vishnu. No, that's, that's not true. He is wrong. That... <laughs> this was basically that's what I'm saying uh, maybe because this is what I have read in Mahabharat where it has been mentioned very clearly how it started with reference to you know Krishna I mean that's how it has been said that Krishna uh, you know Draupadi would be tying it and then that that's the that's how it's been mentioned but that's what I'm saying there's so many I mean I don't know maybe there could be some other version which could be there in Puranas it's filled with stories and which is why I wanted to ask you know 
brother antaranga that so many things when you're saying that you meditate on it and you you know reflect upon it or even when he's uh, and when we ask then the answer which is given is that these are very deeper meanings which mundane mind may not understand so if we can't understand which is why so you know which is why hindu atheist would come then and they would say that this is also part of uh, hindu religion or uh, whatever sanatan dharma so that's the problem and then when you say that okay this is a kaliyug people usually will not be able to understand such high metaphorical intellectual arguments so you just chant the name is but that's not making any difference you know chanting the name just like that and he is giving the reference an example of allah that you know the way various attributes of allah are there and we do the tasbih or the zikr allah but that's different with quran it's all very specific understanding hikmat which is provided and with that intelligence and understanding we do that it's not just done blindly like that without having any idea of the entire history of that of that deen or that religion so so you know that's what i'm thinking and of course with the callers and everybody uh, like uh, yeah for sure two things which i learned i would say would be one that um, in case because it's i'm very new to all of it in case if you see see pure ignorance if i see you no know, i have lot of i'm not boasting it but i have lot of patience and tolerance towards that because i see my family members so they also with very well intention and meaning when they don't understand i don't get ragged at that but when you when you see purposefully you know people coming purposefully mumbling not letting you speak purposefully bringing such you know flawed premises and then just hitting and running away like that i don't know i have i am i'm developing gradually to be patient not to interject when they are absolutely talking rubbish and very very irrational things deliberately on purpose just to keep calm let them speak that and maybe later whatever but later it doesn't happen because then they would deny and say we did never said that that's the entire thing so one thing is that that i'm learning to sort of let them speak or whatever um uh, and the second is uh, that uh, you know with with uh, somebody who's from the sect and in that position of a, of a, of of you know uh, helping people with dawa the kind of dawa hindu dawa hari krishna dawa which is being done by so for him uh, he should not you know when he was saying that i was just little you know uh, sort of apprehensive that there would be whatever three four muslim people there and just me one hindu if you are solid and firm in your faith and if you know you are on huck you would never be scared i mean you would say let the world come in front of me and if i am on huck i am going to speak that ask me anything and especially when you have had the experience of so many years then you would say just bring it on and i am going to answer so that's and the questions i was just seeing the kind of questions which you brothers have put forth you know you were just so light and so lenient and very courteous to him when you were asking because there were there were certain very very predominant questions which had major problems uh, which was out of courtesy and respect we had not asked uh, and the way in which he was also responding uh, i mean uh, somehow it did not appeal me with all due respect and i'm all the more convinced that yeah this is absolutely not anything which is flawed which shayatin uses to misguide people they you will not be able to speak with conviction and you know you'll mix certain things just the way now see this is another version which came of hari krishna where he said it's not krishna is not lord whatever they call lord you know it's not vishnu's avatar rather it's vice versa they said krishna in himself is the god uh who's there and vishnu and everybody else is there avatar incarnations and the entire thing you know varnashram good he was talking about gambling not to be there alcohol the way which that that which appealed him he said was there was no gambling no alcoholism no illicit sex i mean all of this in fact is practiced in islam rather than there you have your scriptures where you see mentioning of gambling there mahabharat is filled with that you have you have total violence where krishna is saying to the person arjun that you have to wage the war irrespective of whatever your guna and karm be right now but because you belong to the kshatriya you know clan and varna you have to fulfill the duty yeah so all of this so yeah. he, you must see the scripture you must see what the text is saying the text is not refuting about the you know non violence the text is not uh, not uh, critiquing the very aspect of gambling the entire thing where a lady's you know honor 
is is publicly being uh, challenged like that and humiliated like that in mahabharat what are you gaining from that so these are the kind of and of course i did not bring at all the kind of you know um, uh, acts you know of course sam had brought it those kinds of pastimes which were there there are a lot of such things not just pastime but the hidayat so called hidayat which had been given by this by the deity by the god himself to uh, you know the various characters of mahabharat so that in itself could bring out a lot of questions of yeah so so like so those were the aspects you know which were there so uh, in any case towards the end i just i'm just happy i learned things and again once again <laughs> with the with you know coming to the stream my my iman just gets strengthened further and further which is why i you know stay back alhamdulillah because it just brings the clarity and and one last thing which is that uh, you know the brother uh, who was who came the one whose whose name was the one Uh, mm-hmm. the christian brother you know when that i keep noticing maybe he was the one who came in the last stream also uh, okay very respectful but the way brother hashim or brother mansoor brother mohammed the way you explain things no i i somehow fail to manage how can you not still be convinced with such clarity such precision such logic which is there how can you still have confusion in your mind when things are so simple about the way islam is you know being uh, projected and the uh, ideas which are there the teachings which are there so i mean it doesn't it, because whatever 40 45 minutes were being taken by him in order to understand you can just get it in 5 minutes and you don't need to come in like in so many stream just to get the clarity of saying that no i still think there is some loophole that is something which i sometimes just fail to get that why would it be that it will be so difficult for them to get such simple idea of the heat of being on hook yeah. yeah let's hope he reflects on um, watches back the stream and reflects on it yeah and 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 good would be if he comes to speak us corner directly we can have a chat um of course you know, face, face to face yeah and at the end at the end of the hidayah is in the hands of allah and we are only just conveying the message some people maybe you know they understand the logic but they're struggling to accept it i mean think mm. about you know, the uncle of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam Um, yeah. He understood that Rasulullah is on the hook, but there are other pressures that he was facing for which Perfect. he couldn't simply accept it. So people are individuals, and we have to give the benefit of the doubt. Maybe lots of issues for which Perfect. they are struggling to surrender. I mean, this is one of the things I say. Like, there's a book written by Jeffrey Lang, uh, Brother mm-hmm. Muhammad Shrug. Yes, and, uh, where, you know, people see the truth. but it's not often easy to accept it it might take years and years of you know self deliberation mm-hmm. and eventually become so strong to make that move forward it's not easy i mean for us we see that it's something that's so simple um why don't people change but we are talking about changing people's whole life their lifestyle the family but, but the Masoor, and everything changed. isn't it that's what i'm saying i mean i have mm. changed the entire lifestyle that's what i'm saying when it is on mm. when you come on that hug and when you, when you get that no you feel that you feel mashallah this is what i had been if they're really looking for and searching for one god and once you get that i mean mm. I, i know the entire everything changes from where you have been to where you now are but that's for good and you feel the solace in that the tranquility mm. that you're looking for you get here then not in some maybe, weird meditation which makes you maybe not everyone is ready at that stage you see <laughs> yeah. Every, yeah. Right. that different level of readiness so you just yeah. pray to allah for those to here to make that step uh, inshallah to make that step oh, yeah. quicker and and Fast. You know, Brother Mansour, you you mentioned Jeffrey Lang. Let me actually, for those that don't know, Jeffrey Lang was a uh, was a professor of mathematics, an American professor. You can go look him up. And he started reading the Quran in translation, and he read it with a, with a very mathematical mind. So he said, "Look, mm-hmm. whenever I read anything, I need to make sure that it follows and it makes sense." And and in, and if you listen to his story or you read his story, I have I have his, uh, several of his books actually on my bookshelf. then when his first book he basically says what triggered me in islam was that when i came to the story of of um, adam al islam in the quran it refers to it as a slip and it's like this sort of accidental thing you do when you trip over something 
Yeah. It was not this huge, immense, original sin that damned the whole of existence from Adam forward, and we have this inherited, you know, sin that he's and and he said, this really bothered me, Absolutely. and and that's what triggered him because that was his background, right? Mm. And again, sometimes, you know, people need the right kind of trigger for them yeah. to say, okay, I need to question things. So for him, right. he. He thought this thing was such a big deal. And when he read in the Quran a story that sounded similar to what he knew, he said, a slip? A slip? That's all it is? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. what is? And then, then he said, then he went the rest of the Quran trying to figure out why it was a slip. And by the time he sort of read several chapters in, he said, I already realized this because it was consistent. The, he, and in, and, and you know, being a professor of mathematics, he said, there was nothing in here that I could find that was inconsistent within itself you know inconsistency yeah. within itself and then of course he did his other research you can tell somebody something till you're blue in the face uh, literally in the term time yeah. in, in sort of i'm not trying to pull a pun here but it, it may be that what they want to hear isn't what's being told and somebody else gives them a really simple message and that triggers them okay. so our goal is, is not for us to sort of just shout at them or, or, or sort of, you know, say, you know, I get on some calls and people just say the same things louder. And, and then I just say, look, I don't understand. And they say even louder as if that's going to make me understand. Right. It's you know, close, shouting at me does, doesn't make me understand something. So, so True. what I would say is, is our goal is to as, as calmly and as sensibly and as clearly as possible, deliver the message to the best of our understanding and that's all we can do and if we make mistakes it's from us and you know maybe shaitan gets in the way as well yeah. and may allah forgive us if we do but yeah. that's all we can do and the rest we leave it there yeah. and what if somebody does not allow you to speak the way it happened yes yes you, you can say that earlier so look the, the, we had the case in, in the time of Rasulullah uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam there there's an example where when he would try to give the message they would actually hire there was, a, there was a, actually a path where they would hire musicians to play oh. music just so the crowds would not hear the message from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Definitely. This is the extent the Quraysh went to. Yeah. Right? There, there, was another, there was another event at the same time where when he was in Sajda, one, one of a group took, to actually went away and brought the offals, the internals of a camel that had just been slaughtered and placed it on top of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was in Sajda, right? And his daughter Fatima had to come out and really sort of help him up and all the rest of it. So even after all of this, did he sort of say, I'm going to give up, scream and shout? No, he he continued with the same message, mm. which is la ilaha illallah. That was it. So so our example, our, our, our model is that this noise, this music, mm. this, this sort of... Um, um, sort of over the top um, uh, disruption, let me call it that mm -hmm. way, will mm -hmm. constantly be there. In the people, we're also at the worst enemy to Islam is shaitan. And yeah. in many cases, the people that are doing this are actually directly uh, motivated by shaitan. Yeah, to do this. that that would be right? there, definitely. and we have to remember this. So, so therefore, we don't we don't become angry. We we don't start. We just say, look, may Allah guide you, and yeah. and you know we've given you to the best of our ability the message, and please come back again if you need to learn more. That's it, halas. If there's a deliberate troublemaker, the best option is we just try to avoid them. We don't yeah. get involved in the discussion or the the to and fro. We just say, look, to you your way to my, you know, right? Yeah. To you your way to us. To me, man. Like, like the guy who called himself a liar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Let's leave it there. Exactly. Let's leave it there. So, Lakum Dinikum Wal Yadin is always there. And if they're deliberately disruptive, then we say, look, fine. You're deaf. You're blind. You're dumb. Fine. Look, there's nothing more I can share with you. I've already given you everything I have. Khalas, let's leave it there. Bismillah. Absolutely. Move on. Absolutely. Right. With Very that, we should cross down because it's already. Five hours and twenty-one minutes, and Sister yeah. Swati has been, mashallah, very patient. And I know we didn't allow you to come in for the first hour, and she was. Yeah. Oh, she I said no, not yet. 
I was like just I had so many I mean very but very courteous respectful way I wanted to ask but there was when he was asking and when he was giving answers I I just within my heart I just felt no 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 this is very vague this is abstract this is not correct what about this what about that but, yeah but, but sister, I, you I know I how, how it would look it would look like four, four or five people against one yeah yeah. So yeah we want like I said yeah. we want him to come back and inshallah we'll have more people when they watch this with the other mm. that he showed to our guests and he was a nice person you know at the end of the day yeah. even though his responses were pretty vague I would say and yeah we could have pinned him down in so many different ways I mean yeah. look uh, but we, we don't like pinning anybody down like that yeah no we we should you know where there's a hug where it's straightforward we do but the thing is we also give them a bit of a leeway so inshallah they join next time and we can explore more things you know rather than mm. them shutting down at the first opportunity. Well, this is a key point. So let me just mention this. So in all of the streams that we see, and even, I mean, I'll mention this now, even in the discussion that we saw with recently with Mohammed Dijab and Dr. Peterson, right? For those that haven't seen it, I would recommend you go watch it. You will see there a very amicable intellectual discussion that dis if you actually listen to it, they disagreed intensely on many points, right? But there was no sort of, you know, nobody walked out, nobody jumped up and started to threaten the No, but that is an example of how we have intellectual discussions. And the goal with us is we should agree to disagree, but at least explain our message. Correct. Yeah, you do, we don't have to, you know, it's not like we're scoring points that until you agree with me, I'm not going to move course. off this point. Right, of course, that, that, that doesn't help anyone. Okay, yeah. and like I said, you know, you believe in one God, I believe in one God, but what is your concept of one God? What is my yeah. concept of one God? You have yours, I have mine. And guess what? Even if the individual here doesn't agree or disagree, our audience of people, we let them make up their own mind, yeah. right? You know, as to what they heard. And we leave it there. And the rest is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Absolutely. And Brother Muhammad, you I really like the way you had said because sometimes it's not just the intellect. As we had seen, even Shayatin Iblis had, you know, believed that he had high intellect and Marx would say with such intellectual background of communism that religion is an opium of, for people. I think yes. that particular aspect where you had mentioned, no, what may trigger somebody we don't know. For the brother who was there in Christianity, the very idea of original sin and when he, when he read about uh, Adam alayhi salam, that was something that brought for me for example it was that uh, idea of one god how could there be so right. many deities so for different people it could be different thing and exactly. who knows what you know something might just strike to them and they might like to reflect even if they would not prima facie you know show us maybe later they could reflect upon it and who knows we because never, only we allah ne knows the heart we never know yeah. what is in the hearts of people yeah that's exactly. why we say hidayah is from allah and he gives exactly. it to whom he wants in the way exactly. he wants and this is the beauty of Islam, isn't it? That if you are sincerely seeking, then okay. Allah makes it easy for you. Okay. And if you're one of those people who, after Allah has given you several opportunities, you keep your disbelief at the top. So even, you know, like the example of the shaitan, the Iblis. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the, of the ghaib, you know, which we don't have um, the, uh, the luxury of. Even then, he disobeyed Allah. So you see, it's what's in your heart, you know. Uh, like one of the ayahs in the Quran says, it's it's the hearts that are blind, not the eyes. MashaAllah. Very and true. It's uh, something we should all reflect upon, isn't it? That keep your intentions sincere and Allah will help you. And this not only is like for those who are non-Muslims to become Muslims, but also for the Muslims, you know, if your intentions are sincere in helping your family, in helping your friends, for example, in practicing your deen, Allah will make put barakah in every single thing. So you might just be selling fruits at a store or something, you know, and not earning much. But in that little that you earn, Allah will put so much barakah in your rizq that that millionaire who lost maybe next day in his in the stock market would not even appreciate that. Yeah, correct. Alhamdulillah, very true. Yes. Yeah, so inshallah, I think uh, we will uh, close uh, now because it's been will be very late. And jazakallah khair to all the brothers and sisters watching, and in particular to the panelists, to our guests who uh, gave us two hours of his time. Uh, and uh, inshallah, we'll have more guests in future. Uh, we'll have more. We'll probably do um, a stream on Christianity or atheism maybe next. 
Um, so <laughs> if you guys are interested in that topic, because we are not just focusing on Hinduism, even though I, I think many of us are mashallah enjoying it now, because this is something that we haven't been doing much here in the UK. Most of yeah. the Dawah channels, they focus on Hinduism and atheism only. So inshallah, yeah. we'll be doing more of this and mashallah, jazakallah khair to sister Swati. Uh, you mean Christianity and atheism? Yeah. Yeah, Christianity. Yes, yes, yes. And of yes. course, whatever is Batil, they have some similarity, definitely. Shayatin is yes. not that clever it's at all. Which religion? Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, I, I read something actually very interesting today, and, and I, I reflected on it quite deeply. He said, you know, if Shaitan was going to come to you in the way Hollywood and Disney picture him, you would right. never follow him. You would never follow him. So, how does he come to you? He comes to you taking the shape of your dreams the things that you dream of that is the shape that he takes your so desire. if you want the if you yeah. your desires exactly so he comes in the shape of your desires which is why allah says do not follow your desires because that is exactly the shape and again this was just a you know a scholar i mean it's not it's not a tradition or anything but i yeah. thought it was a very interesting insight yeah. because if he's going to come in any form to you he's going to come in the form that you most desire Absolutely. so if you are waiting for you know um you know, some light in the sky to come and him standing next to you looking like some, you know, uh, um, a being with this glowing, then that's exactly how he'll come to you. And yeah. that, and, and, and he will divert you. And you will think you're receiving something from God when it's in fact it's from the shaitan. And yeah. so this is why we, we say, you know, you know, we, we allow our logic and our sense of understanding to guide us to the guidance that Allah has given us and we study it with the faculties that Allah has given us and only then and again we also say quite strongly in Islam it is very important that once you do accept Islam that you have the right kind of um, um, education from teachers that are, that are well known in unity. this is very very important because the worst time for shaitan is when he's lost you yeah. And you've, you've accepted, and then he says, "Okay, now I need to actually divert them, thinking they're doing good, off on the wrong track." Right, correct. And and and, correct. and it, so it becomes more difficult. And and what does he do? He says, "You know, you've you've come to Islam, but why don't you spend the next twenty years reading all of the tiny nuances about why this is wrong and that is wrong?" Yeah. What? Why? Absolutely. You know, your your Absolutely. goal is to do salah, read Quran. Do exactly. sound, you know, focus on the big things. No, he'll make you focus on the details. Right. So, right. so there's many games, but he will come to you looking like the attractive part of your dream, not the unattractive part. So let's just leave it there. Khalas. Thank you very much, Thank yeah, you. And also, Brother Hashim, along with atheism and Christianity, maybe the New Age religion also, which is too much into it and not much streams have been done on that. Maybe that could also be taken as one of the topics. I think, we, yeah, so let's, let's talk about that because I think uh, there's so many we can do and we have so yeah. little time. <laughs> <laughs> Inshallah. Inshallah. Okay, so, uh, Brother Mansoor, over to you. You're muted, Mansoor. Just change my there we go. Yeah, there we go. Can you still hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Alhamdulillah. Okay, because mic, I need to fix it. So, uh, Jazakumullah Khairan to everyone, to Sister Swati, uh, Brother Sam, um, who's um, left a little bit because it's been a long, um, inshallah. But um, it's been a wonderful stream. Uh, again, that's what we would like to see. Uh, we don't want any confrontation and so on. I mean, I'm very pleased that the guest that we had as a uh, someone to represent um, Hare Krishna or you know, this particular sect within, do we say sect or a group um, or a belief system within it, that he was able to articulate and also have some interactions with us. So we hope that he comes back again um, to, to demystify a bit more about Hinduism and inshallah we'll have more streams on Hinduism. So first of all, I just want to again thank our moderators, people on the chat, and, and those who are watching, those who are listening to this, if, if that benefits you, you know, may Allah increase in your you know, knowledge so that you can take this forward when you are discussing with your Hindu friends and colleagues at work, at universities, um, or even families and friends, so that Allah opens their hearts and their minds to Islam. So with this, I'm just going to make it very short. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Allahumma salli ala rasulina Muhammad wa ala ali sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi